Chapter One of Uncle Tom's Cabin, or Life Among the Lowly, by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lorraine Paquette. Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Volume One, Chapter One in which the reader is introduced to a man of humanity. Late in the afternoon of a chilly day in February, two gentlemen were sitting alone over their wine in a well-furnished dining parlor in the town of P. in Kentucky. There were no servants present, and the gentlemen, with chairs closely approaching, seemed to be discussing some subject with great earnestness. For convenience sake, we have said hitherto, two gentlemen. One of the parties, however, when critically examined, did not seem, strictly speaking, to come under the species. He was a short, thick-set man, with coarse, commonplace features, and that swaggering air of pretension which marks a low man who is trying to elbow his way upward in the world. He was much overdressed, in a gaudy vest of many colors, a blue neckerchief, bedropped gaily with yellow spots and arranged with a flaunting tie quite in keeping with the general air of the man. His hands, large and coarse, were plentifully bedecked with rings, and he wore a heavy gold watch-chain with a bundle of seals of portentous size and a great variety of colors attached to it, which, in the ardor of conversation, he was in the habit of flourishing and jingling with evident satisfaction. His conversation was in free and easy defiance of Murray's grammar and was garnished at convenient intervals with various profane expressions which not even the desire to be graphic in our account shall induce us to transcribe his companion mr shelby had the appearance of a gentleman and the arrangements of the house and the general air of the housekeeping indicated easy and even opulent circumstances as we before stated the two were in the midst of an earnest conversation this is the way I should arrange the matter, said Mr. Shelby. I can't make trade that way. I positively can't, Mr. Shelby, said the other, holding up a glass of wine between his eye and the light. Why, the fact is, Haley, Tom is an uncommon fellow. He is certainly worth that sum anywhere. Steady, honest, capable, manages my whole farm like a clock. You mean honest as niggers go? said Haley, helping himself to a glass of brandy. No, I mean really. Tom is a good, steady, sensible, pious fellow. He got religion at a camp meeting four years ago, and I believe he really did get it. I've trusted him since then with everything I have, money, house, horses, and let him come and go round the country, and I always found him true and square in everything. Some folks don't believe there is pious niggers, Shelby, said Haley, with a candid flourish of his hand. But I do. I had a fellow now, in this year last lot I took to Orleans. Twas as good as a meetin' now, really, to hear that critter pray. And he was quite gentle and quiet-like. He fetched me a good sum, too, for I bought him cheap of a man that was obliged to sell out. So I realized six hundred on him. Yes, I consider religion a valuable thing in a nigger, when it's the genuine article and no mistake. Well, Tom's got the real article, if ever a fellow had, rejoined the other. Why, last fall I let him go to Cincinnati alone to do business for me and bring home five hundred dollars. Tom, says I to him, I trust you, because I think you're a Christian. I know you wouldn't cheat. Tom comes back, sure enough, I knew he would. Some low fellows, they say, said to him, Tom, why don't you make tracks for Canada? Ah, master trusted me, and I couldn't. They told me about it. I am sorry to part with Tom, I must say. You ought to let him cover the whole balance of the debt, and you would, Haley, if you had any conscience. Well, I've got just as much conscience as any man in business can afford to keep. Just a little, you know, to swear by, as twere, said the trader, jocularly. And then, 
I'm ready to do anything in reason to oblige friends. But this year, you see, is a little too hard on a fellow, a little too hard. The trader sighed contemplatively and poured out some more brandy. Well then, Haley, how will you trade? said Mr. Shelby, after an uneasy interval of silence. Well, haven't you a boy or gal that you could throw in with Tom? Hmm, none that I could well spare, to tell the truth. It's only hard necessity makes me willing to sell it all. I don't like parting with any of my hands. That's a fact. Here the door opened, and a small cadroon boy between four and five years of age entered the room. There was something in his appearance remarkably beautiful and engaging. His black hair, fine as floss silk, hung in glossy curls about his round, dimpled face, while a pair of large, dark eyes, full of fire and softness, looked out from beneath the rich, long lashes as he peered curiously into the apartment. A gay robe of scarlet and yellow plaid, carefully made and neatly fitted, set off to advantage the dark and rich style of his beauty, and a certain comic air of assurance, blended with bashfulness, showed that he had been not unused to being petted and noticed by his master. "'Hallo, Jim Crow,' said Mr. Shelby, whistling, and snapping a bunch of raisins towards him. "'Pick that up now!' The child scampered with all his little strength after the prize, while his master laughed. "'Come here, Jim Crow,' said he. The child came up, and the master patted the curly head and chucked him under the chin. "'Now, Jim, show this gentleman how you can dance and sing.' The boy commenced one of those wild, grotesque songs common among the Negroes, in a rich, clear voice accompanying his singing with many comic evolutions of the hands, feet, and whole body, all in perfect time to the music. "'Bravo!' said Haley, throwing him a quarter of an orange. Now, Jim, walk like old Uncle Cudjo when he has the rheumatism, said his master. Instantly the flexible limbs of the child assumed the appearance of deformity and distortion, as, with his back humped up and his master's stick in his hand, he hobbled about the room, his childish face drawn into a doleful pucker, and spitting from right to left in imitation of an old man. Both gentlemen laughed uproariously. Now, Jim, said his master, show us how old Elder Robbins leads the psalm. The boy drew his chubby face down to a formidable length and commenced toning a psalm tune through his nose with imperturbable gravity. Hurrah, bravo, what a young un, said Haley. That chap's a case, I'll promise. Tell you what, said he, suddenly clapping his hand on Mr. Shelby's shoulder. Fling in that chap, and I'll settle the business, I will. Come now, if that ain't doing the thing up about the rightest. At this moment the door was pushed gently open, and a young cadroon woman, apparently about twenty-five, entered the room. There needed only a glance from the child to her to identify her as its mother. There was the same rich, full, dark eye, with its long lashes, the same ripples of silky black hair. The brown of her complexion gave way on the cheek to a perceptible flush which deepened as she saw the gaze of the strange man fixed upon her in bold and undisguised admiration. Her dress was of the neatest possible fit, and set off to advantage her finely moulded shape. A delicately formed hand and a trim foot and ankle were items of appearance that did not escape the quick eye of the trader well used to run up at a glance the points of a fine female article. "'Well, Eliza,' said her master, as she stopped and looked hesitatingly at him. "'I was looking for Harry, please, sir,' and the boy bounded toward her, showing his spoils, which he had gathered in the skirt of his robe. "'Well, take him away, then,' said Mr. Shelby, and hastily she withdrew, carrying the child on her arm. "'By Jupiter!' said the trader, turning to him in admiration. There's an article now. You might make your fortune on that our gal in Orleans any day. I've seen over a thousand in my day, paid down for gals not a bit handsomer. I don't want to make my fortune on her, said Mr. Shelby dryly, and seeking to turn the conversation, 
He uncorked a bottle of fresh wine and asked his companion's opinion of it. Capital, sir, first chop, said the trader. Then turning and slapping his hand familiarly on Shelby's shoulder, he added, Come, how will you trade about the gal? What shall I say for her? What'll you take? Mr. Haley, she is not to be sold, said Shelby. My wife would not part with her for her weight in gold. Aye, aye, women always say such things, cause they han't no sort of calculation. Just show em how many watches, feathers, and trinkets one's weight in gold would buy, and that alters the case, I reckon. I tell you, Haley, this must not be spoken of. I say no, and I mean no, said Shelby decidedly. Well, you'll let me have the boy, though, said the trader. You must own I've come down pretty handsomely for him. What on earth can you want with a child? said Shelby. Why, I've got a friend that's going into this year branch of business, wants to buy up handsome boys to raise for the market. Fancy articles entirely, sell for waiters and so on to rich uns that can pay for handsome uns. It sets off one of your great places, a real handsome boy to open door, wait, and tend. They fetch a good sum, and this little devil is such a comical, musical concern. He's just the article. I would rather not sell him, said Mr. Shelby, thoughtfully. The fact is, sir, I'm a humane man, and I hate to take the boy from his mother, sir. Oh, you do, la. Yes, something of that are nature. I understand perfectly. It is mighty unpleasant getting on with women sometimes. I always hate these years screech and screamin' times. They are mighty unpleasant. But as I manage his business, I generally avoids them, sir. Now, what if you get the girl off for a day, or a week or so? Then the thing's done quietly, all over before she comes home. Your wife might get her some earrings, or a new gown, or some such truck, to make up with her. I'm afraid not. Lord bless ye, yes. These critters ain't like white folks, you know. They gets over things, only manage right. Now they say, said Haley, assuming a candid and confidential air, that this kind of trade is hardening to the feelings, but I never found it so. Fact is, I never could do things up the way some fellers manage the business. I've seen em as would pull a woman's child out of her arms and set em up to sell, and she's screeching like mad all the time. Very bad policy. Damages the article, makes em quite unfit for service, sometimes. I knew a real handsome gal once in Orleans, as was entirely ruined by this sort of handling. The fellow that was trading for her didn't want her baby, and she was one of your real high sort when her blood was up. I tell you, she squeezed up her child in her arms and talked and went on real awful. It kinder makes my blood run cold to think of it, and when they carried off the child and locked her up, she just went raven mad and died in a week clear waste sir of a thousand dollars just for want of management there's where it is it's always best to do the humane thing sir that's been my experience and the trader leaned back in his chair and folded his arms with an air of virtuous decision apparently considering himself a second wilberforce the subject appeared to interest the gentleman deeply for while mr shelby was thoughtfully peeling an orange Haley broke out afresh, with becoming diffidence, but as if actually driven by the force of truth to say a few words more. It don't look well now for a feller to be praising himself, but I say it just because it's the truth. I believe I'm reckoned to bring in about the finest droves of niggers that is brought in, at least I've been told so, if I have once, I reckon I have a hundred times, all in good case, fat and likely, and I lose as few as any man in the business. And I lays it all to my management, sir, and humanity, sir, I may say, is the great pillar of my management. Mr. Shelby did not know what to say, and so he said, Indeed. Now, I've been laughed at for my notions, sir, and I've been talked to. They ain't popular, and they ain't common, but I stuck to em, sir, I've stuck to em, and realized well on em. Yes, sir, they have paid their passage, I may say, and the trader laughed at his joke. There was something so piquant and original in these elucidations of humanity that Mr. Shelby could not help laughing in company. 
perhaps you laugh too dear reader but you know humanity comes out in a variety of strange forms nowadays and there is no end to the odd things that humane people will say and do mr shelby's laugh encouraged the trader to proceed it's strange now but i never could beat this into people's heads now there was tom loker my old partner down in natchez he was a clever fellow tom was only the very devil with niggers on principle twas you see for a better-hearted feller never broke bread twas his system sir i used to talk to tom why tom i used to say when your gals takes on and cry what's the use of crackin on em over the head and knockin on em round it's ridiculous says i and don't do no sort of good why i don't see no harm in their cryin says i it's nature says i and if nature can't blow off one way it will another besides tom says i it just spiles your gals they get sickly and down in the mouth and sometimes they gets ugly particular yellow gals do and it's the devil and all gettin on em broke in now says i why can't you kinder coax em up and speak em fair depend on it tom a little humanity thrown in along goes a heap further than all your john and crackin and it pays better says i depend on it but tom couldn't get the hang on it and he spiled so many for me that i had to break off with him though he was a good-hearted feller and as fair a business hand as is goin and do you find your ways of managing do the business better than tom's said mr shelby why yes sir i may say so you see when i anyways can i takes a little care about the unpleasant parts like selling young uns and that get the gals out of the way out of sight out of mind you know and when it's clean done and can't be helped they naturally gets used to it tan't you know as if it was white folks that's brought up in the way of spectin to keep their children and wives and all that niggers you know that's fetched up properly ha'n't no kind of spectations of no kind so all these things comes easier i'm afraid mine are not properly brought up then said mr shelby s'pose not you kentucky folks spile your niggers you mean well by em but tan't no real kindness arter all now a nigger you see what's got to be hacked and tumbled round the world and sold to tom dick and the lord knows who tan't no kindness to be given on him notions and expectations and bring it on him up too well for the rough and tumble comes all the harder on him arter now i venture to say your niggers would be quite chop fallen in a place where some of your plantation niggers would be singin and hoopin like all possessed every man you know mr shelby naturally thinks well of his own ways and i think i treat niggers just about as well as it's ever worth while to treat em it's a happy thing to be satisfied said mr shelby with a slight shrug and some perceptible feelings of a disagreeable nature well said haley after they had both silently picked their nuts for a season what do you say i'll think the matter over and talk with my wife said mr shelby meanwhile haley if you want the matter carried on in the quiet way you speak of you'd better not let your business in this neighborhood be known it will get out among my boys and it will not be a particularly quiet business getting away any of my fellows if they know it i'll promise you oh certainly by all means mum of course but i'll tell you i'm in a devil of a hurry and shall want to know as soon as possible what i may depend on said he rising and putting on his overcoat well call up this evening between six and seven and you shall have my answer said mr shelby and the trader bowed himself out of the apartment i'd like to have been able to kick the fellow down the steps said he to himself as he saw the door fairly closed with his impudent assurance but he knows how much he has me at advantage if anybody had ever said to me that i should sell tom down south to one of those rascally traders i should have said is thy servant a dog that he should do this thing and now it must come for aught i see and eliza's child too i know that i shall have some fuss with the wife about that and for that matter about tom too so much for being in debt hey ho the fellow sees his advantage and means to push it 
Perhaps the mildest form of the system of slavery is to be seen in the state of Kentucky. The general prevalence of agricultural pursuits of a quiet and gradual nature, not requiring those periodic seasons of hurry and pressure that are called for in the business of more southern districts, makes the task of the negro a more healthful and reasonable one, while the master, content with a more gradual style of acquisition, has not those temptations to hard-heartedness which always overcome frail human nature when the prospect of sudden and rapid gain is weighed in the balance, with no heavier counterpoise than the interests of the helpless and unprotected. Whoever visits some estates there and witnesses the good-humoured indulgence of some masters and mistresses and the affectionate loyalty of some slaves might be tempted to dream the oft-fabled poetic legend of a patriarchal institution and all that. But over and above the scene there broods a portentous shadow, the shadow of law. So long as the law considers all these human beings with beating hearts and living affections only as so many things belonging to a master, so long as the failure or misfortune or imprudence or death of the kindest owner may cause them any day to exchange a life of kind protection and indulgence for one of hopeless misery and toil, so long it is impossible to make anything beautiful or desirable in the best regulated administration of slavery. Mr. Shelby was a fair average kind of man, good-natured and kindly, and disposed to easy indulgence of those around him, and there had never been a lack of anything that might contribute to the physical comfort of the negroes on his estate. He had, however, speculated largely and quite loosely, had involved himself deeply, and his notes to a large amount had come into the hands of Haley, and this small piece of information is the key to the preceding conversation. Now it had so happened that, in approaching the door, Eliza had caught enough of the conversation to know that a trader was making offers to her master for somebody. She would gladly have stopped at the door to listen as she came out, but her mistress just then calling, she was obliged to hasten away. Still, she thought she heard the trader making an offer for her boy. Could she be mistaken? Her heart swelled and throbbed, and she involuntarily strained him so tight that the little fellow looked up into her face in astonishment. "'Eliza, girl, what ails you today?' said her mistress, when Eliza had upset the wash pitcher, knocked down the workstand, and finally was abstractedly offering her mistress a long nightgown in place of the silk dress she had ordered her to bring from the wardrobe. Eliza started. "'Oh, missus!' she said, raising her eyes. Then, bursting into tears, she sat down in a chair and began sobbing. "'Why, Eliza, child, what ails you?' said her mistress. "'Oh, missus, missus,' said Eliza, "'there's been a trader talking with master in the piler. I heard him.' "'Well, silly child, suppose there has. "'Oh, missus, do you suppose master would sell my Harry?' And the poor creature threw herself into a chair and sobbed convulsively. "'Sell him? No, you foolish girl. You know your master never deals with those southern traders, and never means to sell any of his servants, as long as they behave well. Why, you silly child, who do you think would want to buy your Harry? Do you think all the world are set on him, as you are, you goosey? Come, cheer up and hook my dress. There now, put my back hair up in that pretty braid you learnt the other day, and don't go listening at doors any more. Well, but, missus, you never would give your consent to, to— Nonsense, child, to be sure I shouldn't. What do you talk so for? I would as soon have one of my own children sold. But really, Eliza, you are getting altogether too proud of that little fellow. A man can't put his nose into the door, but you think he must be coming to buy him. Reassured by her mistress's confident tone, Eliza proceeded nimbly and adroitly with her toilet, laughing at her own fears as she proceeded. Mrs. Shelby was a woman of high class both intellectually and morally. To that natural magnanimity and generosity of mind which one often marks as characteristic of the women of Kentucky, she added high moral and religious sensibility and principle, carried out with great energy and ability into practical results. 
her husband who made no professions to any particular religious character nevertheless reverenced and respected the consistency of hers and stood perhaps a little in awe of her opinion certain it was that he gave her unlimited scope in all her benevolent efforts for the comfort instruction and improvement of her servants though he never took any decided part in them himself in fact if not exactly a believer in the doctrine of the efficiency of the extra good works of saints he really seemed somehow or other to fancy that his wife had piety and benevolence enough for two to indulge a shadowy expectation of getting into heaven through her superabundance of qualities to which he made no particular pretension the heaviest load on his mind after his conversation with the trader lay in the foreseen necessity of breaking to his wife the arrangement contemplated meeting the importunities and opposition which he knew he should have reason to encounter mrs shelby being entirely ignorant of her husband's embarrassments and knowing only the general kindliness of his temper had been quite sincere in the entire incredulity with which she had met eliza's suspicions in fact she dismissed the matter from her mind without a second thought and being occupied in preparations for an evening visit it passed out of her thoughts entirely End of chapter one chapter two of uncle tom's cabin by harriet beecher stowe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lorraine paquette chapter two the mother eliza had been brought up by her mistress from girlhood as a petted and indulged favourite the traveller in the south must often have remarked that peculiar air of refinement that softness of voice and manner which seems in many cases to be a particular gift to the quadroon and mulatto woman these natural graces in the quadroon are often united with beauty of the most dazzling kind and in almost every case with a personal appearance prepossessing and agreeable eliza such as we have described her is not a fancy sketch but taken from remembrance as we saw her years ago in kentucky safe under the protecting care of her mistress eliza had reached maturity without those temptations which make beauty so fatal an inheritance to a slave she had been married to a bright and talented young mulatto man who was a slave on the neighbouring estate and bore the name of george harris this young man had been hired out by his master to work in a bagging factory where his adroitness and ingenuity caused him to be considered the first hand in the place he had invented a machine for the cleaning of the hemp which considering the education and circumstances of the inventor displayed quite as much mechanical genius as whitney's cotton gin a machine of this description was really the invention of a young colored man in kentucky mrs stowe's note he was possessed of a handsome person and pleasing manners and was a general favorite in the factory nevertheless as this young man was in the eye of the law not a man but a thing all these superior qualifications were subject to the control of a vulgar narrow-minded tyrannical master this same gentleman having heard of the fame of george's invention took a ride over to the factory to see what this intelligent chattel had been about he was received with great enthusiasm by the employer who congratulated him on possessing so valuable a slave he was waited upon over the factory shown the machinery by george who in high spirits talked so fluently held himself so erect looked so handsome and manly that his master began to feel an uneasy consciousness of inferiority what business had his slave to be marching round the country inventing machines and holding up his head among gentlemen he'd soon put a stop to it he'd take him back and put him to hoeing and digging and see if he'd step about so smart accordingly the manufacturer and all hands concerned were astounded when he suddenly demanded george's wages and announced his intention of taking him home but mr harris remonstrated the manufacturer isn't this rather sudden what if it is isn't the man mine 
We would be willing, sir, to increase the rate of compensation. No object at all, sir. I don't need to hire any of my hands out, unless I've a mind to. But, sir, he seems peculiarly adapted to this business. Dare say he may be. Never was much adapted to anything that I set him about, I'll be bound. But only think of him inventing this machine, interposed one of the workmen rather unluckily. Oh, yes, a machine for saving work, is it? He'd invent that, I'll be bound. Let a nigger alone for that any time. They are all labor-saving machines themselves, every one of them. No, he shall tramp. George had stood like one transfixed at hearing his doom, thus suddenly pronounced by a power that he knew was irresistible. He folded his arms, tightly pressed in his lips, but a whole volcano of bitter feelings burned in his bosom and sent streams of fire through his veins. He breathed short, and his large dark eyes flashed like live coals, and he might have broken out into some dangerous ebullition had not the kindly manufacturer touched him on the arm and said in a low tone, Give way, George, go with him for the present. We'll try to help you yet. The tyrant observed the whisper and conjectured its import, though he could not hear what was said, and he inwardly strengthened himself in his determination to keep the power he possessed over his victim. George was taken home and put to the meanest drudgery of the farm. He had been able to repress every disrespectful word, but the flashing eye, the gloomy and troubled brow, were part of a natural language that could not be repressed, indubitable signs which showed too plainly that the man could not become a thing. It was during the happy period of his employment in the factory that George had seen and married his wife. During that period, being much trusted and favoured by his employer, he had free liberty to come and go at discretion. The marriage was highly approved of by Mrs. Shelby, who, with a little womanly complacency in matchmaking, felt pleased to unite her handsome favourite with one of her own class, who seemed in every way suited to her. And so they were married in her mistress's great parlour, and her mistress herself adorned the bride's beautiful hair with orange blossoms, and threw over it the bridal veil, which certainly could scarce have rested on a fairer head. And there was no lack of white gloves and cake and wine, of admiring guests to praise the bride's beauty and her mistress's indulgence and liberality. For a year or two Eliza saw her husband frequently, and there was nothing to interrupt their happiness except the loss of two infant children, to whom she was passionately attached, and whom she mourned with a grief so intense as to call for gentle remonstrance from her mistress, who sought with maternal anxiety to direct her naturally passionate feelings within the bounds of reason and religion. After the birth of little Harry, however, she had gradually become tranquilized and settled, and every bleeding tie and throbbing nerve, once more entwined with that little life, seemed to become sound and healthful, and Eliza was a happy woman up to the time that her husband was rudely torn from his kind employer and brought under the iron sway of his legal owner. The manufacturer, true to his word, visited Mr. Harris a week or two after George had been taken away, when, as he hoped, the heat of the occasion had passed away, and tried every possible inducement to lead him to restore him to his former employment. "'You needn't trouble yourself to talk any longer,' said he doggedly. "'I know my own business, sir.' "'I did not presume to interfere with it, sir,' I only thought that you might think it for your interest to let your man to us on the terms proposed. Oh, I understand the matter well enough. I saw your winking and whispering the day I took him out of the factory, but you don't come it over me that way. It's a free country, sir. The man's mine, and I do what I please with him. That's it. And so fell George's last hope, nothing before him but a life of toil and drudgery, rendered more bitter by every little smarting vexation and indignity which tyrannical ingenuity could devise. A very humane jurist once said, 
the worst use you can put a man to is to hang him no there is another use that a man can be put to that is worse end of chapter two chapter three of uncle tom's cabin by harriet beecher stowe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lorraine paquette chapter three the husband and father mrs shelby had gone on her visit and eliza stood on the veranda rather dejectedly looking after the retreating carriage when a hand was laid on her shoulder she turned and a bright smile lighted up her fine eyes george is it you how you frightened me well i am so glad you's come missus is gone to spend the afternoon so come into my little room and we'll have the time all to ourselves saying this she drew him into a neat little apartment opening on the veranda where she generally sat at her sewing within call of her mistress how glad i am why don't you smile and look at harry how he grows the boy stood shyly regarding his father through his curls holding close to the skirts of his mother's dress isn't he beautiful said eliza lifting his long curls and kissing him i wish he'd never been born said george bitterly i wish i'd never been born myself surprised and frightened eliza sat down leaned her head on her husband's shoulder and burst into tears there now eliza it's too bad for me to make you feel so poor girl said he fondly it's too bad oh how i wish you never had seen me you might have been happy george george how can you talk so what dreadful thing has happened or is going to happen i'm sure we've been very happy till lately so we have dear said george then drawing his child on his knee he gazed intently on his glorious dark eyes and passed his hands through his long curls just like you eliza and you are the handsomest woman i ever saw and the best one i ever wish to see but oh i wish i'd never seen you nor you me oh george how can you yes eliza it's all misery 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 my life is bitter as wormwood the very life is burning out of me i'm a poor miserable forlorn drudge and i shall only drag you down with me that's all what's the use of our trying to do anything trying to know anything trying to be anything what's the use of living i wish i was dead oh now dear george that is really wicked i know how you feel about losing your place in the factory and you have a hard master but pray be patient and perhaps something patient said he interrupting her haven't i been patient did i say a word when he came and took me away for no earthly reason from the place where every one was kind to me i'd paid him truly every cent of my earnings and they all say i worked well well it is dreadful said eliza but after all he is your master you know my master and who made him my master that's what i think of what right has he to me i'm a man as much as he is i'm a better man than he is i know more about business than he does i am a better manager than he is i can read better than he can i can write a better hand and i've learned it all myself and no thanks to him i've learned it in spite of him and now what right has he to make a dray horse of me to take me from things i can do and do better than he can and put me to work that any horse can do he tries to do it he says he'll bring me down and humble me and he puts me to just the hardest meanest and dirtiest work on purpose oh george george you frighten me why i never heard you talk so i'm afraid you'll do something dreadful i don't wonder at your feelings at all but oh do be careful do do for my sake for harry's i have been careful and i have been patient but it's growing worse and worse 
flesh and blood can't bear it any longer every chance he can get to insult and torment me he takes i thought i could do my work well and keep on quiet and have some time to read and learn out of work hours but the more he sees i can do the more he loads on he says that though i don't say anything he sees i've got the devil in me and he means to bring it out and one of these days it will come out in a way that he won't like or i'm mistaken oh dear what shall we do said eliza mournfully it was only yesterday said george as i was busy loading stones into a cart that young master tom stood there slashing his whip so near the horse that the creature was frightened i asked him to stop as pleasant as i could he just kept right on i begged him again and then he turned on me and began striking me i held his hand and then he screamed and kicked and ran to his father and told him that i was fighting him he came in a rage and said he'd teach me who was my master and he tied me to a tree and cut switches for young master and told him that he might whip me till he was tired and he did do it if i don't make him remember it some time and the brow of the young man grew dark and his eyes burned with an expression that made his young wife tremble who made this man my master that's what i want to know he said well said eliza mournfully i always thought that i must obey my master and mistress or i couldn't be a christian there is some sense in it in your case they have brought you up like a child fed you clothed you indulged you and taught you so that you have a good education that is some reason why they should claim you but i have been kicked and cuffed and sworn at and at the best only let alone and what do i owe i've paid for all my keeping a hundred times over i won't bear it no i won't he said clenching his hand with a fierce frown eliza trembled and was silent she had never seen her husband in this mood before and her gentle system of ethics seemed to bend like a reed in the surges of such passions you know poor little carlo that you gave me added george the creature has been about all the comfort that i've had he has slept with me nights and followed me around days and kind of looked at me as if he understood how i felt well the other day i was just feeding him with a few old scraps i picked up by the kitchen door and master came along and said i was feeding him up at his expense and that he couldn't afford to have every nigger keeping his dog and ordered me to tie a stone to his neck and throw him in the pond oh george you didn't do it do it not i but he did masser and tom pelted the poor drowning creature with stones poor thing he looked at me so mournful as if he wondered why i didn't save him i had to take a flogging because i wouldn't do it myself i don't care master will find out that i'm one that whipping won't tame my day will come yet if he don't look out what are you going to do oh george don't do anything wicked if you only trust in god and try to do right he'll deliver you i ain't a christian like you eliza my heart's full of bitterness i can't trust in god why does he let things be so oh george we must have faith mistress says that when all things go wrong to us we must believe that god is doing the very best that's easy to say for people that are sitting on their sofas and riding in their carriages but let em be where i am i guess it would come some harder i wish i could be good but my heart burns and can't be reconciled anyhow you couldn't be in my place you can't now if i tell you all i've got to say you don't know the whole yet what can be coming now well lately master has been saying that he was a fool to let me marry off the place that he hates mr shelby and all his tribe because they are proud and hold their heads up above him and that i've got proud notions from you and he says he won't let me come here any more and that i shall take a wife and settle down on his place 
At first he only scolded and grumbled these things, but yesterday he told me that I should take Minna for a wife and settle down in a cabin with her, or he would sell me down river. Why, but you were married to me by the minister as much as if you'd been a white man, said Eliza simply. Don't you know a slave can't be married? There is no law in this country for that. I can't hold you for my wife if he chooses to part us. That's why I wish I'd never seen you. Why I wish I'd never been born. It would have been better for us both. It would have been better for this poor child if he had never been born. All this may happen to him yet. Oh, but Master is so kind. Yes, but who knows? He may die and then he may be sold to nobody knows who. What pleasure is it that he is handsome and smart and bright? I tell you, Eliza, that a sword will pierce through your soul for every good and pleasant thing your child is or has. It will make him worth too much for you to keep. The words smote heavily on Eliza's heart. The vision of the traitor came before her eyes, and as if someone had struck her a deadly blow, she turned pale and gasped for breath. She looked nervously out on the veranda, where the boy, tired of the grave conversation, had retired, and where he was riding triumphantly up and down on Mr. Shelby's walking stick. She would have spoken to tell her husband her fears, but checked herself. No, no, he has enough to bear, poor fellow, she thought. No, I won't tell him. Besides, it ain't true. Mrs. never deceives us. So, Eliza, my girl, said the husband mournfully, bear up now and good-bye, for I'm going. Going, George? Going where? To Canada, said he, straightening himself up. And when I'm there, I'll buy you. That's all the hope that's left us. You have a kind master that won't refuse to sell you. I'll buy you and the boy. God helping me, I will. Oh, dreadful, if you should be taken. I won't be taken, Eliza. I'll die first. I'll be free or I'll die. You won't kill yourself. No need of that. They will kill me fast enough. They never will get me down the river alive. Oh, George, for my sake, do be careful. Don't do anything wicked. Don't lay hands on yourself or anybody else. You are tempted too much, too much. But don't. Go you must, but go carefully, prudently. Pray God to help you. Well then, Eliza, hear my plan. Master took it into his head to send me right by here with a note to Mr. Sims that lives a mile past. I believe he expected I should come here to tell you what I have. It would please him if he thought it would aggravate Shelby's folks, as he calls him. I'm going home quite resigned, you understand, as if all was over. I've got some preparations made, and there are those that will help me, and in the course of a week or so I shall be among the missing some day. Pray for me, Eliza. Perhaps the good Lord will hear you. Oh, pray yourself, George, and go trusting in him. Then you won't do anything wicked. Well, now, good-bye, said George, holding Eliza's hands and gazing into her eyes without moving. They stood silent. Then there were last words and sobs and bitter weeping, such parting as those may make whose hope to meet again is at the spider's web. And the husband and wife were parted. End of chapter 3「Chapter Four of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lorraine Paquette. Chapter Four: An Evening in Uncle Tom's Cabin. The cabin of Uncle Tom was a small log building close adjoining to the house, as the negro par excellence designates his master's dwelling. In front, it had a neat garden patch where every summer. Strawberries, raspberries, and a variety of fruits and vegetables flourished under careful tending. The whole front of it was covered by a large scarlet bignonia, 
and a native multiflora rose which in twisting and interlacing left scarce a vestige of the rough logs to be seen here also in summer various brilliant annuals such as marigolds petunias four o'clocks found an indulgent corner in which to unfold their splendours and were the delight and pride of aunt chloe's heart let us enter the dwelling the evening meal at the house is over and aunt chloe who presided over its preparation as head cook has left to inferior officers in the kitchen the business of clearing away and washing dishes and come out into her own snug territories to get her old man's supper therefore doubt not that it is her you see by the fire presiding with anxious interest over certain frizzling items in a stew-pan and anon with grave consideration lifting the cover of a bake kettle from whence steam forth indubitable intimations of something good a round black shining face is hers so glossy as to suggest the idea that she might have been washed over with white of eggs like one of her own tea rusks her whole plump countenance beams with satisfaction and contentment from under her well-starched check turban bearing on it however if we must confess it a little of that tinge of self-consciousness which becomes the first cook of the neighbourhood as aunt chloe was universally held and acknowledged to be a cook she certainly was in the very bone and centre of her soul not a chicken or turkey or duck in the barnyard but looked grave when they saw her approaching and seemed evidently to be reflecting on their latter end and certainly it was that she was always meditating on trussing stuffing and roasting to a degree that was calculated to inspire terror in any reflecting fowl living her corn cake in all its varieties of hoe cake dodgers muffins and other species too numerous to mention was a sublime mystery to all less practised compounders and she would shake her fat sides with honest pride and merriment as she would narrate the fruitless efforts that one and another of her compeers had made to attain to her elevation the arrival of company at the house the arranging of dinners and suppers in style awoke all the energies of her soul and no sight was more welcome to her than a pile of travelling trunks launched on the veranda for then she foresaw fresh efforts and fresh triumphs just at present however aunt chloe is looking into the bake pan in which congenial operation we shall leave her till we finish our picture of the cottage in one corner of it stood a bed covered neatly with a snowy spread and by the side of it was a piece of carpeting of some considerable size on this piece of carpeting aunt chloe took her stand as being decidedly in the upper walks of life and it and the bed by which it lay and the whole corner in fact were treated with distinguished consideration and made so far as possible sacred from the marauding inroads and desecrations of little folks in fact that corner was the drawing-room of the establishment in the other corner was a bed of much humbler pretensions and evidently designed for use the wall over the fireplace was adorned with some very brilliant scriptural prints and a portrait of general washington drawn and coloured in a manner which would certainly have astounded that hero if ever he happened to meet with his like on a rough bench in the corner a couple of woolly-headed boys with glistening black eyes and fat shining cheeks were busy in superintending the first walking operations of the baby which as is usually the case consisted in getting up on its feet balancing a moment and then tumbling down each successive failure being violently cheered as something decidedly clever a table somewhat rheumatic in its limbs was drawn out in front of the fire and covered with a cloth displaying cups and saucers of a decidedly brilliant pattern with other symptoms of an approaching meal at this table was seated uncle tom mr shelby's best hand who as he is to be the hero of our story we must daguerreotype for our readers he was a large broad-chested powerfully made man of a full glossy black and a face whose truly african features 
were characterized by an expression of grave and steady good sense, united with much kindliness and benevolence. There was something about his whole air, self-respecting and dignified, yet united with a confiding and humble simplicity. He was very busily intent at this moment on a slate lying before him, on which he was carefully and slowly endeavouring to accomplish a copy of some letters, in which operation he was overlooked by young Master George, a smart, bright boy of thirteen, who appeared fully to realise the dignity of his position as instructor. "'Not that way, Uncle Tom, not that way,' said he briskly, as Uncle Tom laboriously brought up the tail of his G the wrong side out. "'That makes a Q, you see.' law sakes now does it said uncle tom looking with a respectful admiring air as his young teacher flourishingly scrawled q's and g's innumerable for his edification and then taking the pencil in his big heavy fingers he patiently recommenced how easy white folks allus does things said aunt chloe pausing while she was greasing a griddle with a scrap of bacon on her fork and regarding young master george with pride the way he can write now and read too and then to come out here evenings and read his lessons to us it's mighty interesting but aunt chloe i'm getting mighty hungry said george isn't that cake in the skillet almost done most done massa george said aunt chloe lifting the lid and peeping in browning beautiful a real lovely brown ah oh, let me alone for dat missus let sally try to make some cake t'other day just to larn her she said oh go way missus said i it really hurts my feelings now to see good fiddles spilt dat air way cake riz all to one side no shape at all no more than my shoe go way and with his final expression of contempt for sally's greenness aunt chloe whipped the cover off the bake kettle and disclosed to view a neatly baked pound cake of which no city confectioner need to have been ashamed this being evidently the central point of the entertainment aunt chloe began now to bustle about earnestly in the supper department here you mose and pete get out de way you niggers polly honey mammy'll give her baby somethin by and by now mass george you just take off dem books and set down now with my old man and i'll take up de sausages and have de first griddle full of cakes on your plates in less than no time they wanted me to come to supper in the house said george but i knew what was what too well for that aunt chloe so you did so you did honey said aunt chloe heaping the smoking batter cakes on his plate you knowed your old auntie'd keep the best for you oh let you alone for dat go way and with that auntie gave george a nudge with her finger designed to be immensely facetious and turned again to her griddle with great briskness now for the cake said master george when the activity of the griddle department had somewhat subsided and with that the youngster flourished a large knife over the article in question. "'La bless you, Massa George,' said Aunt Chloe with earnestness, catching his arm. "'You wouldn't be cutting it with dat air great heavy knife? Smash all down, spile all de pretty rise of it. Here, I've got a thin old knife I keeps sharp a purpose. Dare now, see? Comes apart, light as a feather.' now eat away you won't get anything to beat dat air tom lincoln says said george speaking with his mouth full that their jinny is a better cook than you dem lincolns ain't much count no way said aunt chloe contemptuously i mean set alongside our folks they's spectable folks enough in a kinder plain way but as to getting up anything in style they don't begin to have a notion on it set massa lincoln now alongside massa shelby good lord and missus lincoln can she kinder sweep it into a room like my missus so kinder splendid yer know oh go way don't tell me nothin of dem lincolns 
and aunt chloe tossed her head as one who hoped she did know something of the world well though i've heard you say said george that jinny was a pretty fair cook so i did said aunt chloe i may say dat good plain common cookin jinny'll do make a good pone of bread bile her taters fair her corn cakes isn't extra not extra now jinny's corn cakes isn't but then they's fair but lor come to de higher branches and what can she do why she makes pies sartin she does but what kinder crust can she make your real flecky paste as melts in your mouth and lies all up like a puff now i went over there when miss mary was gwine to be married and jinny she just showed me de wettin pies jinny and i is good friends you know i never said nothin but go long massa george why i shouldn't sleep a wink for a week if i had a batch of pies like dem air why dey wain't no count at all i suppose jinny thought they were ever so nice said george thought so didn't she there she was showin em as innocent ye see it's just here jinny don't know lor the family ain't nothing she can't be spected to know tain't no fault of em ah massa george you doesn't know half your privileges in your family and bringin up here aunt chloe sighed and rolled up her eyes with emotion i'm sure aunt chloe i understand my pie and pudding privileges said george ask tom lincoln if i don't crow over him every time i meet him aunt chloe sat back in her chair and indulged in a hearty guffaw of laughter at this witticism of young masters laughing till the tears rolled down her black shining cheeks and varying the exercise with playfully slapping and poking mass georgie and telling him to go away and that he was a case that he was fit to kill her and that he sartin would kill her one of these days and between each of these sanguinary predictions going off into a laugh each longer and stronger than the other till george really began to think that he was a very dangerously witty fellow and that it became him to be careful how he talked as funny as he could and so ye tell tom did ye oh lor what young uns will be up there ye crowed over tom oh lor massa george if ye wouldn't make a hornbug laugh yes said george i says to him tom you ought to see some of aunt chloe's pies they're the right sort says i pity now tom couldn't said aunt chloe on whose benevolent heart the idea of tom's benighted condition seemed to make a strong impression ye oughter just ask em here to dinner some of these days master george she added it would look quite pretty of ye ye know master george ye oughtn't ter feel above nobody on count your privileges cos all our privileges is gin to us we ought always to member that said aunt chloe looking quite serious well i mean to ask tom here some day next week said george and you do your prettiest aunt chloe and we'll make him stare won't we make him eat so he won't get over it for a fortnight yes yes sartin said aunt chloe delighted you'll see lor to think of some of our dinners your mind that air great chicken pie i made when we guv de dinner to general knox i and missus we come pretty near quarrelling over dat air crust what does get into ladies sometimes i don't know but sometimes when a body has de heaviest kind of responsibility on em as ye may say and is all kinder serious and taken up dey takes dat air time to be hangin round and kinder interferin now missus she wanted me to do it dis way and she wanted me to do it dat way and finally i got kinder sarcy and says i now missus do just look at them beautiful white hands o yourn with long fingers and all a sparkling with rings like my white lilies when de dews on em and look at my great black stumpin hands now don't ye think dat de lord must have meant me to make de pie crust and you to stay in de piler 
dare i was just so sarcy massa george and what did mother say said george say why she kinder larfed in her eyes dem great handsome eyes of hern and says she well aunt chloe i think you are about in the right on it says she and she went off to de piler she oughter cracked me over de head for being so sarcy but dare's where it is i can't do nothing with ladies in de kitchen well you made out well with that dinner i remember everybody said so said george didn't i and want i behind de dining-room door dat berry day and didn't i see de general pass his plate three times for some more dat berry pie and says he you must have an uncommon cook mrs shelby lor i was fit to split myself andy general he knows what cookin is said aunt chloe drawing herself up with an air very nice man de general he comes of one of de berry fustest families in old virginny he knows what's what now as well as i do de general you see there's pints in all pies master george but taint everybody knows what they is or as orter be but the general he knows i knew by his marks he made yes he knows what de pints is by this time master george had arrived at that pass to which every boy can come under uncommon circumstances when he really could not eat another morsel and therefore he was at leisure to notice the pile of woolly heads and glistening eyes which were regarding their operations hungrily from the opposite corner here you mose pete he said breaking off liberal bits and throwing it at them you want some too don't you come aunt chloe bake them some cakes and george and tom moved to a comfortable seat in the chimney corner while aunt chloe after baking a goodly pile of cakes took her baby in her lap and began alternately filling its mouth and her own and distributing to mose and pete who seemed rather to prefer eating theirs as they rolled about on the floor under the table tickling each other and occasionally pulling the baby's toes oh go long will ye said the mother giving now and then a kick in a kind of general way under the table when the movement became too obstreperous can't she be decent when white folks come to see ye stop dat air now will ye better mind yourselves or i'll take ye down a buttonhole lower when massa george is gone what meaning was couched under this terrible threat it is difficult to say but certain it is that its awful indistinctness seemed to produce very little impression on the young sinners addressed la now said uncle tom they are so full of tickle all the while they can't behave themselves here the boys emerged from under the table and with hands and face well plastered with molasses began a vigorous kissing of the baby get along with ye said the mother pushing away their woolly heads you'll all stick together and never get clear if you do dat fashion go along to de spring and wash yourselves she said seconding her exhortations by a slap which resounded very formidably but which seemed only to knock out so much more laugh from the young ones as they tumbled precipitately over each other out of doors where they fairly screamed with merriment did you ever see such aggravating young uns said aunt chloe rather complacently as producing an old towel kept for such emergencies she poured a little water out of the cracked teapot on it and began rubbing off the molasses from the baby's face and hands and having polished her till she shone she set her down in tom's lap while she busied herself in clearing away supper the baby employed the intervals in pulling tom's nose scratching his face and burying her fat hands in his woolly hair which last operation seemed to afford her special content ain't she a pert young un said tom holding her from him to take a full-length view then getting up he set her on his broad shoulder and began capering and dancing with her while master george snapped at her with his pocket-handkerchief and mose and pete now returned again roared after her like bears till aunt chloe declared that they fairly took her head off with their noise 
as according to her own statement this surgical operation was a matter of daily occurrence in the cabin the declaration no whit abated the merriment till every one had roared and tumbled and danced themselves down to a state of composure well now i hopes you're done said aunt chloe who had been busy in pulling out a rude box of trundle bed and now you mose and you pete get into there for we's goin to have the meetin oh mother we don't want her we wants to sit up to meetin meetins is so curious we likes em la aunt chloe shove it under and let em sit up said master george decisively giving a push to the rude machine aunt chloe having thus saved appearances seemed highly delighted to push the thing under saying as she did so well maybe twill do him some good the house now resolved itself into a committee of the whole to consider the accommodations and arrangements for the meeting what we's to do for cheers now i declare i don't know said aunt chloe as the meeting had been held at uncle tom's weekly for an indefinite length of time without any more cheers there seemed to be some encouragement to hope that a way would be discovered at present old uncle peter sang both de legs out of dat oldest cheer last week suggested mose you go along i'll bound you pulled him out some of your shines said aunt chloe well it'll stand if it only keeps jam up agin de wall said mose den uncle peter mustn't sit on it cause he always hitches when he gets a singin he hitched pretty nigh across the room t'other night said pete good lord get him in it then said mose and den he'd begin come saints and sinners hear me tell and den down he'd go and mose imitated precisely the nasal tones of the old man tumbling on the floor to illustrate the supposed catastrophe come now be decent can't she said aunt chloe ain't yer shamed master george however joined the offender in the laugh and declared decidedly that mose was a buster so the maternal admonition seemed rather to fail of effect well old man said aunt chloe you'll have to tote in them air barrels mother's barrels is like dat air widders master george was reading bout in de good book day never fails said mose aside to peter i'm sure one of em caved in last week said pete and let em all down in de middle of de singing dat air was failin warn't it during this aside between mose and pete two empty casks had been rolled into the cabin and being secured from rolling by stones on each side boards were laid across them which arrangement together with the turning down of certain tubs and pails and the disposing of the rickety chairs at last completed the preparation massa george is such a beautiful reader now i know he'll stay to read for us said aunt chloe pears like twill be so much more interesting george very readily consented for your boy is always ready for anything that makes him of importance the room was soon filled with a motley assemblage from the old grey-haired patriarch of eighty to the young girl and lad of fifteen a little harmless gossip ensued on various themes such as where old aunt sally got her new red headkerchief and how missus was a goin to give lizzie that spotted muslin gown when she'd got her new barrage made up and how master shelby was thinking of buying a new sorrel colt that was going to prove an addition to the glories of the place a few of the worshippers belonged to families hard by who had got permission to attend and who brought in various choice scraps of information about the sayings and doings at the house and on the place which circulated as freely as the same sort of small change does in higher circles after a while the singing commenced to the evident delight of all present not even all the disadvantage of nasal intonation could prevent the effect of the naturally fine voices in airs at once wild and spirited the words were sometimes the well-known and common hymns sung in the churches about and sometimes of a wilder more indefinite character 
picked up at camp meetings the chorus of one of them which ran as followed was sung with great energy and unction die on the field of battle die on the field of battle glory in my soul another special favourite had oft repeated the words oh i'm going to glory won't you come along with me don't you see the angels beckoning and a calling me away don't you see the golden city and the everlasting day there were others which made incessant mention of jordan's banks and canaan's fields and the new jerusalem for the negro mind impassioned and imaginative always attaches itself to hymns and expressions of a vivid and pictorial nature and as they sung some laughed and some cried and some clapped hands or shook hands rejoicingly with each other as if they had fairly gained the other side of the river various exhortations or relations of experience followed and intermingled with the singing one old grey-haired woman long past work but much revered as a sort of chronicle of the past rose and leaning on her staff said well chillin well i'm mighty glad to hear ye all and see ye all once more cause i don't know when i'll be gone to glory but i've done got ready chillin pears like i'd got my little bundle all tied up and my bonnet on just a waitin for the stage to come along and take me home sometimes in the night i think i hear the wheels a rattlin and i'm lookin out all the time now you just be ready to for i tell ye all chillin she said striking her staff hard on the floor dat air glory is a mighty thing it's a mighty thing chillin you don't know nothin about it it's wonderful and the old creature sat down with streaming tears as wholly overcome while the whole circle struck up o oh, canaan bright canaan i'm bound for the land of canaan master george by request read the last chapters of revelation often interrupted by such exclamations as the sakes now only hear that just think on it is all that a comin sure enough george who was a bright boy and well trained in religious things by his mother finding himself an object of general admiration threw in expositions of his own from time to time with a commendable seriousness and gravity for which he was admired by the young and blessed by the old and it was agreed on all hands that a minister couldn't lay it off better than he did that twas really mazin uncle tom was a sort of patriarch in religious matters in the neighbourhood having naturally an organisation in which the morale was strongly predominant together with a greater breadth and cultivation of mind than obtained among his companions he was looked up to with great respect as a sort of minister among them and the simple hearty sincere style of his exhortations might have edified even better educated persons but it was in prayer that he especially excelled nothing could exceed the touching simplicity the childlike earnestness of his prayers enriched with the language of scripture which seemed so entirely to have wrought itself into his being as to have become a part of himself and to drop from his lips unconsciously in the language of a pious old negro he prayed right up and so much did his prayer always work on the devotional feelings of his audiences that there seemed often a danger that it would be lost altogether in the abundance of the responses which broke out everywhere around him while this scene was passing in the cabin of the man one quite otherwise passed in the halls of the master the trader and mr shelby were seated together in the dining-room aforenamed at a table covered with papers and writing utensils mr shelby was busy in counting some bundles of bills which as they were counted he pushed over to the trader who counted them likewise all fair said the trader and now for signing these year mr shelby hastily drew the bills of sale towards him and signed them like a man that hurries over some disagreeable business and then pushed them over with the money 
Haley produced from a well-worn valise a parchment which, after looking over it a moment, he handed to Mr. Shelby, who took it with a gesture of suppressed eagerness. "'Well, now, the thing's done,' said the trader, getting up. "'It's done,' said Mr. Shelby in a musing tone and fetching a long breath he repeated it's done yer don't seem to feel much pleased with it pears to me said the trader haley said mr shelby i hope you'll remember that you promised on your honour you wouldn't sell tom without knowing what sort of hands he's going into why you've just done it sir said the trader circumstances you well know obliged me said shelby haughtily well you know they may oblige me too said the trader howsomever i'll do the very best i can in gettin tom a good berth as to my treatin on him bad you needn't be a grain afeard if there's anything that i thank the lord for it is that i'm never no ways cruel after the expositions which the trader had previously given of his humane principles Mr. Shelby did not feel particularly reassured by these declarations, but as they were the best comfort the case admitted of, he allowed the trader to depart in silence and betook himself to a solitary cigar. End of chapter 4「Chapter Five of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lorraine Paquette. Chapter Five Showing the Feelings of Living Property on Changing Owners. Mr. and Mrs. Shelby had retired to their apartment for the night. He was lounging in a large easy chair, looking over some letters that had come in the afternoon mail and she was standing before her mirror brushing out the complicated braids and curls in which eliza had arranged her hair for noticing her pale cheeks and haggard eyes she had excused her attendance that night and ordered her to bed the employment naturally enough suggested her conversation with the girl in the morning and turning to her husband she said carelessly by the by arthur who was that low-bred fellow that you lugged in to our dining-table to-day haley is his name said shelby turning himself rather uneasily in his chair and continuing with his eyes fixed on a letter haley who is he and what may be his business here pray well he's a man that i transacted some business with last time i was at natchez said mr shelby and he presumed on it to make himself quite at home and call and dine here eh why i invited him i had some accounts with him said shelby is he a negro trader said mrs shelby noticing a certain embarrassment in her husband's manner why my dear what put that idea into your head said shelby looking up nothing only eliza came in here after dinner in a great worry crying and taking on and said you were talking with a trader and that she heard him make an offer for her boy the ridiculous little goose she did hey said mr shelby returning to his paper which he seemed for a few moments quite intent upon not perceiving that he was holding it bottom upwards it will have to come out said he mentally as well now as ever i told eliza said mrs shelby as she continued brushing her hair that she was a little fool for her pains and that you never had anything to do with that sort of persons of course i knew you never meant to sell any of our people least of all to such a fellow well emily said her husband so i have always felt and said but the fact is that my business lies so that i cannot get on without I shall have to sell some of my hands to that creature impossible mr shelby you cannot be serious i'm sorry to say that i am said mr shelby i've agreed to sell tom what our tom 
that good faithful creature been your faithful servant from a boy oh mr shelby and you have promised him his freedom too you and i have spoken to him a hundred times of it well i could believe anything now i can believe now that you could sell little harry poor eliza's only child said mrs shelby in a tone between grief and indignation well since you must know all it is so i have agreed to sell tom and harry both and i don't know why i am to be rated as if i were a monster for doing what every one does every day but why of all others choose these said mrs shelby why sell them of all on the place if you must sell it all because they will bring the highest sum of any that's why i could choose another if you say so the fellow made me a high bid on eliza if that would suit you any better said mr shelby the wretch said mrs shelby vehemently well i didn't listen to it a moment out of regard to your feelings i wouldn't so give me some credit my dear said mrs shelby recollecting herself forgive me i have been hasty i was surprised and entirely unprepared for this but surely you will allow me to intercede for these poor creatures tom is a noble-hearted faithful fellow if he is black i do believe mr shelby that if he were put to it he would lay down his life for you i know it i dare say but what's the use of all this i can't help myself why not make a pecuniary sacrifice i'm willing to bear my part of the inconvenience oh mr shelby i have tried tried most faithfully as a christian woman should to do my duty to these poor simple dependent creatures i have cared for them instructed them watched over them and know all their little cares and joys for years and how can i ever hold up my head again among them if for the sake of a little paltry gain we sell such a faithful excellent confiding creature as poor tom and tear from him in a moment all we have taught him to love and value i have taught them the duties of the family of parent and child and husband and wife and how can i bear to have this open acknowledgment that we care for no tie no duty no relation however sacred compared with money i have talked with eliza about her boy her duty to him as a christian mother to watch over him pray for him and bring him up in a christian way and now what can i say if you tear him away and sell him body and soul to a profane unprincipled man just to save a little money i have told her that one soul is worth more than all the money in the world and how will she believe me when she sees us turn round and sell her child sell him perhaps to certain ruin of body and soul i'm sorry you feel so about it indeed i am said mr shelby and i respect your feelings too though i don't pretend to share them to their full extent but i tell you now solemnly it's of no use i can't help myself i didn't mean to tell you this emily but in plain words there is no choice between selling these two and selling everything either they must go or all must haley has come into possession of a mortgage which if i don't clear off with him directly will take everything before it i've raked and scraped and borrowed and all but begged and the price of these two was needed to make up the balance and i had to give them up haley fancied the child he agreed to settle the matter that way and no other i was in his power and had to do it if you feel so to have them sold would it be any better to have all sold mrs shelby stood like one stricken finally turning to her toilet she rested her face in her hands and gave a sort of groan this is god's curse on slavery a bitter bitter most accursed thing a curse to the master and a curse to the slave i was a fool to think i could make anything good out of such a deadly evil it is a sin to hold a slave under laws like ours 
I always felt it was. I always thought so when I was a girl. I thought so still more after I joined the church, but I thought I could gild it over. I thought by kindness and care and instruction I could make the condition of mine better than freedom. Fool that I was. Why, wife, you are getting to be an abolitionist, quite. Abolitionist? If they do all I know about slavery, they might talk. We don't need them to tell us. You know I never thought that slavery was right. Never felt willing to own slaves. Well, therein you differ from many wise and pious men, said Mr. Shelby. You remember Mr. B.'s sermon the other Sunday. I don't want to hear such sermons. I never wish to hear Mr. B. in our church again. Ministers can't help the evil, perhaps, can't cure it any more than we can, but defend it. It always went against my common sense, and I think you didn't think much of that sermon either. Well, said Shelby, I must say these ministers sometimes carry matters further than we poor sinners would exactly dare to do. We men of the world must wink pretty hard at various things and get used to a deal that isn't the exact thing. But we don't quite fancy when women and ministers come out broad and square and go beyond us in matters of either modesty or morals. That's a fact. But now, my dear, I trust you see the necessity of the thing, and you see that I have done the very best that circumstances would allow. Oh, yes, yes, said Mrs. Shelby, hurriedly and abstractedly fingering her gold watch. I haven't any jewelry of any amount, she added thoughtfully. But would not this watch do something? It was an expensive one when it was bought. If I could only at least save Eliza's child, I would sacrifice anything I have. I'm sorry, very sorry, Emily, said Mr. Shelby. I'm sorry this takes hold of you so, but it will do no good. The fact is, Emily, the thing's done. The bills of sale are already signed and in Haley's hands, and you must be thankful it is no worse. That man has had it in his power to ruin us all, and now he is fairly off. If you do the man as I do, you'd think that we had had a narrow escape. Is he so hard, then? Why, not a cruel man, exactly, but a man of leather, a man alive to nothing but trade and profit, cool and unhesitating, and unrelenting as death and the grave. He'd sell his own mother at a good percentage, not wishing the old woman any harm, either. And this wretch owns that good faithful Tom and Eliza's child? Well, my dear, the fact is that this goes rather hard with me. It's a thing I hate to think of. Haley wants to drive matters and take possession tomorrow. I'm going to get out my horse bright and early and be off. I can't see Tom, that's a fact and you had better arrange a drive somewhere and carry Eliza off. Let the thing be done when she is out of sight. No, no, said Mrs. Shelby. I'll be in no sense accomplice or help in this cruel business. I'll go and see poor old Tom. God help him in his distress. They shall see at any rate that their mistress can feel for and with them. As to Eliza, I dare not think about it. The Lord forgive us. What have we done that this cruel necessity should come on us? There was one listener to this conversation whom Mr. and Mrs. Shelby little suspected. Communicating with their apartment was a large closet opening by a door into the outer passage. When Mrs. Shelby had dismissed Eliza for the night, her feverish and excited mind had suggested the idea of this closet, and she had hidden herself there, and with her ear pressed close against the crack of the door, had lost not a word of the conversation. When the voices died into silence, she rose and crept stealthily away. Pale, shivering with rigid features and compressed lips, she looked an entirely altered being from the soft and timid creature she had been hitherto. 
she moved cautiously along the entry paused one moment at her mistress's door and raised her hands in mute appeal to heaven and then turned and glided into her own room it was a quiet neat apartment on the same floor with her mistress there was a pleasant sunny window where she had often sat singing at her sewing there was a little case of books and various little fancy articles ranged by them the gifts of christmas holidays there was her simple wardrobe in the closet and in the drawers here was in short her home and on the whole a happy one it had been to her but there on the bed lay her slumbering boy his long curls falling negligently around his unconscious face his rosy mouth half open his little fat hands thrown out over the bedclothes and a smile spread like a sunbeam over his whole face poor boy poor fellow said eliza they have sold you but your mother will save you yet no tear dropped over that pillow in such straits as these the heart has no tears to give it drops only blood bleeding itself away in silence she took a piece of paper and a pencil and wrote hastily oh missus dear missus don't think me ungrateful don't think hard of me any way i heard all you and master said to-night i am going to try to save my boy you will not blame me god bless and reward you for all your kindness hastily folding and directing this she went to a drawer and made up a little package of clothing for her boy which she tied with a handkerchief firmly round her waist and so fond is a mother's remembrance that even in the terrors of that hour she did not forget to put in the little package one or two of his favourite toys reserving a gaily painted parrot to amuse him when she should be called on to awaken him it was some trouble to arouse the little sleeper but after some effort he sat up and was playing with his bird while his mother was putting on her bonnet and a shawl where are you going mother said he as she drew near the bed with his little coat and cap his mother drew near and looked so earnestly into his eyes that he at once divined that something unusual was the matter hush harry she said mustn't speak loud or they will hear us a wicked man was coming to take little harry away from his mother and carry him way off in the dark but mother won't let him she's going to put on her little boy's cap and coat and run off with him so the ugly man can't catch him saying these words she had tied and buttoned on the child's simple outfit and taking him in her arms she whispered to him to be very still and opening a door in her room which led into the outer veranda she glided noiselessly out it was a sparkling frosty starlight night and the mother wrapped the shawl close round her child as perfectly quiet with vague terror he clung round her neck old bruno a great newfoundland who slept at the end of the porch rose with a low growl as she came near she gently spoke his name and the animal an old pet and playmate of hers instantly wagging his tail prepared to follow her though apparently revolving much in the simple dog's head what such an indiscreet midnight promenade might mean some dim ideas of imprudence or impropriety in the measure seemed to embarrass him considerably for he often stopped as eliza glided forward and looked wistfully first at her and then at the house and then as if reassured by reflection he pattered along after her again a few minutes brought them to the window of uncle tom's cottage and eliza stopping tapped lightly on the window-pane the prayer-meeting at uncle tom's had in the order of hymn singing been protracted to a very late hour and as uncle tom had indulged himself in a few lengthy solos afterwards the consequence was that although it was now between twelve and one o'clock he and his worthy helpmeet were not yet asleep 
"'Good Lord, what's that?' said Aunt Chloe, starting up and hastily drawing the curtain. "'My sakes alive, if it ain't Lizzie! "'Get on your clothes, old man. Quick! There's old Bruno, too, a pawn round. "'What on airth? I'm gin to open the door.' and suiting the action to the word the door flew open and the light of the tallow candle which tom had hastily lighted fell on the haggard face and dark wild eyes of the fugitive lord bless you i'm skeered to look at ye lizzie are ye tuck sick or what's come over ye i'm running away uncle tom and aunt chloe carrying off my child master sold him sold him echoed both lifting up their hands in dismay yes sold him said eliza firmly i crept into the closet by mistress's door to-night and i heard master tell missus that he had sold my harry and you uncle tom both to a trader and that he was going off this morning on his horse and that the man was to take possession to-day tom had stood during this speech with his hands raised and his eyes dilated like a man in a dream slowly and gradually as its meaning came over him he collapsed rather than seated himself on his old chair and sunk his head down upon his knees the good lord have pity on us said aunt chloe oh it don't seem as it was true what has he done that master should sell him he hasn't done anything it isn't for that master don't want to sell and missus she's always good i heard her plead and beg for us but he told her twas no use that he was in this man's debt and that this man had got the power over him and that if he didn't pay him off clear it would end up his having to sell the place and all the people and move off yes i heard him say there was no choice between selling these two and selling all the man was driving him so hard master said he was sorry but oh missus you ought to have heard her talk if she ain't a christian and an angel there never was one i'm a wicked girl to leave her so but then i can't help it she said herself one soul was worth more than the world and this boy has a soul and if i let him be carried off who knows what'll become of it it must be right but if it ain't right the lord forgive me for i can't help doing it well old man said aunt chloe why don't you go too will you wait to be toted down river where they kill niggers with hard work and starving i'd a heap rather die than go there any day there's time for ye be off with lizzie you've got a pass to come and go any time come bustle up and i'll get your things together tom slowly raised his head and looked sorrowfully but quietly around and said no no i ain't going let eliza go it's her right i wouldn't be the one to say no taint in nature for her to stay but you heard what she said if i must be sold or all the people on the place and everything go to rack why let me be sold i suppose i can bear it as well as any on him he added while something like a sob and a sigh shook his broad rough chest convulsively master always found me on the spot he always will i never have broke trust nor used my past no ways contrary to my word and i never will it's better for me alone to go than to break up the place and sell all master ain't to blame chloe and he'll take care of you and the poor here he turned to the rough trundle bed full of little woolly heads and broke fairly down he leaned over the back of the chair and covered his face with his large hands sobs heavy hoarse and loud shook the chair and great tears fell through his fingers on the floor just such tears sir as you dropped into the coffin where lay your first-born son such tears woman as you shed when you heard the cries of your dying babe for sir he was a man and you are but another man 
and woman though dressed in silk and jewels you are but a woman and in life's great straits and mighty griefs ye feel but one sorrow and now said eliza as she stood in the door i saw my husband only this afternoon and i little knew then what was to come they have pushed him to the very last standing place and he told me to-day that he was going to run away do try if you can to get word to him tell him how i went and why i went and tell him i'm going to try and find canada you must give my love to him and tell him if i never see him again she turned away and stood with her back to them for a moment then added in a husky voice tell him to be as good as he can and try to meet me in the kingdom of heaven call bruno in there she added shut the door on him poor beast he mustn't go with me a few last words and tears a few simple adieus and blessings and clasping her wondering and affrighted child in her arms she glided noiselessly away End of chapter 5「Six of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lorraine Paquette. Chapter Six Discovery. Mr. and Mrs. Shelby, after their protracted discussion of the night before, did not readily sink to repose, and in consequence slept somewhat later than usual the ensuing morning i wonder what keeps eliza said mrs shelby after giving her bell repeated pulls to no purpose mr shelby was standing before his dressing-glass sharpening his razor and just then the door opened and a coloured boy entered with his shaving-water andy said his mistress step to eliza's door and tell her i have rung for her three times poor thing she added to herself with a sigh Andy soon returned with eyes very wide in astonishment. Lor, missus, Lizzie's drawers is all open and her things all lying every which way, and I believe she's just done cleared out. The truth flashed upon Mr. Shelby and his wife at the same moment. He exclaimed, Then she suspected it and she's off. The Lord be thanked, said Mrs. Shelby i trust she is wife you talk like a fool really it will be something pretty awkward for me if she is haley saw that i hesitated about selling this child and he'll think i connived at it to get him out of the way it touches my honour and mr shelby left the room hastily there was great running and ejaculating and opening and shutting of doors an appearance of faces in all shades of colour in different places for about a quarter of an hour one person only who might have shed some light on the matter was entirely silent and that was the head cook aunt chloe silently and with a heavy cloud settled down over her once joyous face she proceeded making out her breakfast biscuits as if she heard and saw nothing of the excitement around her very soon about a dozen young imps were roosting like so many crows on the veranda railings each one determined to be the first one to apprise the strange massa of his ill luck he'll be real mad i'll be bound said andy won't he swar said little black jake yes for he does swar said woolly-headed mandy i hearn him yesterday at dinner i hearn all about it then cause i got into the closet where missus keeps the great jugs and i hearn every word and mandy who never in her life thought of the meaning of a word she had heard more than a black cat now took airs of superior wisdom and strutted about forgetting to state that though actually coiled up among the jugs at the time specified she had been fast asleep all the time when at last haley appeared booted and spurred he was saluted with the bad tidings on every hand 
the young imps on the veranda were not disappointed in their hope of hearing him swar which he did with a fluency and fervency which delighted them all amazingly as they ducked and dodged hither and thither to be out of the reach of his riding whip and all whooping off together they tumbled in a pile of immeasurable giggle on the withered turf under the veranda where they kicked up their heels and shouted to their full satisfaction if i had the little devils muttered haley between his teeth but you ain't got em though said andy with a triumphant flourish and making a string of indescribable mouths at the unfortunate trader's back when he was fairly beyond hearing i say now shelby this year's a most extraordinary business said haley as he abruptly entered the piler it seems that gal's off with her young un mr haley mrs shelby is present said mr shelby i beg your pardon ma'am said haley bowing slightly with a still lowering brow but i still say as i said before this year's a singular report is it true sir sir said mr shelby if you wish to communicate with me you must observe something of the decorum of a gentleman andy take mr haley's hat and riding whip take a seat sir yes sir i regret to say that the young woman excited by overhearing or having reported to her something of this business has taken her child in the night and made off i did expect fair dealing in this matter i confess said haley well sir said mr shelby turning sharply round upon him what am i to understand by that remark if any man calls my honour in question i have but one answer for him the trader cowered at this and in a somewhat lower tone said that it was plaguy hard on a fellow that had made a fair bargain to be gulled that way mr haley said mr shelby if i did not think you had some cause for disappointment i should not have borne from you the rude and unceremonious style of your entrance into my parlour this morning i say thus much however since appearances call for it that i shall allow of no insinuations cast upon me as if i were at all partner to any unfairness in this matter moreover i shall feel bound to give you every assistance in the use of horses servants and sea in the recovery of your property so in short haley said he suddenly dropping from the tone of dignified coolness to his ordinary one of easy frankness the best way for you is to keep good-natured and eat some breakfast and we will then see what is to be done mrs shelby now rose and said her engagements would prevent her being at the breakfast-table that morning and deputing a very respectable mulatto woman to attend to the gentleman's coffee at the sideboard she left the room old lady don't like your humble servant over and above said haley with an uneasy effort to be very familiar i am not accustomed to hear my wife spoken of with such freedom said mr shelby dryly beg pardon of course only a joke you know said haley forcing a laugh some jokes are less agreeable than others rejoined shelby devilish free now i've signed those papers cuss him muttered haley to himself quite grand since yesterday never did fall of any prime minister at court occasion wider surges of sensation than the report of tom's fate among his compeers on the place it was the topic in every mouth everywhere and nothing was done in the house or in the field but to discuss its probable results eliza's flight an unprecedented event on the place was also a great accessory in stimulating the general excitement black sam as he was commonly called from his being about three shades blacker than any other son of ebony on the place was revolving the matter profoundly in all its phases and bearings with a comprehensiveness of vision and a strict lookout to his own personal well-being 
that would have done credit to any white patriot in washington it's an ill wind dat blow nowhere dat are a fact said sam sententiously giving an additional hoist to his pantaloons and adroitly substituting a long nail in place of a missing suspender button with which effort of mechanical genius he seemed highly delighted yes it's an ill wind blows nowhar he repeated now dar tom's down well course there's room for some nigger to be up and why not dis nigger dat's de idea tom a ridin round de country boots blacked pass in his pocket all grand as coffee but who he now why shouldn't sam dat's what i want to know hallo sam oh sam massa wants you to cotch bill and jerry said andy cutting short sam's soliloquy hi what's afoot now young un why you don't know i s'pose that lizzie's cut stick and cleared out with her young un you teach your granny said sam with infinite contempt no did a heap sight sooner than you did this nigger ain't so green now well anyhow massa wants bill and jerry geared right up and you and i's to go with massa haley to look arter her good now dat's de time o day said sam it's sam dat's called for in dese year times he's de digger see if i don't cotch her now master'll see what sam can do ah but sam said andy you'd better think twice for missus don't want her cotched and she'll be in your wool hi said sam opening his eyes how you know dat heard her say so my own self dis blessed morning when i bring in massa's shaving water she sent me to see why lizzie didn't come to dress her and when i telled her she was off she just riz up and says she the lord be praised and masser he seemed rail mad and says he wife you talk like a fool but lor she'll bring him to i knows well enough how that'll be it's allers best to stand missus's side the fence now i tell yer black sam upon this scratched his woolly pate which if it did not contain very profound wisdom still contained a great deal of a particular species much in demand among politicians of all complexions and countries and vulgarly denominated knowing which side the bread is buttered so stopping with grave consideration he again gave a hitch to his pantaloons which was his regularly organized method of assisting his mental perplexities there ain't no saying never bout no kind of thing in dis year world he said at last sam spoke like a philosopher emphasizing this as if he had had a large experience in different sorts of worlds and therefore had come to his conclusion advisedly now sartin i'd a said that missus would a scoured the varsal world after lizzie added sam thoughtfully so she would said andy but can't you see through a ladder ye black nigger missus don't want dis year massa haley to get lizzie's boy dat's de go hi said sam with an indescribable intonation known only to those who have known it among the negroes but i'll tell yer more and all said andy i specs you'd better be makin tracks for dem hosses mighty sudden too for i hear missus quirin arter yer so you've stood foolin long enough sam upon this began to bestir himself in real earnest and after a while appeared bearing down gloriously toward the house with bill and jerry in a full canter and adroitly throwing himself off before they had any idea of stopping he brought them up alongside of the horse post like a tornado haley's horse which was a skittish young colt winced and bounced and pulled hard at his halter ho ho said sam skeery are ye 
and his black visage lighted up with a curious mischievous gleam i'll fix ye now said he there was a large beech tree overshadowing the place and the small sharp triangular beech nuts lay scattered thickly on the ground with one of these in his fingers sam approached the colt stroked and patted and seemed apparently busy in soothing his agitation on pretence of adjusting the saddle he adroitly slipped under it the sharp little nut in such a manner that the least weight brought upon the saddle would annoy the nervous sensibilities of the animal without leaving any perceptible graze or wound dar he said rolling his eyes with an approving grin me fix him at that moment mrs shelby appeared on the balcony beckoning to him sam approached with as good a determination to pay court as did ever suitor after a vacant place at st james's or washington why have you been loitering so sam i sent andy to tell you to hurry lord bless you missus said sam horses won't be cotched all in a minute they done clared out way down to the south pasture and the lord knows where sam how often must i tell you not to say lord bless you and the lord knows and such things it's wicked oh lord bless my soul i done forgot missus i won't say nothing of de sort no more why sam you just have said it again did i oh lord i mean i didn't go for to say it you must be careful sam just let me get my breath missus and i'll start fair i'll be very careful well sam you are to go with mr haley to show him the road and help him be careful with the horses sam you know jerry was a little lame last week don't ride them too fast mrs shelby spoke the last words with a low voice and strong emphasis let dis child alone for dat said sam rolling up his eyes with a volume of meaning lord knows hi didn't say that said he suddenly catching his breath with a ludicrous flourish of apprehension which made his mistress laugh spite of herself yes missus i'll look out for de horses now andy said sam returning to his stand under the beech trees you see i wouldn't be tall surprised if dat ar gentleman's critter should gib a fling by and by when he comes to be a gettin up you know andy critters will do such things and therewith sam poked andy in the side in a highly suggestive manner hi said andy with an air of instant appreciation yes you see andy missus wants to make time dat ars clare to der most ordinary observer i just make a little for her now you see get all dese yer hosses loose caperin permiscus round dis yer lot and down to de wood dar and i spec massa won't be off in a hurry andy grinned you see said sam you see andy if any such thing should happen as that massa haley's horse should begin to act contrary and cut up you and i just let's go of ourn to help him and we'll help him oh yes and sam and andy laid their heads back on their shoulders and broke into a low immoderate laugh snapping their fingers and flourishing their heels with exquisite delight at this instant haley appeared on the veranda somewhat mollified by certain cups of very good coffee he came out smiling and talking in tolerably restored humour sam and andy clawing for certain fragmentary palm leaves which they were in the habit of considering as hats flew to the horse posts to be ready to help masser sam's palm leaf had been ingeniously disentangled from all pretensions to braid as respects its brim and the slivers starting apart and standing upright gave it a blazing air of freedom and defiance quite equal to that of any fiji chief 
while the whole brim of Andy's being departed bodily, he wrapped the crown on his head with a dexterous thump and looked about well pleased as if to say, Who says I haven't got a hat? Well, boys, said Haley, look alive now, we must lose no time. Not a bit of him, masser, said Sam, putting Haley's rein in his hand and holding his stirrup while Andy was untying the other two horses. The instant Haley touched the saddle, the meddlesome creature bounded from the earth with a sudden spring that threw his master sprawling some feet off on the soft, dry turf. Sam, with frantic ejaculations, made a dive at the reins, but only succeeded in brushing the blazing palm-leaf aforenamed into the horse's eyes, which by no means tended to allay the confusion of his nerves. So, with great vehemence, he overturned Sam, and giving two or three contemptuous snorts, flourished his heels vigorously in the air, and was soon prancing away towards the lower end of the lawn, followed by Bill and Jerry, whom Andy had not failed to let loose, according to contract, speeding them off with various direful ejaculations. And now ensued a miscellaneous scene of confusion, Sam and Andy ran and shouted, dogs barked here and there, and Mike, Mose, Mandy, Fanny, and all the smaller specimens on the place, both male and female, raced, clapped hands, hooped and shouted with outrageous officiousness and untiring zeal. Haley's horse, which was a white one, and very fleet and spirited, appeared to enter into the spirit of the scene with great gusto and having for his coursing ground a lawn of nearly half a mile in extent, gently sloping down on every side into indefinite woodland, he appeared to take infinite delight in seeing how near he could allow his pursuers to approach him, and then, when within a hand's breath, whisk off with a start and a snort, like a mischievous beast as he was, and career far down into some alley of the woodlot, Nothing was further from Sam's mind than to have any one of the troop taken until such season as should seem to him most befitting, and the exertions that he made were certainly most heroic, like the sword of Cour de Leon, which always blazed in the front and thickest of the battle. Sam's palm leaf was to be seen everywhere when there was the least danger that the horse could be caught. There he would bear down full tilt, shouting, Now for it, cotch him, cotch him, in a way that would set everything to indiscriminate rout in a moment. Haley ran up and down and cursed and swore and stamped miscellaneously. Mr. Shelby in vain tried to shout directions from the balcony, and Mrs. Shelby from her chamber window alternately laughed and wondered not without some inkling of what lay at the bottom of all this confusion at last about twelve o'clock sam appeared triumphant mounted on jerry with haley's horse by his side reeking with sweat and with flashing eyes and dilated nostrils showing that the spirit of freedom had not yet entirely subsided he's cotched he exclaimed triumphantly if it hadn't been for me, they might have bust themselves all on him, but I cotched him. You, growled Haley, in no amiable mood, if it hadn't been for you, this never would have happened. Lord bless us, Master, said Sam, in a tone of the deepest concern, and me that has been racing and chasing till the sweat just pours off me. Well, well, said Haley. You've lost me near three hours with your cursed nonsense. Now let's be off and have no more fooling. Why, Master, said Sam, in a deprecating tone, I believe you mean to kill us all, Clare, horses and all. Here we are, all just ready to drop down and the critters all in a reek of sweat. Why, Master won't think of starting off now till arter dinner. Master's hoss wants rubbin' down. See how he splashed hisself, and Jerry limps too. 
don't think missus would be willin to have us start dis year way no how lord bless you master we can catch up if we do stop lizzie never was no great of a walker mrs shelby who greatly to her amusement had overheard this conversation from the veranda now resolved to do her part she came forward and courteously expressing her concern for haley's accident pressed him to stay for dinner saying that the cook should bring it on the table immediately thus all things considered haley with rather an equivocal grace proceeded to the piler while sam rolling his eyes after him with unutterable meaning proceeded gravely with the horses to the stable yard did yer see him andy did yer see him said sam when he had got fairly beyond the shelter of the barn and fastened the horse to a post oh lor if it warn't as good as a meetin now to see him a dancin and kickin and swearin at us didn't i hear him swar away old fellow says i to myself will yer have your horse now or wait till you cotch him says i lor andy i think i can see him now and sam and andy leaned up against the barn and laughed to their heart's content yer oughter see how mad he looked when i brought the hoss up lord he'd a killed me if he durst to and there i was a standin as innercent and as humble lor i seed him said andy ain't you an old hoss sam rather specs i am said sam did yer see missus upstairs at the winder i seed her laughin i'm sure i was racin so i didn't see nothin said andy well yer see said sam proceeding gravely to wash down haley's pony i's quired what you may call a habit of bobservation andy it's a very portent habit andy and i commend yer to be cultivatin it now yer young hist up that hind foot andy yer see andy it's bobservation makes all de difference in niggers didn't i say which way the wind blew dis year mornin didn't i see what missus wanted though she never let on dat ars bobservation andy i specs it's what you may call a faculty faculties is different in different peoples but cultivation of em goes a great way i guess if i hadn't helped your bobservation dis mornin yer wouldn't have seen your way so smart said andy andy said sam you's a promisin child dere ain't no manner a doubt i thinks lots of yer andy and i don't feel no ways ashamed to take ideas from you we oughtn't to overlook nobody andy cause the smartest on us gets tripped up sometimes and so andy let's go up to the house now i'll be bound missus'll give us an uncommon good bite dis year time End of chapter six chapter seven of uncle tom's cabin by harriet beecher stowe this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lorraine Paquette. Chapter Seven: The Mother's Struggle. It is impossible to conceive of a human creature more wholly desolate and forlorn than Eliza when she turned her footsteps from Uncle Tom's cabin. Her husband's suffering and dangers, and the danger of her child, all blended in her mind with a confused and stunning sense of the risk she was running in leaving the only home she had ever known and cutting loose from the protection of a friend whom she had loved and revered then there was the parting from every familiar object the place where she had grown up the trees under which she had played the groves where she had walked many an evening in happier days by the side of her young husband everything as it lay in the clear frosty starlight seemed to speak reproachfully to her and ask her whither could she go from a home like that but stronger than all was maternal love wrought into a paroxysm of frenzy by the near approach of a fearful danger 
her boy was old enough to have walked by her side and in an indifferent case she would only have led him by the hand but now the bare thought of putting him out of her arms made her shudder and she strained him to her bosom with a convulsive grasp as she went rapidly forward the frosty ground creaked beneath her feet and she trembled at the sound every quaking leaf and fluttering shadow sent the blood backward to her heart and quickened her footsteps she wondered within herself at the strength that seemed to be come upon her for she felt the weight of her boy as if it had been a feather and every flutter of fear seemed to increase the supernatural power that bore her on while from her pale lips burst forth in frequent ejaculations the prayer to a friend above lord help lord save me if it were your harry mother or your willie that were going to be torn from you by a brutal traitor to-morrow morning if you had seen the man and heard that the papers were signed and delivered and you had only from twelve o'clock till morning to make good your escape how fast could you walk how many miles could you make in those few brief hours with the darling at your bosom the little sleepy head on your shoulder the small soft arms trustingly holding on to your neck for the child slept at first the novelty and alarm kept him waking but his mother so hurriedly repressed every breath or sound and so assured him that if he were only still she would certainly save him that he clung quietly round her neck only asking as he found himself sinking to sleep mother i don't need to keep awake do i no my darling sleep if you want to but mother if i do get asleep you won't let him get me no so may god help me said his mother with a paler cheek and a brighter light in her large dark eyes you're sure ain't you mother yes sure said the mother in a voice that startled herself for it seemed to her to come from a spirit within that was no part of her and the boy dropped his little weary head on her shoulder and was soon asleep how the touch of those warm arms the gentle breathings that came in her neck seemed to add fire and spirit to her movements it seemed to her as if strength poured into her in electric streams from every gentle touch and movement of the sleeping confiding child sublime is the dominion of the mind over the body that for a time can make flesh and nerve impregnable and string the sinews like steel so that the weak become so mighty the boundaries of the farm the grove the wood lot passed by her dizzily as she walked on and still she went leaving one familiar object after another slacking not pausing not till reddening daylight found her many a long mile from all traces of any familiar objects upon the open highway she had often been with her mistress to visit some connections in the little village of t not far from the ohio river and knew the road well to go thither to escape across the ohio river were the first hurried outlines of her plan of escape beyond that she could only hope in god when horses and vehicles began to move along the highway with that alert perception peculiar to a state of excitement and which seems to be a sort of inspiration she became aware that her headlong pace and distracted air might bring on her remark and suspicion she therefore put the boy on the ground and adjusting her dress and bonnet she walked on at as rapid a pace as she thought consistent with the preservation of appearances in her little bundle she had provided a store of cakes and apples which she used as expedients for quickening the speed of the child rolling the apple some yards before them when the boy would run with all his might after it and this ruse often repeated carried them over many a half mile after a while they came to a thick patch of woodland through which murmured a clear brook as the child complained of hunger and thirst she climbed over the fence with him and sitting down behind a large rock which concealed them from the road she gave him a breakfast out of her little package the boy wondered and grieved that she could not eat and when putting his arms round her neck he tried to wedge some of his cake into her mouth it seemed to her that the rising in her throat would choke her 
no no harry darling mother can't eat until you are safe we must go on on till we come to the river and she hurried again into the road and again constrained herself to walk regularly and composedly forward she was many miles past any neighbourhood where she was personally known if she should chance to meet any who knew her she reflected that the well-known kindness of the family would be of itself a blind to suspicion as making it an unlikely supposition that she could be a fugitive as she was also so white as not to be known as of coloured lineage without a critical survey and her child was white also it was much easier for her to pass on unsuspected on this presumption she stopped at noon at a neat farmhouse to rest herself and buy some dinner for her child and self for as the danger decreased with the distance the supernatural tension of the nervous system lessened and she found herself both weary and hungry the good woman kindly and gossiping seemed rather pleased than otherwise with having somebody come in to talk with and accepted without examination eliza's statement that she was going on a little piece to spend a week with her friends all which she hoped in her heart might prove strictly true an hour before sunset she entered the village of t by the ohio river weary and footsore but still strong in heart her first glance was at the river which lay like jordan between her and the canaan of liberty on the other side it was now early spring and the river was swollen and turbulent great cakes of floating ice were swinging heavily to and fro in the turbid waters owing to the peculiar form of the shore on the kentucky side the land bending far out into the water the ice had been lodged and detained in great quantities and the narrow channel which swept round the bend was full of ice piled one cake over another thus forming a temporary barrier to the descending ice which lodged and formed a great undulating raft filling up the whole river and extending almost to the kentucky shore eliza stood for a moment contemplating this unfavourable aspect of things which she saw at once must prevent the usual ferry-boat from running and then turned into a small public house on the bank to make a few inquiries the hostess who was busy in various fizzing and stewing operations over the fire preparatory to the evening meal stopped with a fork in her hand as eliza's sweet and plaintive voice arrested her what is it she said isn't there any ferry or boat that takes people over to b now she said no indeed said the woman the boats has stopped running eliza's look of dismay and disappointment struck the woman and she said inquiringly maybe you're wanting to get over anybody sick ye seem mighty anxious i've got a child that's very dangerous said eliza i never heard of it till last night and i've walked quite a piece to-day in hopes to get to the ferry well now that's unlucky said the woman whose motherly sympathies were much aroused i'm really concerned for ye solomon she called from the window towards a small back building a man in leathern apron and very dirty hands appeared at the door i say so said the woman is that air man going to tote them barrels over to-night he said he would try if twas any way prudent said the man there's a man a piece down here that's going over with some truck this evening if he durst to he'll be in here to supper to-night so you'd better set down and wait that's a sweet little fellow added the woman offering him a cake but the child wholly exhausted cried with weariness poor fellow he isn't used to walking and i've hurried him on so said eliza well take him into this room said the woman opening into a small bedroom where stood a comfortable bed eliza laid the weary boy upon it and held his hands in hers till he was fast asleep for her there was no rest as a fire in her bones the thought of the pursuers urged her on and she gazed with longing eyes on the sullen surging waters that lay between her and liberty 
Here we must take our leave of her for the present, to follow the course of her pursuers. Though Mrs. Shelby had promised that the dinner should be hurried on table, yet it was soon seen, as the thing has often been seen before, that it required more than one to make a bargain. So, although the order was fairly given out in Haley's hearing, and carried to Aunt Chloe by at least half a dozen juvenile messengers, that dignitary only gave certain very gruff snorts and tosses of her head, and went on with every operation in an unusually leisurely and circumstantial manner. For some singular reason an impression seemed to reign among the servants generally that Mrs. would not be particularly disobliged by delay and it was wonderful what a number of counter-accidents occurred constantly to retard the course of things. One luckless white contrived to upset the gravy, and then gravy had to be got up de novo with due care and formality, Aunt Chloe watching and stirring with dogged precision, answering shortly to all suggestions of haste that she warn't a-going to have raw gravy on the table to help nobody's catchings. One tumbled down with the water and had to go to the spring for more, and another precipitated the butter into the path of events. And there was time to time giggling news brought into the kitchen that Master Haley was mighty uneasy, and that he couldn't sit in his cheers no way, but was a-walkin' and a-stalkin' to the windows and through the porch. Sarves him right, said Aunt Chloe, indignantly. He'll get worse nor uneasy one of these days if he don't mend his ways. His master'll be sending for him, and then see how he'll look. He'll go to torment, and no mistake, said little Jake. He deserves it, said Aunt Chloe grimly. He's broke a many, many, many hearts. I tell ye all, she said, stopping with a fork uplifted in her hands. It's like when Massa George reads in Revelations, souls a callin' under the altar, and a callin' on the Lord for vengeance on sitch, and by and by the Lord he'll hear em, so he will. Aunt Chloe, who was much revered in the kitchen, was listened to with open mouth, and the dinner being now fairly sent in, the whole kitchen was at leisure to gossip with her, and to listen to her remarks. Sitch will be burned up for ever, and no mistake, said Andy. I'd be glad to see it, I'll be bound, said little Jake. Chillin, said a voice that made them all start. It was Uncle Tom who had come in and stood listening to the conversation at the door. Chillin, he said, I'm afeard you don't know what you're sayin'. Forever is a dreadful word, chillin. It's awful to think on't. You oughtn't to wish that are to any human critter. We wouldn't to anybody but the soul drivers, said Andy. Nobody can help wishing it to them. They's so awful wicked. Don't nature herself kind of cry out on em, said Aunt Chloe. Don't they tear their sucking baby right off his mother's breast and sell him? And her little children as is crying and holding on by her clothes? Don't they pull em off and sells em? Don't they tear wife and husband apart? said Aunt Chloe, beginning to cry, when it's just taken the very life on him, and all the while does they feel one bit? Don't they drink and smoke and take on uncommon easy? Lor, if the devil don't get him, what's he good for? And Aunt Chloe covered her face with her checked apron and began to sob in good earnest. Pray for them that spitefully use you, the good book says says tom pray for him said aunt chloe lor it's too tough i can't pray for him it's nature chloe and nature's strong said tom but the lord's grace is stronger besides you oughter think what an awful state a poor critter's soul is in that'll do them our things you oughter thank god that you ain't like him chloe i'm sure i'd rather be sold ten thousand times over than to have all that our poor critters got to answer for. So'd I a heap, said Jake. Lor, shouldn't we cotch it, Andy? Andy shrugged his shoulders and gave an accusant whistle. I'm glad Master didn't go off this morning as he looked to, said Tom. 
that ar hurt me more than sellin it did maybe it might have been natural for him but it would have come desperate hard on me as has known him from a baby but i've seen masser and i begin to feel sort o reconciled to the lord's will now masser couldn't help hisself he did right but i'm feared things will be kinder goin to rack when i'm gone masser can't be expected to be a pryin round every war as i've done a keepin up all the ends the boys all means well but they's powerful careless that air troubles me the bell here rang and tom was summoned to the piler tom said his master kindly i want you to notice that i give this gentleman bonds to forfeit a thousand dollars if you are not on the spot when he wants you he's going to-day to look after his other business and you can have the day to yourself go anywhere you like boy thank you masser said tom and mind yourself said the trader and don't come it over your master with any of your nigger tricks for i'll take every cent out of him if you ain't there if he'd hear to me he wouldn't trust any on ye slippery as eels masser said tom and he stood very straight i was just eight years old when old missus put you into my arms and you wasn't a year old thar says she tom that's to be your young masser take good care on him says she and now i just ask you masser have i ever broke a word to you or gone contrary to you specially since i was a christian mr shelby was fairly overcome and the tears rose to his eyes my good boy said he the lord knows you say but the truth and if i was able to help it all the world shouldn't buy you and as sure as i am a christian woman said mrs shelby you shall be redeemed as soon as i can any bring together means sir she said to haley take good account of who you sell him to and let me know lor yes for that matter said the trader i may bring him up in a year not much the worse for wear and trade him back i'll trade with you then and make it for your advantage said mrs shelby of course said the trader all's equal with me lives trade em up as down so i does a good business all i want is a livin you know ma'am that's all any on us wants i s'pose mr and mrs shelby both felt annoyed and degraded by the familiar impudence of the trader and yet both saw the absolute necessity of putting a constraint on their feelings the more hopelessly sordid and insensible he appeared the greater became mrs shelby's dread of his succeeding in recapturing eliza and her child and of course the greater her motive for detaining him by every female artifice she therefore graciously smiled assented chatted familiarly and did all she could to make time pass imperceptibly at two o'clock sam and andy brought the horses up to the posts apparently greatly refreshed and invigorated by the scamper of the morning sam was there new oiled from dinner with an abundance of zealous and ready officiousness as haley appeared he was boasting in flourishing style to andy of the evident and eminent success of the operation now that he had fairly come to it your master i suppose don't keep no dogs said haley thoughtfully as he prepared to mount heaps on em said sam triumphantly thar's bruno he's a roarer and besides that bout every nigger of us keeps a pup of some nature or other pa said haley and he said something else too with regard to the said dogs at which sam muttered i don't see no use cussin on em no way but your master don't keep no dogs i pretty much know he don't for trackin out niggers sam knew exactly what he meant but he kept on a look of earnest and desperate simplicity our dogs all smells round considerable sharp i spec they's the kind though they han't never had no practice they's far dogs though at most anything if you'd get em started here bruno he called whistling to the lumbering newfoundland who came pitching tumultuously toward them you go hang said haley getting up come tumble up now 
Sam tumbled up accordingly, dexterously contriving to tickle Andy as he did so, which occasioned Andy to split out into a laugh, greatly to Haley's indignation, who made a cut at him with his riding whip. "'I astonished at your Andy,' said Sam, with awful gravity. "'This year's a serious business, Andy. You mustn't be a-makin' game. This year ain't no way to help Massa.' "'I shall take the straight road to the river.' said Haley decidedly, after they had come to the boundaries of the estate. I know the way of all of em. They makes tracks for the underground. Sartin, said Sam. Dat's de idee. Master Haley hits de thing right in de middle. Now, there's two roads to de river, de dirt road and der pike. Which master means to take? Andy looked up innocently at Sam, surprised at hearing this new geographical fact, but instantly confirmed what he said by a vehement reiteration. Cos, said Sam, I'd rather be kind to imagine that Lizzie'd take de dirt road, being it's the least travelled. Haley, notwithstanding that he was a very old bird, and naturally inclined to be suspicious of chaff, was rather brought up by this view of the case. If you warn't both on your such cussed liars now, he said contemplatively as he pondered a moment. The pensive, reflective tone in which this was spoken appeared to amuse Andy prodigiously, and he drew a little behind and shook so as apparently to run a great risk of falling off his horse, while Sam's face was immovably composed into the most doleful gravity. Course, said Sam. Master can do as he'd rather. Go de straight road, if master think best. It's all one to us. When I study pon it, I think de straight road de best, decidedly. She would naturally go a lonesome way, said Haley, thinking aloud, and not minding Sam's remark. Dar ain't no sayin', said Sam. Gals is peculiar. They never does nothing you think say well, most generally the contrary. Gals is natly made contrary, so if you think they've gone one road, it is sartin you'd better go t'other, and then you'll be sure to find em. Now, my private opinion is, Lizzie took de road, so I think we'd better take de straight one. This profound generic view of the female sex did not seem to dispose Haley particularly to the straight road, and he announced decidedly that he should go the other and asked Sam when they should come to it. A little piece ahead, said Sam, giving a wink to Andy with the eye that was on Andy's side of the head, and he added gravely, But I've studied on de matter, and I'm quite clar we ought not to go dat air way. I never been over it no way. It's despot lonesome, and we might lose our way. Where we'd come to, de Lord only knows. Nevertheless, said Haley, I shall go that way. Now I think on it. I think I hear em tell that dat our road was all fenced up and down by de creek and thar. And to Andy? Andy wasn't certain. He'd only hear and tell about that road, but never been over it. In short, he was strictly non-committal. Haley, accustomed to strike the balance of probabilities between lies of greater or lesser magnitude, thought that it lay in favour of the dirt road aforesaid the mention of the thing he thought he perceived was involuntary on sam's part at first and his confused attempts to dissuade him he set down to a desperate lying on second thoughts as being unwilling to implicate liza when therefore sam indicated the road haley plunged briskly into it followed by sam and andy now the road, in fact, was an old one that had formerly been a thoroughfare to the river, but abandoned for many years after the laying of the new pike. It was open for about an hour's ride, and after that it was cut across by various farms and fences. Sam knew this fact perfectly well. Indeed, the road had been so long closed up that Andy had never heard of it. He therefore rode along with an air of dutiful submission only groaning and vociferating occasionally that twas desperate rough and bad for Jerry's foot. Now, I just give your warning, said Haley. I know yer. 
yer won't get me to turn off this road with all your fussin so you shet up master will go his own way said sam with rueful submission at the same time winking most portentously to andy whose delight was now very near the explosive point sam was in wonderful spirits professed to keep a very brisk lookout at one time exclaiming that he saw a gal's bonnet on the top of some distant eminence or calling to andy if that there wasn't lizzie down in the hollow always making these exclamations in some rough or craggy part of the road where the sudden quickening of speed was a special inconvenience to all parties concerned and thus keeping Haley in a state of constant commotion after riding about an hour in this way the whole party made a precipitate and tumultuous descent into a barnyard belonging to a large farming establishment not a soul was in sight all the hands being employed in the fields but as the barn stood conspicuously and plainly square across the road it was evident that their journey in that direction had reached a decided finale want dat air what i telled masser said sam with an air of injured innocence how does strange gentlemen spect to know more about a country dan de natives born and raised you rascal said Haley. you knew all about this didn't i tell yer i knowed and yer wouldn't believe me i telled masser twas all shet up and fenced up and i didn't spect we could get through andy heard me it was all too true to be disputed and the unlucky man had to pocket his wrath with the best grace he was able and all three faced to the right about and took up their line of march for the highway in consequence of all the various delays it was about three-quarters of an hour after eliza had laid her child to sleep in the village tavern that the party came riding into the same place eliza was standing by the window looking out in another direction when sam's quick eye caught a glimpse of her Haley and andy were two yards behind at this crisis sam contrived to have his hat blown off and uttered a loud and characteristic ejaculation which startled her at once she drew suddenly back and the whole train swept by the window round to the front door a thousand lives seemed to be concentrated in that one moment to eliza her room opened by a side door to the river she caught her child and sprang down the steps toward it the trader caught a full glimpse of her just as she was disappearing down the bank and throwing himself from his horse and calling loudly on sam and andy he was after her like a hound after a deer in that dizzy moment her feet to her scarce seemed to touch the ground and a moment brought her to the water's edge right on behind they came and nerved with strength such as god gives only to the desperate with one wild cry and flying leap she vaulted sheer over the turbid current by the shore on to the raft of ice beyond it was a desperate leap impossible to anything but madness and despair and Haley, sam and andy instinctively cried out and lifted up their hands as she did it the huge green fragment of ice on which she alighted pitched and creaked as her weight came on it but she stayed there not a moment with wild cries and desperate energy she leaped to another and still another cake stumbling leaping slipping springing upwards again her shoes are gone her stockings cut from her feet while blood marked every step but she saw nothing felt nothing till dimly as in a dream she saw the ohio side and a man helping her up the bank ye're a brave gal now whoever ye are said the man with an oath eliza recognized the voice and face for a man who owned a farm not far from her old home oh mr sims save me do save me do hide me said eliza why what's this said the man why if tain't shelby's gal my child this boy he sold him there is his master said she pointing to the kentucky shore oh mr sims you've got a little boy so i have said the man as he roughly but kindly drew her up the steep bank 
besides you're a right brave gal i like grit wherever i see it when they had gained the top of the bank the man paused i'd be glad to do something for ye said he but then there's nowhere i could take ye the best i can do is tell ye to go thar said he pointing to a large white house which stood by itself off the main street of the village go thar they're kind folks thar's no kind of danger but they'll help you they're up to all that sort of thing the lord bless you said eliza earnestly no occasion no occasion in the world said the man what i've done's of no account and oh surely sir you won't tell any one go to thunder gal what do you take a feller for in course not said the man come now go along like a likely sensible gal as you are you've aren't your liberty and you shall have it for all me the woman folded her child to her bosom and walked firmly and swiftly away the man stood and looked after her shelby now maybe won't think this year the most neighbourly thing in the world but what's a feller to do if he catches one of my gals in the same fix he's welcome to pay back somehow i never could see no kind of critter a striving and pantin' and trying to clare theirselves with the dogs arter em and go agin em besides i don't see no kind of occasion for me to be hunter and catcher for other folks neither so spoke this poor heathenish kentuckian who had not been instructed in his constitutional relations and consequently was betrayed into acting in a sort of christianized manner which if he had been better situated and more enlightened he would not have been left to do haley had stood a perfectly amazed spectator of the scene till eliza had disappeared up the bank when he turned a blank inquiring look on sam and andy that ar was a tolerable fair stroke of business said sam that gal's got seven devils in her i believe said haley how like a wild cat she jumped well no said sam scratching his head i hope master scoos is trying dat ar road don't think i feel spry enough for dat ar no way and sam gave a hoarse chuckle you laugh said the trader with a growl lord bless you master i couldn't help it now said sam giving way to the long pent-up delight of his soul she looks so curious a leapin and springin ice a crackin and only to hear her plunk her chunk her splash spring lord how she goes it and sam and andy laughed till the tears rolled down their cheeks i'll make ye laugh t'other side your mouths said the trader laying about their heads with his riding whip both ducked and ran shouting up the bank and were on their horses before he was up good evening master said sam with much gravity i very much spec missus be anxious bout jerry master haley won't want us no longer missus wouldn't hear of our ridin to critters over lizzie's bridge to-night and with a facetious poke into andy's ribs he started off followed by the latter at full speed their shouts of laughter coming faintly on the wind End of chapter seven chapter eight of uncle tom's cabin by harriet beecher stowe this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lorraine Paquette. Chapter 8 Eliza's Escape. Eliza made her desperate retreat across the river just in the dusk of twilight. The gray mist of evening, rising slowly from the river, enveloped her as she disappeared up the bank, and the swollen current and floundering masses of ice presented a hopeless barrier between her and her pursuer haley therefore slowly and discontentedly returned to the little tavern to ponder further what was to be done the woman opened to him the door of a little piler covered with a rag carpet where stood a table with a very shining black oilcloth sundry lank high-backed wood chairs with some plaster images in resplendent colours on the mantel-shelf above a very dimly smoking grate 
a long hardwood settle extended its uneasy length by the chimney and here haley sat him down to meditate on the instability of human hopes and happiness in general what did i want with the little cuss now he said to himself that i should have got myself treed like a coon as i am this year way and haley relieved himself by repeating over a not very select litany of imprecations on himself which though there was the best possible reason to consider them as true we shall as a matter of taste omit he was startled by the loud and dissonant voice of a man who was apparently dismounting at the door he hurried to the window by the land if this year ain't the nearest now to what i've heard folks call providence said haley i do believe that air's tom loker haley hastened out standing by the bar in the corner of the room was a brawny muscular man full six feet in height and broad in proportion he was dressed in a coat of buffalo skin made with the hair outward which gave him a shaggy and fierce appearance perfectly in keeping with the whole air of his physiognomy in the head and face every organ and linement expressive of brutal and unhesitating violence was in a state of the highest possible development indeed could our readers fancy a bulldog come onto man's estate and walking about in a hat and coat they would have no unapt idea of the general style and effect of his physique he was accompanied by a travelling companion in many respects an exact contrast to himself he was short and slender lithe and cat-like in his motions and had a peering mousing expression about his keen black eyes with which every feature of his face seemed sharpened into sympathy his thin long nose ran out as if it were eager to bore into the nature of things in general his sleek thin black hair was stuck eagerly forward and all his motions and evolutions expressed a dry cautious acuteness the great man poured out a big tumbler half full of raw spirits and gulped it down without a word the little man stood tiptoe and putting his head first to one side and then to the other and snuffing considerately in the directions of the various bottles ordered at last a mint julep in a thin and quivering voice and with an air of great circumspection when poured out he took it and looked at it with a sharp complacent air like a man who thinks he has done about the right thing and hit the nail on the head and proceeded to dispose of it in short and well-advised sips well now who'd a thought this year luck had come to me why loker how are ye said haley coming forward and extending his hand to the big man the devil was the civil reply what brought you here haley the mousing man who bore the name of marks instantly stopped his sipping and poking his head forward looked shrewdly on the new acquaintance as a cat sometimes looks at a moving dry leaf or some other possible object of pursuit i say tom this year's the luckiest thing in the world i'm in a devil of a hobble and you must help me out ugh ah like enough grunted his complacent acquaintance a body may be pretty sure of that when you're glad to see him something to be made off of him what's the blow now you've got a friend here said haley looking doubtfully at marks partner perhaps yes i have here marks here's that our fellow that i was in with in natchez shall be pleased with his acquaintance said marks thrusting out a long thin hand like a raven's claw mr haley i believe the same sir said haley and now gentlemen seeing as we've met so happily i think i'll stand up to a small matter of a treat in this here piler so now old coon said he to the man at the bar get us hot water and sugar and cigars and plenty of the real stuff and we'll have a blow-out behold then the candles lighted the fire stimulated to the burning point in the grate and our three worthies seated round a table well spread with all the accessories to good fellowship enumerated before haley began a pathetic recital of his peculiar troubles loker shut up his mouth and listened to him with gruff and surly attention 
Marks, who was anxiously and with much fidgeting, compounding a tumbler of punch to his own peculiar taste, occasionally looked up from his employment, and poking his sharp nose and chin almost into Haley's face, gave the most earnest heed to the whole narrative. The conclusion of it appeared to amuse him extremely, for he shook his shoulders and sides in silence, and perked up his thin lips with an air of great internal enjoyment. So then, you're fairly sewed up, ain't ye? he said. He, 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 it's neatly done, too. This year young on business makes lots of trouble in the trade, said Haley dolefully. If we could get a breed of gals that didn't care now for their young uns, said Marks, tell ye i think twould be about the greatest modern improvement i knows on and marks patronized his joke by a quiet introductory sniggle just so said haley i never couldn't see into it young uns is heaps of trouble to em one would think now they'd be glad to get clear on him but they aren't and the more trouble a young un is and the more good for nothing as a general thing the tighter they sticks to em well mr haley said marks est past the hot water yes sir you say est what i feel and all of us have now i bought a gal once when i was in the trade a tight likely went she was to and quite considerable smart she had a young un that was miserable sickly it had a crooked back or something or other and i just gin it away to a man that thought he'd take his chance raisin on it being it didn't cost nothing never thought you know of the gals taken on about it but lord you oughter see how she went on why really she did seem to me to valley the child more cos twas sickly and cross and plagued her and she warn't makin believe neither cried about it she did and lopped around as if she'd lost every friend she had it really was droll to thing on it lord there ain't no end to women's notions well just so with me said haley last summer down on red river i got a gal traded off on me with a likely looking child enough and his eyes looked as bright as yourn but come to look i found him stone blind fact he was stone blind well you see i thought there warn't no harm in my just passing him along and not saying nothing and i'd got him nicely swapped off for a keg o' whiskey and comes to get him away from the gal she was just like a tiger so twas just before we started and i hadn't got my gang chained up so what should she do but ups on a cotton bale like a cat catches a knife from one of the deckhands and i tell ye she made all fly for a minute till she saw it want no use and she just turns round and pitches head first young un and all into the river went down plumb and never riz Bah, said tom loker who had listened to these stories with ill-repressed disgust shiftless both on ye my gals don't cut up no such shines i tell ye indeed how do you help it said marks briskly help it why i buys a gal and if she's got a young un to be sold i just walks up and puts my fist to her face and says look here now if you give me one word out of your head i'll smash your face in i won't hear one word not the beginning of a word i says to him this year young un's mine and not yourn and you've no kind of business with it i'm going to sell it first chance mind you don't cut up none of your shines about it or i'll make you wish you'd never been born i tell ye they sees it ain't no play when i gets hold i makes em as wished as fishes and if one on em begins and gives a yelp why and mr loker brought down his fist with a thump that fully explained the hiatus that ours what you may call emphasis said marks poking haley in the side and going into another small giggle ain't tom peculiar he he i say tom i specs you make em understand for all niggers heads is woolly they don't never have no doubt of your meaning tom if you ain't the devil tom use his twin brother i'll say that for ye tom received the compliment with becoming modesty and began to look as affable as was consistent as john bunyan says with his doggish nature haley who had been imbibing very freely of the staple of the evening began to feel a sensible elevation and enlargement of his moral faculties 
a phenomenon not unusual with gentlemen of a serious and reflective turn under similar circumstances. "'Well, now, Tom,' he said, "'ye really is too bad, and I always have told ye. "'Ye know, Tom, you and I used to talk over these year matters down at Natchez, "'and I used to prove to ye that we made full as much "'and was as well off for this year world by treating on em well, "'besides keeping a better chance for coming in the kingdom at last. "'When worst comes to worst, and there ain't nothing else left to get, you know.' "'Bah!' said Tom. Don't I know? Don't make me too sick with all your stuff. My stomach is a little riled now. And Tom drank half a glass of raw brandy. I say, said Haley, and leaning back in his chair and gesturing impressively, I'll say this now. I always meant to drive my trade so as to make money on it first and foremost, as much as any man. But then trade ain't everything, and money ain't everything. "'cause we's all got souls. "'I don't care now who hears me say it, "'and I think a cussed sight on it, "'so I may as well come out with it. "'I believe in religion, "'and one of these days, "'when I've got matters tight and snug, "'I calculates to tend to my soul "'and them air matters, "'so what's the use of doing any more wickedness "'than's really necessary? "'It doesn't seem to me it's tall prudent. "'Tend to your soul,' "'repeated Tom contemptuously, Take a bright lookout to find a soul in you. Save yourself any care on that score. If the devil sifts you through a hair sieve, he won't find one. Why, Tom, you're cross, said Haley. Why can't you take it pleasant now, when a feller's talking for your good? Stop that air jaw o yourn there, said Tom gruffly. I can stand most any talk of yourn, but your pious talk. That kills me right up. After all, what's the odds between me and you? Tain't that you care one bit more, or have a bit more feeling. It's clean, sheer, dog meanness, wanting to cheat the devil and save your own skin. Don't I see through it? And your getting a religion, as you call it, arter all, is too pissin' mean for any critter. Run up a bill with the devil all your life, and then sneak out when pay-time comes, Bob. "'Come, come, gentlemen, I say, this isn't business,' said Marks. "'There's different ways, you know, of looking at all subjects. "'Mr. Haley is a very nice man, no doubt, and has his own conscience. "'And, Tom, you have your ways, and very good ones, too, Tom. "'But quarrelling, you know, won't answer no kind of purpose. "'Let's go to business. "'Now, Mr. Haley, what is it? "'You want us to undertake to catch this year, gal?' The gal's no matter of mine, she's Shelby's, it's only the boy. I was a fool for buying the monkey. You're generally a fool, said Tom gruffly. Come now, Loker, none of your huffs, said Marks, licking his lips. You see, Mr. Haley's a puttin' us in a way of a good job, I reckon. Just hold still. These year arrangements is my forte. This year, gal, Mr. Haley, how is she? What is she? Well, white and handsome, well brought up. I'd again shall be eight hundred or a thousand, and then made well on her. White and handsome, well brought up, said Marks, his sharp eyes, nose, and mouth all alive with enterprise. Look here now, Loker, a beautiful opening. We'll do a business here on our own account. We does the catchin. The boy, of course, goes to Mr. Haley. We takes the gal to Orleans to speculate on, and it beautiful. Tom, whose great heavy mouth had stood ajar during this communication, now suddenly snapped it together as a big dog closes on a piece of meat, and seemed to be digesting the idea at his leisure. Ye see, said Marks to Haley, stirring his punch as he did so, ye see, we has justices convenient at all pints along shore that does up any little jobs in our line quite reasonable. Tom, he does the knockin' down in that are, and I come in all dressed up, shining boots, everything, first chop, when the swearin's to be done. You ought to see now, said Marks, in a glow of professional pride, how I can tone it off. One day I'm Mr. Twickham from New Orleans. Another day I'm just come from my plantation on Pearl River, where I works seven hundred niggers. 
Then again I come out a distant relation of Henry Clay or some old cock in Kentuck. Talents is different, you know. Now Tom's roarer when there's any thumping or fighting to be done. But at lying he ain't good, Tom ain't. You see, it don't come natural to him, but, Lord, if thar's a fellow in the country that can swear to anything and everything, and put in all the circumstances and flourishes with a long face, and carry it through better than I can, why, I'd like to see him, that's all. I believe my heart I could get along and snake through, even if justices were more particular than they is. Sometimes I rather wish they was more particular. "'Twould be a heap more relishin' if they was. More fun, you know. Tom Loker, who, as we have made it appear, was a man of slow thoughts and movements, here interrupted Marx by bringing his heavy fist down on the table, so as to make all ring again. "'It'll do,' he said. "'Lord bless ye, Tom. Ye needn't break all the glasses,' said Marx. "'Save your fist for time of need.' "'But, gentlemen,' "'Ain't I to come in for a share of the profits?' said Haley. "'Ain't it enough we catch the boy for ye?' said Loker. "'What do you want?' "'Well,' said Haley, "'if I gives you the job, it's worth something. "'Say ten per cent on the profits, expenses paid.' "'Now,' said Loker, with a tremendous oath, "'and striking the table with his heavy fist, "'don't I know you, Dan Haley?' Don't you think to come it over me? Suppose Marx and I have taken up the catch and trade just to accommodate gentlemen like you and get nothing for ourselves? Not by a long chalk. We'll have the gal out and out, and you keep quiet. Or, you see, we'll have both. What's to hinder? Ha'n't you showed us the game? It's as free to us as you, I hope. If you or Shelby wants to chase us, Look where the partridges was last year. If you find them or us, you're quite welcome. Oh, well, certainly, just let it go at that, said Haley, alarmed. You catch the boy for the job. You allers did trade far with me, Tom, and was up to your word. Ye know that, said Tom. I don't pretend none of your snivelling ways. But I won't lie in my counts with the devil himself. What I says I'll do, I will do. You know that, Dan Haley. Just so, just so, I said so, Tom, said Haley. And if you'd only promise to have the boy for me in a week, at any point you'll name, that's all I want. But it ain't all I want by a long jump, said Tom. You don't think I did business with you down in Natchez for nothing, Haley. I've learned to hold an eel when I catch him. You've got to fork over fifty dollars flat down, or this child don't start a peg. I know you're. Why, when you have a job in hand that may bring a clean profit off somewhere about a thousand or sixteen hundred, why, Tom, you're unreasonable, said Haley. Yes, and hasn't we business booked for five weeks to come, all we can do? And suppose we leaves all and goes to bushwhacking round arter your young uns and finally doesn't catch the gal, and gals allers is the devil to catch. What's then? Would you pay us a cent, would you? I think I see you a-doin' it, ugh. No, no, flap down your fifty. If we get the job and it pays, I'll hand it back. If we don't, it's for our trouble. That's far, ain't it, Marks? "'Certainly, certainly,' said Marx, with a conciliatory tone. "'It's only a retaining fee, you see. "'He, he, he, we lawyers, you know. "'Well, we must all keep good-natured, keep easy, you know. "'Tom'll have the boy for you. "'Anywhere you'll name, won't she, Tom? "'If I find the young un, I'll bring him on to Cincinnati "'and leave him at Granny Belcher's, on the landing,' said Loker. Marx had got from his pocket a greasy pocket-book, and taking a long paper from thence, he sat down, and fixing his keen black eyes on it, began mumbling over its contents. Barnes, Shelby County, boy, Jim, three hundred dollars for him, dead or alive. Edwards, Dick and Lucy, man and wife, six hundred dollars. 
wench polly and two children six hundred for her or her head i'm just a-runnin over our business see if we can take up this year handily loker he said after a pause we must set adams and springer on the track of these year they've been booked some time they'll charge too much said tom i'll manage that are they's young in the business and must spec to work cheap said marx as he continued to read there's three on em easy cases cause all you've got to do is to shoot em or swear they is shot they couldn't of course charge much for that them other cases he said folding the paper will bear puttin off a spell so now let's come to the particulars now mr haley you saw this year gal when she landed to be sure plain as i see you and a man helpin on her up the bank said loker to be sure i did most likely said marx she's took in somewhere but where's a question tom what do you say we must cross the river to-night no mistake said tom but there's no boat about said marx the ice is running awfully tom ain't it dangerous don't know nothing about that only it's got to be done said tom decidedly dear me said marx fidgeting it'll be i say he said walking to the window it's dark as a wolf's mouth and tom the long and short is you're scared marx but i can't help that you've got to go suppose you want to lie by a day or two till the gal's been carried on the underground line up to sandusky or so before you start oh no i ain't a grain afraid said marx only only what said tom well about the boat you see there ain't any boat i heard the woman say there was one coming along this evening and that a man was going to cross over in it neck or nothing we must go with him said tom i suppose you've got good dogs said haley first rate said marx but what's the use you ha'n't got nothin of hers to smell on yes i have said haley triumphantly here's her shawl she left on the bed in her hurry she left her bonnet too that ar's lucky said loker fork over though the dogs might damage the gal if they come on her unawares said haley that ar's a consideration said marx our dogs tore a feller half to pieces once down in mobile fore we could get em off well ye see for this sort that's to be sold for their looks that ar won't answer ye see said haley i do see said marx besides if she's got took in tain't no go neither dogs is no count in these yer up states where these critters get carried of course you can't get on their track they only does down in plantations where niggers when they runs has to do their own running and don't get no help well said loker who had just stepped out to the bar to make some inquiries they say the man's come with the boat so marx that worthy cast a rueful look at the comfortable quarters he was leaving but slowly rose to obey after exchanging a few words of further arrangement haley with visible reluctance handed over the fifty dollars to tom and the worthy trio separated for the night if any of our refined and christian readers object to the society into which this scene introduces them let us beg them to begin and conquer their prejudices in time the catching business we beg to remind them is rising to the dignity of a lawful and patriotic profession if all the broad land between the mississippi and the pacific becomes one great market for bodies and souls and human property retains the locomotive tendencies of this nineteenth century the trader and catcher may yet be among our aristocracy while this scene was going on at the tavern sam and andy in a state of high felicitation pursued their way home sam was in the highest possible feather and expressed his exultation by all sorts of supernatural howls and ejaculations by divers odd motions and contortions of his whole system sometimes he would sit backward with his face to the horse's tail and sides and then with a hoop and a somerset come right side up in his place again 
and drawing on a grey face begin to lecture andy in high-sounding tones for laughing and playing the fool anon slapping his sides with his arms he would burst forth in peals of laughter that made the old woods ring as they passed with all these evolutions he contrived to keep the horses up to the top of their speed until between ten and eleven their heels resounded on the gravel at the end of the balcony mrs shelby flew to the railings is that you sam where are they massa haley's arrestin at the tavern he's dreadful fatigued missus and eliza sam well she's clar cross jordan as a body may say in the land o canaan why sam what do you mean said mrs shelby breathless and almost faint as the possible meaning of these words came over her well missus de lord he presarves his own lizzie's done gone over the river into hio as markably as if de lord took her over in a chair to fire and two hosses sam's vein of piety was always uncommonly fervent in his mistress's presence and he made great capital of scriptural figures and images come up here sam said mr shelby who had followed on the veranda and tell your mistress what she wants come come emily said he passing his arm round her you are cold and all in a shiver you allow yourself to feel too much feel too much am not i a woman a mother are not we both responsible to god for this poor girl my god lay not this sin to our charge what sin emily you see yourself we have only done what we were obliged to there's an awful feeling of guilt about it though said mrs shelby i can't reason it away here andy you nigger be alive called sam under the veranda take these yer hosses to de barn don't ye hear master a callin and sam soon appeared palm leaf in hand at the piler door now sam tell us distinctly how the matter was said mr shelby where is eliza if you know well master i saw her with my own eyes a crossin on the floatin ice she crossed most markably it wasn't no less nor a miracle and i saw a man help her up the high side and then she was lost in the dusk sam i think this rather apocryphal this miracle crossing on floating ice isn't so easily done said mr shelby easy couldn't nobody a done it without de lord why now said sam twas just dis year way massa haley and me and andy we comes up to de little tavern by the river and i rides a little ahead i so zealous to be a cotchin lizzie that i couldn't hold in no way and when i comes by the tavern winder sure enough there she was right in plain sight and day diggin on behind well i loses off my hat and sings out nuff to raise the dead course lizzie she hars and she dodges back when massa haley he goes past the door and then i tell you she cleared out de side door she went down de river bank massa haley he seed her and yelled out and him and me and andy we took arter down she comes to the river and thar was the current runnin ten feet wide by the shore and over to other side ice a sawin and a jigglin up and down kinda as to her a great island we come right behind her and i thought my soul he'd got her sure enough when she gin sich a screech as i never hearn and thar she was clare over to other side of the current on the ice and then on she went a screechin and a jumpin and the ice went crack wallop cracking chunk and she aboundin like a buck lord the spring that our gal's got in her aunt common i'm opinion mrs shelby sat perfectly silent pale with excitement while sam told his story god be praised she isn't dead she said but where is the poor child now de lord will provide said sam rolling up his eyes piously as i've been a sayin this year's a providence and no mistake as missus has allers been an instructin on us thar's allers instruments riz up to do de lord's will now if it hadn't been for me to-day 
she'd a been took a dozen times warn't it i started off de hosses dis year mornin and kept em chasin till nigh dinner time and didn't i care massa haley night five miles out of de road dis evening or else he'd a come with lizzie as easy as a dog arter a coon these years all providences they are a kind of providences that you'll have to be pretty sparing of master sam i allow no such practices with gentlemen on my place said mr shelby with as much sternness as he could command under the circumstances now there is no more use in making believe be angry with a negro than with a child both instinctively see the true state of the case though all attempts to effect the contrary and sam was in no wise disheartened by this rebuke though he assumed an air of doleful gravity and stood with the corners of his mouth lowered in most penitential style master quite right quite it was ugly on me there's no disputin that are and of course master and missus wouldn't encourage no such works i'm sensible of dat are but a poor nigger like me's may's and tempted to act ugly sometimes when fellers will cut up such shines as dat ar Master Haley. He ain't no gentleman, no way. Anybody's been raised as I've been can't help a seein' dat ar. Well, Sam said Mrs. Shelby, as you appear to have a proper sense of your errors, you may go now and tell Aunt Chloe she may get you some of that cold ham that was left of dinner to-day you and andy must be hungry missus is a heap too good for us said sam making his bow with alacrity and departing it will be perceived as has been intimated that master sam had a native talent that might undoubtedly have raised him to eminence in political life a talent of making capital out of everything that turned up to be invested for his own especial praise and glory and having done up his piety and humility as he trusted to the satisfaction of the piler he clapped his palm-leaf on his head with a sort of rakish free and easy air and proceeded to the dominions of aunt chloe with the intention of flourishing largely in the kitchen i'll speechify these yer niggers said sam to himself now i've got a chance lord i'll reel it off to make em stare it must be observed that one of sam's especial delights had been to ride in attendance on his master to all kinds of political gatherings where roosted on some rail fence or perched aloft in some tree he would sit watching the orators with the greatest apparent gusto and then descending among the various brethren of his own colour assembled on the same errand he would edify and delight them with the most ludicrous burlesques and imitations all delivered with the most imperturbable earnestness and solemnity and though the auditors immediately about him were generally of his own colour it not infrequently happened that they were fringed pretty deeply with those of a fairer complexion who listened laughing and winking to sam's great self-congratulation in fact sam considered oratory as his vocation and never let slip an opportunity of magnifying his office now between sam and aunt chloe there had existed from ancient times a sort of chronic feud or rather a decided coolness but as sam was meditating something in the provision department as the necessary and obvious foundation of his operations he determined on the present occasion to be eminently conciliatory for he well knew that although mrs orders would undoubtedly be followed to the letter yet he should gain a considerable deal by enlisting the spirit also he therefore appeared before aunt chloe with a touchingly subdued resigned expression like one who has suffered immeasurable hardships in behalf of a persecuted fellow-creature enlarged upon the fact that missus had directed him to come to aunt chloe for whatever might be wanting to make up the balance in his solids and fluids and thus unequivocally acknowledged her right and supremacy in the cooking department and all thereto pertaining the thing took accordingly 
no poor simple virtuous body was ever cajoled by the attentions of an electioneering politician with more ease than aunt chloe was won over by master sam's suavities and if he had been the prodigal son himself he could not have been overwhelmed with more maternal bountifulness and he soon found himself seated happy and glorious over a large tin pan containing a sort of olla podrida of all that had appeared on the table for two or three days past savoury morsels of ham golden blocks of corn cake fragments of pie of every conceivable mathematical figure chicken wings gizzards and drumsticks all appeared in picturesque confusion and sam as monarch of all he surveyed sat with his palm-leaf cocked rejoicingly to one side and patronizing andy at his right hand the kitchen was full of all his compeers who had hurried and crowded in from the various cabins to hear the termination of the day's exploits now was sam's hour of glory the story of the day was rehearsed with all kinds of ornament and varnishing which might be necessary to heighten its effect for sam like some of our fashionable dilettanti never allowed a story to lose any of its gilding by passing through his hands roars of laughter attended the narration and were taken up and prolonged by all the smaller fry who were lying in any quantity about on the floor or perched in every corner in the height of the uproar and laughter sam however preserved an immovable gravity only from time to time rolling his eyes up and giving his auditors divers inexpressibly droll glances without departing from the sententious elevation of his oratory your see fellow-countrymen said sam elevating a turkey's leg with energy your see now what dish yer child's up ter for fendin yer all yes all on yer for him as tries to get one of our people is as good as tryin to get all yer see the principles de same dat ars clar and any one of these yer drivers that comes smellin round arter any our people why he's got me in his way i'm the feller he's got to set with i'm the feller for yer all to come to brethren i'll stand up for yer rights i'll fend em to the last breath why but sam yer telled me only this morning that you'd help dis yer master to cotch lizzie seems to me yer talk don't hang together said andy i tell you now andy said sam with awful superiority don't yer be talkin bout what you don't know nothin on boys like you andy means well but they can't be spected to collucidate the great principles of action andy looked rebuked particularly by the hard word collucidate which most of the youngerly members of the company seemed to consider as a settler in the case while sam proceeded dat ar was conscience andy when i thought of givin arter lizzie i rarely spected master was sought dat way when i found missus was sought the contrar dat ar was conscience more yet cause fellers allus get more by stickin to missus's side so yer see i's persistent either way and sticks up to conscience and holds on to principles yes principles said sam giving an enthusiastic toss to a chicken's neck what's principles good for if we isn't persistent i want to know thar andy you may have dat ar bone tan't pick quite clean sam's audience hanging on his words with open mouth he could not but proceed dis yer matter bout persistence feller niggers said sam with the air of one entering into an abstruse subject dis yer sistencies a thing what ant seed into very clar by most anybody now yer see when a feller stands up for a thing one day and night de contrar de next folks says and natly enough dey says why he ain't persistent hand me dat ar bit o corn cake andy but let's look inter it i hope the gentleman and er fair sex will scuse my usin an ornery sort of person here i'm a tryin to get top of der hay well i puts up my larder dish yer side tan't no go den cause i don't try dare no more but puts my larder right de contrar side ain't i persistent 
I'm persistent in wantin' to get up which any side my larder is, don't you see, all on your? It's the only thing you ever was persistent in, Lord knows, muttered Aunt Chloe, who was getting rather restive, the merriment of the evening being to her somewhat after the scripture comparison, like vinegar upon nitre. Yes, indeed, said Sam, rising, full of supper and glory, for a closing effect. Yes, my feller citizens and ladies of the other sex in general, I has principles. I'm proud to own em. They's prerequisite to des a year times and tear all times. I has principles and I sticks to em like forty. Just anything that I thinks is principle, I goes into it. I wouldn't mind if they burnt me live. I'd walk right up to de stake, I would, and say, Here I comes to shed my last blood for my principles, for my country, for de general interests of society. Well, said Aunt Chloe, one of your principles will have to be to get to bed some time tonight and not be a keepin' everybody up till morning. Now, every one of you young uns that don't want to be cracked had better be scarce, mighty sudden. Niggers all on yer, said Sam, waving his palm leaf with benignity. I give you my blessing. Go to bed now and be good boys. And with this pathetic benediction, the assembly dispersed. End of chapter 8《Chapter Nine of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lorraine Paquette. Chapter Nine, in which it appears that a senator is but a man. The light of the cheerful fire shone on the rug and carpet of a cosy piler and glittered on the sides of the teacups and well brightened teapot as Senator Bird was drawing off his boots preparatory to inserting his feet in a pair of new handsome slippers which his wife had been working for him while away on his senatorial tour mrs bird looking the very picture of delight was superintending the arrangements of the table ever and anon mingling admonitory remarks to a number of frolicsome juveniles who were effervescing in all those modes of untold gambol and mischief that have astonished mothers ever since the flood Tom, let the doorknob alone. There's a man. Mary, Mary, don't pull the cat's tail, poor pussy. Jim, you mustn't climb on that table. No, no. You don't know, my dear, what a surprise it is for us all to see you here tonight, said she at last when she found a space to say something to her husband. Yes, yes, I thought I'd just make a run down, spend the night, and have a little comfort at home. I'm tired to death and my head aches. Mrs. Bird cast a glance at a camphor bottle which stood in the half open closet and appeared to meditate an approach to it, but her husband interposed it. No, no, Mary, no doctoring. A cup of your good hot tea and some of our good home living is what I want. It's a tiresome business, this legislating. And the senator smiled as if he rather liked the idea of considering himself a sacrifice to his country well said his wife after the business of the tea-table was getting rather slack and what have they been doing in the senate now it was a very unusual thing for gentle little mrs bird ever to trouble her head with what was going on in the house of the state very wisely considering that she had enough to do to mind her own Mr. Bird, therefore, opened his eyes in surprise and said, Not very much of importance. Well, but is it true that they have been passing a law forbidding people to give meat and drink to those poor colored folks that come along? I heard they were talking of some such law, but I didn't think any Christian legislator would pass it. Why, Mary, you are getting to be a politician all at once. No nonsense, I wouldn't give a flip for all your politics generally, but I think this is something downright cruel and unchristian. I hope, my dear, no such law has been passed. 
there has been a law passed forbidding people to help off the slaves that come over from kentucky my dear so much of that thing has been done by these reckless abolitionists that our brethren in kentucky are very strongly excited and it seems necessary and no more than christian and kind that something should be done by our state to quiet the excitement and what is the law it don't forbid us to shelter those poor creatures a night does it and to give em something comfortable to eat and a few old clothes and to send them quietly about their business why yes my dear that would be aiding and abetting you know mrs bird was a timid blushing little woman of about four feet in height and with mild blue eyes and a peach blow complexion and the gentlest sweetest voice in the world as for courage a moderate-sized cock turkey had been known to put her to rout at the very first gobble and a stout house-dog of moderate capacity would bring her into subjection merely by a show of his teeth her husband and children were her entire world and in these she ruled more by entreaty and persuasion than by command or argument there was only one thing that was capable of arousing her and that provocation came in on the side of her unusually gentle and sympathetic nature anything in the shape of cruelty would throw her into a passion which was the more alarming and inexplicable in proportion to the general softness of her nature generally the most indulgent and easy to be entreated of all mothers still her boys had a very reverent remembrance of a most vehement chastisement she once bestowed on them because she found them leagued with several graceless boys of the neighbourhood stoning a defenceless kitten i'll tell you what master bill used to say i was scared that time mother came at me so that i thought she was crazy and i was whipped and tumbled off to bed without any supper before i could get over wondering what had come about and after that i heard mother crying outside the door which made me feel worse than all the rest i'll tell you what he'd say we boys never stoned another kitten on the present occasion mrs bird rose quickly with very red cheeks which quite improved her general appearance and walked up to her husband with quite a resolute air and said in a determined tone now john i want to know if you think such a law as that is right and christian you won't shoot me now mary if i say i do i never could have thought it of you john you didn't vote for it even so my fair politician you ought to be ashamed john poor homeless houseless creatures it's a shameful wicked abominable law and i'll break it for one the first time i get a chance and i hope i shall have a chance i do things have got to a pretty pass if a woman can't give a warm supper and a bed to poor starving creatures just because they are slaves and have been abused and oppressed all their lives poor things but mary just listen to me your feelings are all quite right dear and interesting and i love you for them but then dear we mustn't suffer our feelings to run away with our judgment you must consider it's a matter of private feeling there are great public interests involved there is such a state of public agitation rising that we must put aside our private feelings now john i don't know anything about politics but i can read my bible and there i see that i must feed the hungry clothe the naked and comfort the desolate and that bible i mean to follow but in cases where your doing so would involve a great public evil obeying god never brings on public evils i know it can't it's always safest all round to do as he bids us now listen to me mary and i can state to you a very clear argument to show oh nonsense john you can talk all night but you wouldn't do it i put it to you john would you now turn away a poor shivering hungry creature from your door because he was a runaway would you now 
now if the truth must be told our senator had the misfortune to be a man who had a particularly humane and accessible nature and turning away anybody that was in trouble never had been his forte and what was worse for him in this particular pinch of the argument was that his wife knew it and of course was making an assault on rather an indefensible point so he had recourse in the usual means of gaining time for such cases made and provided he said a hem and coughed several times took out his pocket handkerchief and began to wipe his glasses mrs bird seeing the defenceless condition of the enemy's territory had no more conscience than to push her advantage i should like to see you doing that john i really should turning a woman out of doors in a snowstorm for instance or maybe you'd take her up and put her in jail wouldn't you you would make a great hand at that of course it would be a very painful duty began mr bird in a moderate tone duty john don't use that word you know it isn't a duty it can't be a duty if folks want to keep their slaves from running away let em treat em well that's my doctrine if i had slaves as i hope i never shall have i'd risk their wanting to run away from me or you either john i tell you folks don't run away when they are happy and when they do run poor creatures they suffer enough with cold and hunger and fear without everybody's turning against them and law or no law i never will so help me god mary mary my dear let me reason with you i hate reasoning john especially reasoning on such subjects there's a way you political folks have of coming round and round a plain right thing and you don't believe in it yourselves when it comes to practice i know you well enough john you don't believe it's right any more than i do and you wouldn't do it any sooner than i at this critical juncture old cudjo the black man of all work put his head in at the door and wished missus would come into the kitchen and our senator tolerably relieved looked after his little wife with a whimsical mixture of amusement and vexation and seating himself on the armchair began to read the papers after a moment his wife's voice was heard at the door in a quick earnest tone john john i do wish you'd come here a moment he laid down his paper and went into the kitchen and started quite amazed at the sight that presented itself a young and slender woman with garments torn and frozen with one shoe gone and the stocking torn away from the cut and bleeding foot was laid back in a deadly swoon upon two chairs there was the impress of the despised race on her face yet none could help feeling its mournful and pathetic beauty while its stony sharpness its cold fixed deathly aspect struck a solemn chill over him he drew his breath short and stood in silence his wife and their only colored domestic old aunt dinah were busily engaged in restorative measures while old cudjo had got the boy on his knee and was busy pulling off his shoes and stockings and chafing his little cold feet sure now if she ain't a sight to behold said old dinah compassionately pears like twas the heat that made her faint she was tolerable pert when she come in and asked if she couldn't warm herself here a spell and i was just a askin her where she come from and she fainted right down never done much hard work guess by the looks of her hands poor creature said mrs bird compassionately as the woman slowly unclosed her large brown eyes and looked vacantly at her suddenly an expression of agony crossed her face and she sprang up saying oh my harry have you got him the boy at this jumped from cudjo's knee and running to her side put up his arms oh he's here he's here she exclaimed oh ma'am said she wildly to mrs bird do protect us don't let them get him nobody shall hurt you here poor woman said mrs bird encouragingly you are safe don't be afraid god bless you said the woman covering her face and sobbing 
while the little boy, seeing her crying, tried to get into her lap. With many gentle and womanly offices, which none knew better how to render than Mrs. Bird, the poor woman was, in time, rendered more calm. A temporary bed was provided for her on the settle near the fire, and after a short time she fell into a heavy slumber with the child who seemed no less weary, soundly sleeping on her arm, for the mother resisted with nervous anxiety the kindest attempts to take him from her, and even in sleep her arm encircled him with an unrelaxing clasp as if she could not even then be beguiled of her vigilant hold. Mr. and Mrs. Bird had gone back to the piler, where, strange as it may appear, no reference was made on either side to the preceding conversation. But Mrs. Bird busied herself with her knitting work, and Mr. Bird pretended to be reading the paper. I wonder who and what she is, said Mr. Bird at last as he laid it down. When she wakes up and feels a little rested, we will see, said Mrs. Bird. I say, wife, said Mr. Bird, after musing in silence over his newspaper. Well, dear, she couldn't wear one of your gowns, could she, by any letting down or such matter? She seems to be rather larger than you. A quite perceptible smile glimmered on Mrs. Bird's face as she answered, We'll see. Another pause, and Mr. Bird again broke out. I say, wife, well, what now? Why, there's that old bombazin cloak that you keep on purpose to put over me when I take my afternoon's nap. You might as well give her that. She needs clothes. At this instant, Dinah looked in to say that the woman was awake and wanted to see Mrs. Mr. and Mrs. Bird went into the kitchen, followed by the two eldest boys, the smaller fry having by this time been safely disposed of in bed. The woman was now sitting up on the settle by the fire. She was looking steadily into the blaze with a calm, heartbroken expression, very different from her former agitated wildness. "'Did you want me?' said Mrs. Bird, in gentle tones. "'I hope you feel better now, poor woman.' A long-drawn, shivering sigh was the only answer, but she lifted her dark eyes and fixed them on her with such a forlorn and imploring expression that the tears came into the little woman's eyes. You needn't be afraid of anything. We are friends here, poor woman. Tell me where you came from and what you want, said she. I came from Kentucky, said the woman. When, said Mr. Bird, taking up the interrogatory. Tonight. How did you come? I crossed on the ice. Crossed on the ice, said everyone present. Yes, said the woman slowly, I did. God helping me, I crossed on the ice, for they were behind me, right behind, and there was no other way. Law, missus, said Cudjo, the ice is all in broken up blocks, a swinging and a teetering, up and down in the water. I know it was, I know it said she wildly, but I did it. I wouldn't have thought I could. I didn't think I should get over, but I didn't care. I could but die if I didn't. The Lord helped me. Nobody knows how much the Lord can help em till they try, said the woman, with a flashing eye. Were you a slave? said Mr. Bird. Yes, sir. I belonged to a man in Kentucky. Was he unkind to you? No, sir. He was a good master. And was your mistress unkind to you? No, sir, no, my mistress was always good to me. What could induce you to leave a good home then and run away and go through such dangers? The woman looked up at Mrs. Bird with a keen, scrutinizing glance, and it did not escape her that she was dressed in deep mourning. Ma'am, she said suddenly, have you ever lost a child? The question was unexpected, and it was thrust on a new wound, for it was only a month since a darling child of the family had been laid in the grave. Mr. Bird turned around and walked to the window, 
and Mrs. Bird burst into tears, but recovering her voice, she said, Why do you ask that? I have lost a little one. Then you will feel for me. I have lost two, one after another, left and buried there when I came away, and I had only this one left. I never slept a night without him. He was all I had. He was my comfort and pride, day and night, and ma'am, they were going to take him away from me, to sell him, sell him down south, ma'am, to go all alone, a baby that had never been away from his mother in his life. I couldn't stand it, ma'am. I knew I never should be good for anything if they did, and when I knew the papers were signed and he was sold, I took him and came off in the night, and they chased me, the man that bought him and some of Masser's folks, and they were coming down quite behind me, and I heard him. I jumped right on the ice, and how I got across I don't know, but first I knew a man was helping me up the bank. The woman did not sob nor weep. She had gone to a place where tears are dry, and every one around her was, in some way, characteristic of themselves, showing signs of hearty sympathy. The two little boys, after a desperate rummaging in their pockets in search of those pocket handkerchiefs, which mothers know are never to be found there, had thrown themselves disconsolately into the skirts of their mother's gown, where they were sobbing and wiping their eyes and noses to their heart's content. Mrs. Bird had her face fairly hidden in her pocket handkerchief, and old Dinah, with tears streaming down her black, honest face, was ejaculating, Lord have mercy on us, with all the fervor of a camp meeting, while old Cudjo, rubbing his eyes very hard with his cuffs and making a most uncommon variety of wry faces, occasionally responded in the same key with great fervor. Our senator was a statesman, and of course could not be expected to cry like other mortals, and so he turned his back to the company and looked out of the window and seemed particularly busy in clearing his throat and wiping his spectacle glasses, occasionally blowing his nose in a manner that was calculated to excite suspicion, had any one been in a state to observe critically. How came you to tell me you had a kind master? he suddenly exclaimed, gulping down very resolutely some kind of rising in his throat and turning suddenly round upon the woman. Because he was a kind master. I'll say that of him, anyway, and my mistress was kind, but they couldn't help themselves. They were owing money, and there was some way, I can't tell, that a man had a hold on them, and they were obliged to give him his will. I listened and heard him telling mistress that, and she begging and pleading for me, and he told her he couldn't help himself, and that the papers were all drawn, and then it was I took him and left my home and came away. I knew twas no use of my trying to live if they did it, for to peers like this child is all I have. Have you no husband? Yes, but he belongs to another man. His master is real hard to him and won't let him come to see me hardly ever, and he's grown harder and harder upon us, and he threatens to sell him down south. It's like I'll never see him again. The quiet tone in which the woman pronounced these words might have led a superficial observer to think that she was entirely apathetic, but there was a calm, settled depth of anguish in her large, dark eye that spoke of something far otherwise. And where do you mean to go, my poor woman? said Mrs. Bird. To Canada, if I only knew where that was. Is it very far off, is Canada? said she, looking up with a simple confiding air to Mrs. Bird's face. Poor thing, said Mrs. Bird involuntarily. Is it a very great way off, think? said the woman earnestly. Much further than you think, poor child, said Mrs. Bird, but we will try to think what can be done for you. Here, Dinah, make her up a bed in your own room close by the kitchen and I'll think what to do for her in the morning. Meanwhile, never fear, poor woman. Put your trust in God. He will protect you. 
Mrs. Bird and her husband re-entered the parlour. She sat down in her little rocking chair before the fire, swaying thoughtfully to and fro. Mr. Bird strode up and down the room, grumbling to himself, Pish, pshaw, confounded, awkward business. At length, striding up to his wife, he said, I say, wife, she'll have to get away from here this very night. That fellow will be down on the scent bright and early to-morrow morning. If twas only the woman, she could lie quiet till it was over. But that little chap can't be kept still by a troop of horse and foot. I'll warrant me. He'll bring it all out, popping his head out some window or door. A pretty kettle of fish it would be for me, too, to be caught with them both here just now. No, they'll have to be off to-night. To-night? How is it possible? Where to? Well, I know pretty well where to, said the senator, beginning to put on his boots with a reflective air. And stopping when his leg was half in, he embraced his knee with both hands and seemed to go off in deep meditation. It's a confounded, awkward, ugly business, said he at last, beginning to tug at his boot straps again. And that's a fact. After one boot was fairly on, the senator sat with the other in his hand, profoundly studying the figure of the carpet. It will have to be done, though, for aught I see, hang it all. And he drew the other boot anxiously on and looked out of the window. Now little Mrs. Bird was a discreet woman a woman who never in her life said, I told you so, and on the present occasion, though pretty well aware of the shape her husband's meditations were taking, she very prudently forbore to meddle with them, only sat very quietly in her chair, and looked quite ready to hear her liege lord's intentions, when he should think proper to utter them. You see, he said, there's my old client Van Tromp, has come over from kentucky and set all his slaves free and he has bought a place seven miles up the creek here back in the woods where nobody goes unless they go on purpose and it's a place that isn't found in a hurry there she'd be safe enough but the plague of the thing is nobody could drive a carriage there to-night but me why not cacho is an excellent driver ay ay but here it is the creek has to be crossed twice, and the second crossing is quite dangerous, unless one knows it as I do. I have crossed it a hundred times on horseback and know exactly the turns to take. And so, you see, there's no help for it. Kadjo must put in the horses as quietly as may be about twelve o'clock, and I'll take her over, and then, to give colour to the matter, he must carry me on to the next tavern to take the stage for Columbus that comes by about three or four, and so it will look as if I had had the carriage only for that. I shall get into business bright and early in the morning, but I'm thinking I shall feel rather cheap there, after all that's been said and done, but hang it, I can't help it. Your heart is better than your head in this case, John, said the wife, laying her little white hand on his. Could I ever have loved you had I not known you better than you know yourself? And the little woman looked so handsome, with the tears sparkling in her eyes, that the senator thought he must be a decidedly clever fellow to get such a pretty creature into such a passionate admiration of himself. And so what could he do but walk off soberly to see about the carriage? At the door, however, he stopped a moment, and then, coming back, he said, with some hesitation, Mary, I don't know how you'd feel about it, but there's that drawer full of things of, of, poor little Henry's. So saying, he turned quickly on his heel and shut the door after him. His wife opened the little bedroom door adjoining her room, and taking the candle, set it down on the top of a bureau there. Then from a small recess, she took a key and put it thoughtfully in the lock of a drawer, and made a sudden pause while two boys, who, boy-like, had followed close on her heels, stood looking with silent, significant glances at their mother. And, oh, mother that reads this, has there never been in your house a drawer or a closet, the opening of which has been to you like the opening again of a little grave? Ah, happy mother that you are, if it has not been so. Mrs. Bird slowly opened the drawer, 
there were little coats of many a form and pattern piles of aprons and rows of small stockings and even a pair of little shoes worn and rubbed at the toes were peeping from the folds of a paper there was a toy horse and wagon a top a ball memorials gathered with many a tear and many a heartbreak she sat down by the drawer and leaning her head on her hands over it wept till the tears fell through her fingers into the drawer then suddenly raising her head she began with nervous haste selecting the plainest and most substantial articles and gathering them into a bundle mamma said one of the boys gently touching her arm you going to give away those things my dear boys she said softly and earnestly if our dear loving little henry looks down from heaven he would be glad to have us do this i could not find it in my heart to give them away to any common person to anybody that was happy but i give them to a mother more heartbroken and sorrowful than i am and i hope god will send his blessings with them there are in this world blessed souls whose sorrows all spring up into joys for others whose earthly hopes laid in the grave with many tears are the seed from which spring healing flowers and balm for the desolate and the distressed among such was the delicate woman who sits there by the lamp dropping slow tears while she prepares the memorials of her own lost one for the outcast wanderer after a while mrs bird opened a wardrobe and taking from thence a plain serviceable dress or two she sat down busily to her work-table and with needle scissors and thimble at hand quietly commenced the letting down process which her husband had recommended and continued busily at it till the old clock in the corner struck twelve and she heard the low rattling of wheels at the door mary said her husband coming in with his overcoat in his hand you must wake her up now we must be off mrs bird hastily deposited the various articles she had collected in a small plain trunk and locking it desired her husband to see it in the carriage and then proceeded to call the woman soon arrayed in a cloak bonnet and shawl that had belonged to her benefactress she appeared at the door with her child in her arms mr bird hurried her into the carriage and mrs bird pressed on after her to the carriage steps eliza leaned out of the carriage and put out her hand a hand as soft and beautiful as was given in return she fixed her large dark eyes full of earnest meaning on mrs bird's face and seemed going to speak her lips moved she tried once or twice but there was no sound and pointing upward with a look never to be forgotten she fell back in the seat and covered her face the door was shut and the carriage drove on what a situation now for a patriotic senator that had been all the week before spurring up the legislator of his native state to pass more stringent resolutions against escaping fugitives their harbourers and abettors our good senator in his native state had not been exceeded by any of his brethren at washington in the sort of eloquence which has won for them immortal renown how sublimely he had sat with his hands in his pockets and scouted all sentimental weakness of those who would put the welfare of a few miserable fugitives before great state interests he was as bold as a lion about it and mightily convinced not only himself but everybody that heard him but then his idea of a fugitive was only an idea of the letters that spell the word or at the most the image of a little newspaper picture of a man with a stick and bundle with ran away from the subscriber under it the magic of the real presence of distress the imploring human eye the frail trembling human hand the despairing appeal of helpless agony these he had never tried he had never thought that a fugitive might be a hapless mother a defenceless child like that one which was now wearing his lost boy's little well-known cap and so as our poor senator was not stone or steel as he was a man and a downright noble-hearted one too he was as everybody must see 
in a sad case for his patriotism. And you need not exult over him, good brother of the southern states, for we have some inklings that many of you, under similar circumstances, would not do much better. We have reason to know in Kentucky, as in Mississippi, our noble and generous hearts, to whom never was a tale of suffering told in vain. Ah, good brother, is it fair for you to expect of us services which your own brave, honourable heart would not allow you to render, were you in our place? Be that as it may, if our good senator was a political sinner, he was in a fair way to expiate it by his night's penance. There had been a long, continuous period of rainy weather, and the soft, rich earth of Ohio, as every one knows, is admirably suited to the manufacture of mud, and the road was an Ohio railroad of the good old times. And pray, what sort of a road may that be? says some eastern traveller, who has been accustomed to connect no ideas with a railroad but those of smoothness or speed. Know then, innocent eastern friend, that in benighted regions of the west, where the mud is of unfathomable and sublime depths, roads are made of round rough logs, arranged transversely side by side and coated over in their pristine freshness, with earth, turf, and whatsoever may come to hand, and then the rejoicing native calleth it a road, and straightway essayeth to ride thereupon. In process of time the rains wash off all the turf and grass aforesaid, move the logs hither and thither, in picturesque positions, up, down, and crosswise, with divers chasms and ruts of black mud intervening. Over such a road as this our senator went stumbling along, making moral reflections as continuously as under the circumstances could be expected, the carriage proceeding along much as follows, bump, 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 slush, down in the mud, the senator, woman and child, reversing their positions so suddenly as to come without any very accurate adjustment against the windows of the downhill side carriage sticks fast while cudjo on the outside is heard making a great muster among the horses after various ineffectual pullings and twitchings just as the senator is losing all patience the carriage suddenly rights itself with a bounce two front wheels go down into another abyss and senator woman and child all tumble promiscuously on to the front seat senator's hat is jammed over his eyes and nose quite unceremoniously and he considers himself fairly extinguished child cries and cudjo on the outside delivers animated addresses to the horses who are kicking and floundering and straining under repeated cracks of the whip carriage springs up with another bounce down go the hind wheels senator woman and child fly over on to the back seat his elbows encountering her bonnet, and both her feet being jammed into his hat, which flies off in the concussion. After a few moments the slough is passed, and the horses stop panting. The senator finds his hat, the woman straightens her bonnet and hushes her child, and they brace themselves for what is yet to come. For a while only the continuous bump-bump, intermingled, just by way of variety with divers side plunges and compound shakes and they begin to flatter themselves that they are not so badly off after all at last with a square plunge which puts all on their feet and then down into their seats with incredible quickness the carriage stops and after much outside commotion cudjo appears at the door Please, sir, it's powerful bad spot this year. I don't know how we's to get clear out. I'm a thinkin' we'll have to be a gettin rails. The senator despairingly steps out, picking gingerly for some firm foothold. Down goes one foot, an immeasurable depth. He tries to pull it up, loses his balance, and tumbles over into the mud, and is fished out in a very despairing condition by Cudjo. But we forbear out of sympathy to our reader's bones. 
western travellers who have beguiled the midnight hour in the interesting process of pulling down rail fences to pry their carriages out of mud holes will have a respectful and mournful sympathy with our unfortunate hero we beg them to drop a silent tear and pass on it was full late in the night when the carriage emerged dripping and bespattered out of the creek and stood at the door of a large farmhouse it took no inconsiderable perseverance to arouse the inmates but at last the respectable proprietor appeared and undid the door he was a great tall bristling orson of a fellow full six feet and some inches in his stockings and arrayed in a red flannel hunting shirt a very heavy mat of sandy hair in a decidedly tousled condition and a beard of some day's growth gave the worthy man an appearance to say the least not particularly prepossessing he stood for a few minutes holding the candle aloft and blinking on our travellers with a dismal and mystified expression that was truly ludicrous it cost some effort of our senator to induce him to comprehend the case fully and while he is doing his best on that we shall give him a little introduction to our readers honest old john van tromp was once quite a considerable landowner and slave owner in the state of kentucky having nothing of the bear about him but the skin and being gifted by nature with a great honest just heart quite equal to his gigantic frame he had been for some years witnessing with repressed uneasiness the workings of a system equally bad for oppressor and oppressed at last one day john's great heart had swelled altogether too big to wear his bonds any longer so he just took his pocket-book out of his desk and went over into ohio and bought a quarter of a township of good rich land made out free papers for all his people men women and children packed them in wagons and sent them off to settle down and then honest john turned his face up the creek and sat quietly down on a snug retired farm to enjoy his conscience and his reflections are you the man that will shelter a poor woman and child from slave catchers said the senator explicitly i rather think i am said honest john with some considerable emphasis i thought so said the senator if there's anybody comes said the good man stretching his tall muscular form upward why here i'm ready for him and i've got seven sons each six foot high and they'll be ready for him give our respects to him said john tell him it's no matter how soon they call make no kinder difference to us said john running his fingers through the shock of hair that thatched his head and bursting out into a great laugh weary jaded and spiritless eliza dragged herself up to the door with her child lying in a heavy sleep on her arm the rough man held the candle to her face and uttering a kind of compassionate grunt opened the door of a small bedroom adjoining to the large kitchen where they were standing and motioned her to go in he took down a candle and lighting it set it upon the table and then addressed himself to eliza now i say gal you needn't be a bit afeard let who will come here i'm up to all that sort of thing said he pointing to two or three goodly rifles over the mantelpiece and most people that know me know that twouldn't be healthy to try to get anybody out of my house when i'm agin it so now you just go to sleep now as quiet as if your mother was a rockin ye said he as he shut the door why this is an uncommon handsome one he said to the senator ah well handsome uns has the greatest cause to run sometimes if they has any kind of feelin such as decent women should i know all about that the senator in a few words briefly explained eliza's history ah 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 now i want to know said the good man pitifully sure now sure that's nature now poor critter hunted down now like a deer hunted down just for having natural feelings and doing what no kind of mother could help a doing i tell you what these year things make me come the nighest to swearin now a most anything said honest john as he wiped his eyes with the back of a great freckled yellow hand i tell yer what stranger 
it was years and years before i joined the church cause the ministers round in our parts used to preach that the bible went in for these ere cuttings up and i couldn't be up to em with their greek and hebrew and so i took up a ginnum bible and all i never joined the church till i found a minister that was up to em all in greek and all that and he said right the contrary and then i took the right hold and joined the church i did now fact said john who had been all this time uncorking some very frisky bottled cider which at this juncture he presented you'd better just put up here now till daylight said he heartily and i'll call up the old woman and have a bed got ready for you in no time thank you my good friend said the senator i must be along to take the night stage for columbus ah well then if you must i'll go a piece with you and show you a cross road that will take you there better than the road you came on that road's mighty bad john equipped himself and with a lantern in hand was soon seen guiding the senator's carriage towards a road that ran down in a hollow back of his dwelling when they parted the senator put into his hand a ten-dollar bill it's for her he said briefly ay ay said john with equal conciseness they shook hands and parted End of chapter 9「Chapter Ten of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lorraine Paquette. Chapter Ten The Property is Carried Off. The February morning looked grey and drizzling through the window of Uncle Tom's cabin. It looked on downcast faces, the images of mournful hearts. The little table stood out before the fire, covered with an ironing cloth. A coarse but clean shirt or two, fresh from the iron, hung on the back of a chair by the fire, and Aunt Chloe had another spread out before her on the table carefully she rubbed and ironed every fold and every hem with the most scrupulous exactness every now and then raising her hand to her face to wipe away the tears that were coursing down her cheeks tom sat by with his testament open on his knee and his head leaning upon his hand but neither spoke it was yet early and the children lay all asleep together in their little rude trundle bed tom who had to the full the gentle domestic heart which wove for them has been a peculiar characteristic of his unhappy race got up and walked silently to look at his children it's the last time he said aunt chloe did not answer only rubbed away over and over on the coarse shirt already as smooth as hands could make it and finally setting her iron suddenly down with a despairing plunge she sat down to the table and lifted up her voice and wept suppose we must be resigned but oh lord how can i if i knowed anything war you is goin or how they'd sarve you mrs says she'll try and deem ye in a year or two but lor nobody never comes up that goes down there they kills em i've heard em tell how they works em up on dem ere plantations there'll be the same god there chloe that there is here well said aunt chloe suppose there will but de lord lets dreadful things happen sometimes i don't seem to get no comfort dat way i'm in the lord's hands said tom nothin can go no further than he lets it and there's one thing i can thank him for it's me that sold and going down and not you nor the chillin here you're safe what comes will come only on me and the lord he'll help me i know he will ah brave manly heart smothering thine own sorrow to comfort thy beloved ones tom spoke with a thick utterance and with a bitter choking in his throat but he spoke brave and strong let's think on our marcies he added tremulously as if he was quite sure he needed to think on them very hard indeed marcies said aunt chloe don't see no marcy in it 
tain't right tain't right it should be so Master never ought ter left it so that ye could be took for his debts you've earned him all he gets for ye twice over he owed you your freedom and ought ter gin it to ye years ago maybe he can't help himself now but i feel it's wrong nothing can't beat that air out o me sich a faithful critter as ye've been and allers sought his business for your own every way and reckoned on him more than your own wife and chillen them as sells heart's love and heart's blood to get out their scrapes de lord'll be up to em chloe now if you love me you won't talk so when perhaps just the last time we'll ever have together and i'll tell ye chloe it goes agin me to hear one word agin masser wasn't he put in my arms a baby it's nature i should think a heap of him and he couldn't be spected to think so much of poor tom masters is used to havin all these year things done for em and natly they don't think so much on it they can't be spected to no way set him long side of other masters who's had the treatment and livin i've had and he never would have let this year come on me if he could have seed it aforehand i know he wouldn't well anyway there's wrong about it somewhere said aunt chloe in whom a stubborn sense of justice was a predominant trait i can't just make out where tis but there's wrong somewhere i'm clear o that yer ought to look up to the lord above he's above all there don't a sparrow fall without him it don't seem to comfort me by spected order said aunt chloe but there's no use talkin i'll just wet up de corn cake and get ye one good breakfast cause nobody knows when you'll get another in order to appreciate the sufferings of the negroes sold south it must be remembered that all the instinctive affections of that race are peculiarly strong their local attachments are very abiding they are not naturally daring and enterprising but home-loving and affectionate add to this all the terrors with which ignorance invests the unknown and add to this again that selling to the south is set before the negro from childhood as the last severity of punishment the threat that terrifies more than whipping or torture of any kind is the threat of being sent down river we have ourselves heard this feeling expressed by them and seen the unaffected horror with which they will sit in their gossiping hours and tell frightful stories of that down river which to them is that undiscovered country from whose born no traveller returns a slightly inaccurate quotation from hamlet act three scene one lines three sixty nine to three seventy a missionary figure among the fugitives in canada told us that many of the fugitives confessed themselves to have escaped from comparatively kind masters and that they were induced to brave the perils of escape in almost every case by the desperate horror with which they regarded being sold south a doom which was hanging either over themselves or their husbands their wives or children this nerves the african naturally patient timid and unenterprising with heroic courage and leads him to suffer hunger cold pain the perils of the wilderness and the more dread penalties of recapture the simple morning meal now smoked on the table for mrs shelby had excused aunt chloe's attendance at the great house that morning the poor soul had expended all her little energies on this farewell feast had killed and dressed her choicest chicken and prepared her corn cake with scrupulous exactness just to her husband's taste and brought out certain mysterious jars on the mantelpiece some preserves that were never produced except on extreme occasions lor pete said mose triumphantly han't we got a buster of a breakfast at the same time catching at a fragment of the chicken aunt chloe gave him a sudden box on the ear there now crowing over the last breakfast your poor daddy's gonna have to home oh chloe said tom gently 
"'Well, I can't help it,' said Aunt Chloe, hiding her face in her apron. "'I so tossed about it. It makes me act ugly.' The boys stood quite still, looking first at their father, then at their mother, while the baby, climbing up her clothes, began an imperious, commanding cry. "'There,' said Aunt Chloe, wiping her eyes and taking up the baby. "'Now I's done, I hope. Now do eat something. This year's my nicest chicken. There, boys, ye shall have some poor critters. Your mammy's been cross, dear.' The boys needed no second invitation, and went in with great zeal for the eatables, and it was well they did so, as otherwise there would have been very little performed to any purpose by the party. Now, said Aunt Chloe, bustling about after breakfast, I must put up your clothes. Just like as not, he'll take em all away. I know their ways, mean as dirt they is. Well, now, your flannels for rheumatis is in this corner. So be careful, cause there won't be nobody make ye no more. Then here's your old shirts, and these year is new ones. I towed off these year stockings last night and put de ball in em to mend with. But lor, who'll ever mend for ye? And Aunt Chloe, again overcome, laid her head on the box side and sobbed. To think on it, no critter to do for ye, sick or well. I don't really think I ought to be good now. The boys, having eaten everything there was on the breakfast table, began now to take some thought of the case, and seeing their mother crying and their father looking very sad, began to whimper and put their hands to their eyes. Uncle Tom had the baby on his knee and was letting her enjoy herself to the utmost extent, scratching his face and pulling his hair, and occasionally breaking out into clamorous explosions of delight evidently arising out of her own internal reflections i crow away poor critter said aunt chloe you'll live to see your husband sold or maybe be sold yourself and these year boys they's to be sold i suppose too just like as not when dey gets good for something ain't no use in niggers havin nothin here one of the boys called out there's missus a comin in she can't do no good what's she comin' for said aunt chloe mrs shelby entered aunt chloe set a chair for her in a manner decidedly gruff and crusty she did not seem to notice either the action or the manner she looked pale and anxious tom she said i come to and stopping suddenly and regarding the silent group she sat down in the chair and covering her face with her handkerchief began to sob lord no missus don't don't said aunt chloe bursting out in her turn and for a few moments they all wept in company and in those tears they all shed together the high and the lowly melted away all the heart burnings and anger of the oppressed o ye who visit the distressed do ye know that everything your money can buy, given with a cold, averted face, is not worth one honest tear shed in real sympathy? My good fellow, said Mrs. Shelby, I can't give you anything to do you any good. If I give you money, it will only be taken from you. But I tell you solemnly and before God that I will keep trace of you and bring you back as soon as I can command the money and till then trust in god here the boys called out that master haley was coming and then an unceremonious kick pushed open the door haley stood there in very ill humour having ridden hard the night before and being not at all pacified by his ill success in recapturing his prey come he said ye nigger you are ready servant ma'am said he taking off his hat as he saw mrs shelby aunt chloe shut and quartered the box and getting up looked gruffly at the trader her tears seeming suddenly turned to sparks of fire tom rose up meekly to follow his new master and raised up his heavy box on his shoulder his wife took the baby in her arms to go with him to the wagon and the children still crying trailed on behind mrs shelby walking up to the trader detained him for a few moments talking with him in an earnest manner 
and while she was thus talking the whole family party proceeded to the wagon that stood ready harnessed at the door a crowd of all the old and young hands on the place stood gathered around it to bid farewell to their old associate tom had been looked up to both as a head servant and a christian teacher by all the place and there was much honest sympathy and grief about him particularly among the women why chloe you bear it better than we do said one of the women who had been weeping freely noticing the gloomy calmness with which aunt chloe stood by the wagon i's done my tears she said looking grimly at the trader who was coming up i does not feel to cry for dat ere old limb no how get in said haley to tom as he strode through the crowd of servants who looked at him with lowering brows tom got in and haley drawing out from under the wagon seat a heavy pair of shackles made them fast around each ankle a smothered groan of indignation ran through the whole circle and mrs shelby spoke from the veranda mr haley i assure you that precaution is entirely unnecessary don't know ma'am i've lost one five hundred dollars from this year place and i can't afford to run no more risks what else could she spect on him said aunt chloe indignantly while the two boys who now seemed to comprehend at once their father's destiny clung to her gown sobbing and groaning vehemently i'm sorry said tom that master george happened to be away george had gone to spend two or three days with a companion on a neighbouring estate and having departed early in the morning before tom's misfortune had been made public had left without hearing of it give my love to master george he said earnestly haley whipped up the horse and with a steady mournful look fixed to the last on the old place tom was whirled away mr shelby at this time was not at home he had sold tom under the spur of a driving necessity to get out of the power of a man whom he dreaded and his first feeling after the consummation of the bargain had been that of relief but his wife's expostulations awoke his half slumbering regrets and tom's manly disinterestedness increased the unpleasantness of his feelings it was in vain that he said to himself that he had a right to do it that everybody did it and that some did it without even the excuse of necessity he could not satisfy his own feelings and that he might not witness the unpleasant scenes of the consummation he had gone on a short business tour up the country hoping that all would be over before he returned tom and haley rattled on along the dusty road whirling past every old familiar spot until the bounds of the estate were fairly passed and they found themselves out on the open pike after they had ridden about a mile haley suddenly drew up at the door of a blacksmith's shop when taking out with him a pair of handcuffs he stepped into the shop to have a little alteration in them these years a little too small for his build said haley showing the fetters and pointing out to tom lord now if thar ain't shelby's tom he hasn't sold him now said the smith yes he has said haley now you don't well really said the smith who'd a thought of it why you needn't go a fetterin him up this year way he's the faithfulest best critter yes yes said haley but your good fellows are just the critters to want to run off them stupid ones as doesn't care where they go and shiftless drunken ones as don't care for nothin they'll stick by and like as not be rather pleased to be toted round but these yer prime fellows they hates it like sin no way but to fetter em got legs they'll use em no mistake well said the smith feeling among his tools them plantations down there stranger ain't just the place a kentuck nigger wants to go to they dies there tolerable fast don't they well yes tolerable fast their dying is what with the climating and one thing and another they dies so as to keep the market up pretty brisk said haley 
well now a feller can't help thinking it's a mighty pity to have a nice quiet likely feller as good un as tom is go down to be fairly ground up on one of them air sugar plantations well he's got a fair chance i promise to do well by him i'll get him in house servant in some good old family and then if he stands the fever and climating he'll have a berth good as any nigger ought to ask for he leaves his wife and chillin up here s'pose yes but he'll get another there lor there's women enough everywhere said haley tom was sitting very mournfully on the outside of the shop while this conversation was going on suddenly he heard the quick short click of a horse's hoof behind him and before he could fairly awake from his surprise young master george sprang into the wagon threw his arms tumultuously round his neck and was sobbing and scolding with energy i declare it's real mean i don't care what they say any of em it's a nasty mean shame if i was a man they shouldn't do it they should not so said george with a kind of subdued howl oh master george this does me good said tom i couldn't bear to go off without seeing ye it does me real good ye can't tell here tom made some movement of his feet and george's eye fell on the fetters what a shame he exclaimed lifting his hands i'll knock that old fellow down i will no you won't master george and you must not talk so loud it won't help me any to anger him well i won't then for your sake but only to think of it isn't it a shame they never sent for me nor sent me any word and if it hadn't been for tom lincoln i shouldn't have heard it i tell you i blew em up well all of em at home that air wasn't right i'm afeard master george can't help it i say it's a shame look here uncle tom said he turning his back on the shop and speaking in a mysterious tone i've brought you my dollar oh i couldn't think of taking on it master george no ways in the world said tom quite moved but you shall take it said george look here i told aunt chloe i'd do it and she advised me just to make a hole in it and put a string through it so you could hang it round your neck and keep it out of sight else this mean scamp would take it away i tell you tom i want to blow him up it would do me good no don't master george for it won't do me any good well i won't for your sake said george busily tying his dollar round tom's neck but there now button your coat tight over it and keep it and remember every time you see it that i'll come down after you and bring you back aunt chloe and i have been talking about it i told her not to fear i'll see to it and i'll tease father's life out if he don't do it oh master george you mustn't talk so about your father lor uncle tom i don't mean anything bad and now master george said tom you must be a good boy remember how many hearts is sought on thee always keep close to your mother don't be getting into any of them foolish ways boys has of getting too big to mind their mothers tell ye what master george the lord gives good many things twice over but he don't give ye a mother but once ye'll never see sich another woman master george if ye live to be a hundred years old so now you hold on to her and grow up and be a comfort to her there's my own good boy you will now won't ye yes i will uncle tom said george seriously and be careful of your speakin master george young boys when they comes to your age is wilful sometimes it is nature they should be but real gentlemen such as i hopes you'll be never lets fall on words that isn't spectful to their parents ye ain't fended master george no indeed uncle tom you always did give me good advice i's older you know said tom stroking the boy's fine curly head with his large strong hand but speaking in a voice as tender as a woman's and i sees all that's bound up in you oh master george you has everything larnin privileges readin writin and you'll grow up to be a great learned good man 
and all the people on the place and your mother and father'll be so proud on ye be a good master like your father and be a christian like your mother member your creator in the days of your youth master george i'll be real good uncle tom i tell you said george i'm going to be a first raider and don't you be discouraged i'll have you back to the place yet as i told aunt chloe this morning i'll build our house all over and you shall have a room for a piler with a carpet on it when i'm a man oh you'll have good times yet haley now came to the door with the handcuffs in his hands look here now mister said george with an air of great superiority as he got out i shall let father and mother know how you treat uncle tom you're welcome said the trader i should think you'd be ashamed to spend all your life buying men and women and chaining them like cattle i should think you'd feel mean said george so long as your grand folks wants to buy men and women i'm as good as they is said haley tain't any meaner sellin on em than it is buyin i'll never do either when i'm a man said george i'm ashamed this day that i'm a kentuckian i always was proud of it before and george sat very straight on his horse and looked round with an air as if he expected the state would be impressed with his opinion well good-bye uncle tom keep a stiff upper lip said george good-bye master george said tom looking fondly and admiringly at him god almighty bless you ah kentucky hasn't got many like you he said in the fullness of his heart as the frank boyish face was lost to his view away he went and tom looked till the clatter of his horse's heels died away the last sound or sight of his home but over his heart there seemed to be a warm spot where those young hands had placed that precious dollar tom put up his hand and held it close to his heart now i tell you what tom said haley as he came up to the wagon and threw in the handcuffs i mean to start fair with ye as i generally do with my niggers and i'll tell ye now to begin with you treat me fair and i'll treat you fair i ain't never hard on my niggers calculates to do the best for em i can now you see you'd better just settle down comfortable and not be trying no tricks cos nigger tricks of all sorts i'm up to and it's no use if niggers is quiet and don't try to get off they has good times with me and if they don't why that's their fault and not mine tom assured haley that he had no present intentions of running off in fact the exhortation seemed rather a superfluous one to a man with a great pair of iron fetters on his feet but mr haley had got in the habit of commencing his relations with his stock with little exhortations of this nature calculated as he deemed to inspire cheerfulness and confidence and prevent the necessity of any unpleasant scenes and here for the present we take our leave of tom to pursue the fortunes of other characters in our story end of chapter ten chapter eleven of uncle tom's cabin by harriet beecher stowe this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lorraine Paquette. Chapter 11. In which property gets into an improper state of mind. It was late in a drizzly afternoon that a traveller alighted at the door of a small country hotel in the village of N. in Kentucky. In the bar room he found assembled quite a miscellaneous company whom stress of weather had driven to harbour and the place presented the usual scenery of such reunions great tall raw-boned kentuckians attired in hunting shirts and trailing their loose joints over a vast extent of territory with the easy lounge peculiar to the race rifles stacked away in the corner shot pouches game bags hunting dogs and little negroes all rolled together in the corners were the characteristic features in the place at each end of the fireplace sat a long-legged gentleman with his chair tipped back his hat on his head 
and the heels of his muddy boots reposing sublimely on the mantelpiece a position we will inform our readers decidedly favourable to the turn of reflection incident to western taverns where travellers exhibit a decided preference for this particular mode of elevating their understandings mine host who stood behind the bar like most of his countrymen was great of statue good-natured and loose-jointed with an enormous shock of hair on his head and a great tall hat on the top of that in fact everybody in the room bore on his head this characteristic emblem of man's sovereignty whether it were felt hat palm leaf greasy beaver or fine new chapeau there it reposed with true republican independence in truth it appeared to be the characteristic mark of every individual some wore them tipped rakishly to one side these were your men of humour jolly free and easy dogs some had them jammed independently down over their noses these were your hard characters thorough men who when they wore their hats wanted to wear them and to wear them just as they had a mind to there were those who had them set far over back wide awake men who wanted a clear prospect while careless men who did not know or care how their hats sat had them shaking about in all directions the various hats in fact were quite a shakespearean study divers negroes in very free and easy pantaloons and with no redundancy in the shirt line were scuttling about hither and thither without bringing to pass any particular results except expressing a generic willingness to turn over everything in creation generally for the benefit of masser and his guests add to this picture a jolly crackling rollicking fire going rejoicingly up a great wide chimney the outer door and every window being set wide open and the calico window curtain flopping and snapping in a good stiff breeze of damp raw air and you have an idea of the jollities of a kentucky tavern your kentuckian of the present day is a good illustration of the doctrine of transmitted instincts and peculiarities his fathers were mighty hunters men who lived in the woods and slept under the free open heavens with the stars to hold their candles and their descendant to this day always acts as if the house were his camp wears his hat at all hours tumbles himself about and puts his heels on the tops of chairs or mantelpieces just as his father rolled on the green sward and put his upon trees and logs keeps all the windows and doors open winter and summer that he may get air enough for his great lungs calls everybody stranger with nonchalant bonhomie and is altogether the frankest easiest most jovial creature living into such an assembly of the free and easy our traveller entered he was a short thick-set man carefully dressed with a round good-natured countenance and something rather fussy and particular in his appearance he was very careful of his valise and umbrella bringing them in with his own hands and resisting pretentiously all offers from the various servants to relieve him of them he looked round the bar-room with rather an anxious air and retreating with his valuables to the warmest corner disposed them under his chair sat down and looked rather apprehensively up at the worthy whose heels illustrated the end of the mantelpiece who was spitting from right to left with a courage and energy rather alarming to gentlemen of weak nerves and particular habits i say stranger how are ye said the aforesaid gentleman firing an honorary salute of tobacco juice in the direction of the new arrival well i reckon was the reply of the other as he dodged with some alarm the threatening honour any news said the respondent taking out a strip of tobacco and a large hunting-knife from his pocket not that i know of said the man chaw said the first speaker handing the old gentleman a bit of his tobacco with a decidedly brotherly air no thank ye it don't agree with me said the little man edging off don't eh 
said the other easily, and stowing away the morsel in his own mouth in order to keep up the supply of tobacco juice for the general benefit of society. The old gentleman uniformly gave a little start whenever his long-sighted brother fired in his direction, and this being observed by his companion, he very good-naturedly turned his artillery to another quarter and proceeded to storm one of the fire-irons with a degree of military talent fully sufficient to take a city. "'What's that?' said the old gentleman, observing some of the company formed in a group around a large handbill. "'Nigger advertised,' said one of the company briefly. Mr. Wilson, for that was the old gentleman's name, rose up and, after carefully adjusting his valise and umbrella, proceeded deliberately to take out his spectacles and fix them on his nose, and this operation being performed, read as follows. Ran away from the subscriber, my mulatto boy George, said George, six feet in height, a very light mulatto, brown curly hair, is very intelligent, speaks handsomely, can read and write, will probably try to pass for a white man, is deeply scarred on his back and shoulders, has been branded in his right hand with the letter H. I will give four hundred dollars for him alive, and the same sum for satisfactory proof that he has been killed. The old gentleman read this advertisement from end to end in a low voice, as if he were studying it. The long-legged veteran, who had been besieging the fire-iron as before related, now took down his cumbrous length and, rearing aloft his tall form, walked up to the advertisement and very deliberately spit a full discharge of tobacco juice on it. "'There's my mind upon that,' said he briefly, and sat down again. "'Why now, stranger, what's that for?' said mine host. "'I do it all the same to the writer of that R paper if he were here,' said the long man, coolly resuming his old employment of cutting tobacco. "'Any man that owns a boy like that and can't find any better way of treating on him deserves to lose him. "'Such papers as these is a shame to Kentucky. That's my mind right out, if anybody wants to know.' "'Well, now, that's a fact.' said mine host, as he made an entry in his book. "'I've got a gang of boys, sir,' said the long man, resuming his attack on the firearms, "'and I just tells him, "'Boys,' says I, "'run now, dig, put, just when you want to. "'I never shall come to look after you. "'That's the way I keep mine. "'Let em know they are free to run any time, "'and it just breaks up their wanting to.' More and all, I've got free papers for em all recorded in case I gets killed up any of these times. And they know it. And I tell you, stranger, there ain't a fellow in our parts gets more out of his niggers than I do. Why, my boys have been to Cincinnati with five hundred dollars worth of colts and brought me back the money all straight time and again. It stands to reason they should. Treat em like dogs and you'll have dogs' works and dogs' actions. Treat em like men, and you'll have men's works. And the honest drover, in his warmth, endorsed this morsel of sentiment by firing a perfect feu de joie at the fireplace. I think you're altogether right, friend, said Mr. Wilson, and this boy described here is a fine fellow, no mistake about that. He worked for me some half dozen years in my bagging factory, and he was my best hand, sir. He is an ingenious fellow, too. He invented a machine for the cleaning of hemp, a really valuable affair. It's gone into use in several factories. His master holds the patent of it. I'll warrant ye, said the drover, holds it and makes money out of it, and then turns round and brands the boy in his right hand. If I had a fair chance, I'd mark him, I reckon, so that he'd carry it one while. These year knowin' boys is allers aggravatin' and sarcy, said a coarse-looking fellow from the other side of the room. That's why they gets cut up and marked so. If they behave themselves, they wouldn't. That is to say, the Lord made em men, and it's a hard squeeze gettin' em down into beasts, said the drover dryly. Bright niggers ain't no kind of vantage to their masters continued the other, well entrenched in a coarse, unconscious obtuseness from the contempt of his opponent. What's the use of talents in them things, if you can't get the use on em yourself? 
why all the use they make on it is to get round you i've had one or two of these fellers and i just sold em down river i knew i'd got to lose em first or last if i didn't better send orders up to the lord to make you a set and leave out their souls entirely said the drover here the conversation was interrupted by the approach of a small one-horse buggy to the inn it had a genteel appearance and a well-dressed gentlemanly man sat on the seat with a coloured servant driving the whole party examined the newcomer with the interest with which a set of loafers in a rainy day usually examine every newcomer he was very tall with a dark spanish complexion fine expressive black eyes and close curling hair also of a glossy blackness his well-formed alkaline nose straight thin lips and the admirable contour of his finely formed limbs impressed the whole company instantly with the idea of something uncommon he walked easily in among the company and with a nod indicated to his waiter where to place his trunk bowed to the company and with his hat in his hand walked up leisurely to the bar and gave in his name as henry butter oaklands shelby county turning with an indifferent air he sauntered up to the advertisement and read it over jim he said to his man seems to me we met a boy something like this up at beeman's didn't we yes masser said jim only i ain't sure about the hand well i didn't look of course said the stranger with a careless yawn then walking up to the landlord he desired him to furnish him with a private apartment as he had some writing to do immediately the landlord was all obsequious and a relay of about seven negroes old and young male and female little and big were soon whizzing about like a covey of partridges bustling hurrying treading on each other's toes and tumbling over each other in their zeal to get master's room ready while he seated himself easily on a chair in the middle of the room and entered into conversation with the man who sat next to him the manufacturer mr wilson from the time of the entrance of the stranger had regarded him with an air of disturbed and uneasy curiosity he seemed to himself to have met and been acquainted with him somewhere but he could not recollect every few moments when the man spoke or moved or smiled he would start and fix his eyes on him and then suddenly withdraw them as the bright dark eyes met his with such unconcerned coolness at last a sudden recollection seemed to flash upon him for he stared at the stranger with such an air of blank amazement and alarm that he walked up to him mr wilson i think said he in a tone of recognition and extending his hand i beg your pardon i didn't recollect you before i see you remember me mr butler of oaklands shelby county Y yeah, yes yes sir said mr wilson like one speaking in a dream just then a negro boy entered and announced that master's room was ready jim see to the trunks said the gentleman negligently then addressing himself to mr wilson he added i should like to have a few moments conversation with you on business in my room if you please mr wilson followed him as one who walks in his sleep and they proceeded to a large upper chamber where a new-made fire was crackling and various servants flying about putting finishing touches to the arrangements when all was done and the servants departed the young man deliberately locked the door and putting the key in his pocket faced about and folding his arms on his bosom looked mr wilson full in the face george said mr wilson yes george said the young man i couldn't have thought it i am pretty well disguised i fancy said the young man with a smile a little walnut bark has made my yellow skin a genteel brown and i've dyed my hair black so you see i don't answer to the advertisement at all oh george but this is a dangerous game you're playing i could not have advised you to it i can do it on my own responsibility said george with the same proud smile we remark en passant that george was by his father's side of white descent his mother was one of those unfortunates of her race marked out by personal beauty to be the slave of the passions of her possessor 
and the mother of children who may never know a father. From one of the proudest families in Kentucky, he had inherited a set of fine European features and a high indomitable spirit. From his mother he had received only a slight mulatto tinge, amply compensated by its accompanying rich dark eye. A slight change in the tint of the skin and the colour of his hair had metamorphosed him into the Spanish-looking fellow he then appeared, and as gracefulness of movement and gentlemanly manners had always been perfectly natural to him, he found no difficulty in playing the bold part he had adopted that of a gentleman travelling with his domestic mr wilson a good-natured but extremely fidgety and cautious old gentleman ambled up and down the room appearing as john bunyan hath it much tumbled up and down in his mind and divided between his wish to help george and a certain confused notion of maintaining law and order so as he shambled about he delivered himself as follows well george i suppose you're running away leaving your lawful master george i don't wonder at it at the same time i'm sorry george yes decidedly i think i must say that george it's my duty to tell you so why are you sorry sir said george calmly why to see you as it were setting yourself in opposition to the laws of your country my country said george with a strong and bitter emphasis what country have i but the grave and i wish to god that i was laid there why george no no it won't do this way of talking is wicked unscriptural george you've got a hard master in fact he is well he conducts himself reprehensively i can't pretend to defend him but you know how the angel commanded hagar to return to her mistress and submit herself under the hand and the apostle sent back onesimus to his master footnote genesis sixteen the angel bade the pregnant hagar return to her mistress sarai even though sarai had dealt harshly with her second footnote philippians one ten onesimus went back to his master to become no longer a servant but a brother beloved don't quote bible at me that way mr wilson said george with a flashing eye don't for my wife is a christian and i means to be if ever i get to where i can but to quote bible to a fellow in my circumstances is enough to make him give it up altogether i appeal to god almighty i'm willing to go with the case to him and ask him if i do wrong to seek my freedom these feelings are quite natural george said the good-natured man blowing his nose yes they're natural but it is my duty not to encourage em in you yes my boy i'm sorry for you now it's a bad case very bad but the apostle says let every one abide in the condition in which he is called we must all submit to the indications of providence george don't you see george stood with his head drawn back his arms folded tightly over his broad breast and a bitter smile curling his lips i wonder mr wilson if the indians should come and take you a prisoner away from your wife and children and want to keep you all your life hoeing corn for them if you'd think it your duty to abide in the condition in which you were called i rather think that you'd think the first stray horse you could find an indication of providence shouldn't you the little old gentleman stared with both eyes at this illustration of the case but though not much of a reasoner he had the sense in which some logicians on this particular subject do not excel that of saying nothing where nothing could be said so as he stood carefully stroking his umbrella and folding and patting down all the creases in it he proceeded on with his exhortations in a general way you see george you know now i always have stood your friend and whatever i've said i've said for your good now here it seems to me you're running an awful risk you can't hope to carry it out if you're taken it will be worse with you than ever they'll only abuse you and half kill you and sell you down the river mr wilson i know all this said george i do run a risk but he threw open his overcoat and showed two pistols and a bowie knife there he said i'm ready for em down river i never will go 
no if it comes to that i can earn myself at least six feet of free soil the first and last i shall ever own in kentucky why george this state of mind is awful it's getting really desperate george i'm concerned going to break the laws of your country my country again mr wilson you have a country but what country have i or any one like me born of slave mothers what laws are there for us we don't make em we don't consent to them we have nothing to do with them all they do for us is to crush us and keep us down haven't i heard your fourth of july speeches don't you tell us all once a year that governments derive their just power from the consent of the governed can't a fellow think that hears such things can't he put this and that together and see what it comes to mr wilson's mind was one of those that may not unaptly be represented by a bale of cotton downy soft benevolently fuzzy and confused he really pitied george with all his heart and had a sort of dim and cloudy perception of the style of feeling that agitated him but he deemed it his duty to go on talking good to him with infinite pertinacity george this is bad i must tell you you know as a friend you'd better not be meddling with such notions they are bad george very bad for boys in your condition very and mr wilson sat down to a table and began nervously chewing the handle of his umbrella see here now mr wilson said george coming up and sitting himself determinedly down in front of him look at me now don't i sit before you every way just as much a man as you are look at my face look at my hands look at my body and the young man drew himself up proudly why am i not a man as much as anybody well mr wilson hear what i can tell you i had a father one of your kentucky gentlemen who didn't think enough of me to keep me from being sold with his dogs and horses to satisfy the estate when he died i saw my mother put up at sheriff's sale with her seven children they were sold before her eyes one by one all to different masters and i was the youngest she came and kneeled down before old masser and begged him to buy her with me that she might have at least one child with her and he kicked her away with his heavy boot i saw him do it and the last that i heard was her moans and screams when i was tied to his horse's neck to be carried off to his place well then my master traded with one of the men and bought my oldest sister she was a pious good girl a member of the baptist church and as handsome as my poor mother had been she was well brought up and had good manners at first i was glad she was bought for i had one friend near me i was soon sorry for it sir i have stood at the door and heard her whipped when it seemed as if every blow cut into my naked heart and i couldn't do anything to help her and she was whipped sir for wanting to live a decent christian life such as your laws give no slave girl a right to live and at last i saw her chained with a trader's gang to be sent to market in orleans sent there for nothing else but that and that's the last i know of her well i grew up long years and years no father no mother no sister not a living soul that cared for me more than a dog nothing but whipping scolding starving why sir i've been so hungry that i have been glad to take the bones they threw to their dogs and yet when i was a little fellow and laid awake whole nights and cried it wasn't the hunger it wasn't the whipping i cried for no sir it was for my mother and my sisters it was because i hadn't a friend to love me on earth i never knew what peace or comfort was i never had a kind word spoken to me till i came to work in your factory mr wilson you treated me well you encouraged me to do well and to learn to read and write and to try to make something of myself and god knows how grateful i am for it then sir i found my wife you've seen her you know how beautiful she is when i found she loved me when i married her i scarcely could believe i was alive i was so happy and sir 
she is as good as she is beautiful but now what why now comes my master takes me right away from my work and my friends and all i like and grinds me down into the very dirt and why because he says i forgot who i was he says to teach me that i am only a nigger after all and last of all he comes between me and my wife and says i shall give her up and live with another woman and all this your laws give him power to do in spite of god or man mr wilson look at it there isn't one of all these things that have broken the hearts of my mother and my sister and my wife and myself but your laws allow and give every man power to do in kentucky and none can say to him nay do you call these the laws of my country sir i haven't any country any more than i have any father but i'm going to have one i don't want anything of your country except to be let alone to go peaceably out of it and when i get to canada where the laws will own me and protect me that shall be my country and its laws i will obey but if any man tries to stop me let him take care for i am desperate i'll fight for my liberty to the last breath i breathe you say your fathers did it if it was right for them it is right for me this speech delivered partly while sitting at the table and partly walking up and down the room delivered with tears and flashing eyes and despairing gestures was altogether too much for the good-natured old body to whom it was addressed who had pulled out a great yellow silk pocket handkerchief and was mopping up his face with great energy blast it all he suddenly broke out haven't i always said so the infernal old cusses i hope i ain't swearin' now well go ahead george go ahead but be careful my boy don't shoot anybody george unless well you'd better not shoot i reckon at least i wouldn't hit anybody you know where's your wife george he added as he nervously rose and began walking the room gone sir gone with her child in her arms the lord only knows where gone after the north star and when we ever meet or whether we meet at all in this world no creature can tell is it possible astonishing from such a kind family kind families get in debt and the laws of our country allows them to sell the child out of its mother's bosom to pay its master's debts said george bitterly well well said the honest old man fumbling in his pocket i suppose perhaps i ain't following my judgment hang it i won't follow my judgment he added suddenly so here george and taking out a roll of bills from his pocket-book he offered them to george no my kind good sir said george you've done a great deal for me and this might get you into trouble i have money enough i hope to take me as far as i need it no but you must george money is a great help everywhere can't have too much if you get it honestly take it do take it now do my boy on condition sir that i may repay it at some future time i will said george taking up the money and now george how long are you going to travel in this way not long or far i hope it's well carried on but too bold and this black fellow who is he a true fellow who went to canada more than a year ago he heard after he got there that his master was so angry at him for going off that he had whipped his poor old mother and he has come all the way back to comfort her and get a chance to get her away has he got her not yet he has been hanging about the place and found no chance yet meanwhile he is going with me as far as ohio to put me among friends that helped him and then he will come back after her dangerous very dangerous said the old man george drew himself up and smiled disdainfully the old gentleman eyed him from head to foot with a sort of innocent wonder george something has brought you out wonderfully you hold up your head and speak and move like another man said mr wilson because i am a free man said george proudly yes sir i've said master for the last time to any man i'm free 
take care you are not sure you may be taken all men are free and equal in the grave if it comes to that mr wilson said george i'm perfectly dumbfounded with your boldness said mr wilson to come right here to the nearest tavern mr wilson it is so bold and this tavern is so near that they will never think of it they will look for me on ahead and you yourself wouldn't know me jim's master don't live in this county he isn't known in these parts besides he has given up nobody is looking after him and nobody will take me up from the advertisement i think but the mark in your hand george drew off his glove and showed a newly healed scar in his hand that is a parting proof of mr harris's regard he said scornfully a fortnight ago he took it into his head to give it to me because he said he believed i should try to get away one of these days looks interesting doesn't it he said drawing his glove on again i declare my very blood runs cold when i think of it your condition and your risks said mr wilson mine has run cold a good many years mr wilson at present it's about up to the boiling point said george well my good sir continued george after a few moments silence i saw you knew me i thought i'd just have this talk with you lest your surprised looks should bring me out i leave early to-morrow morning before daylight by to-morrow night i hope to sleep safe in ohio i shall travel by daylight stop at the best hotels go to the dinner tables with the lords of the land so good-bye sir if you hear that i'm taken you may know that i'm dead george stood up like a rock and put out his hand with the air of a prince the friendly little old man shook it heartily and after a little shower of caution he took his umbrella and fumbled his way out of the room george stood thoughtfully looking at the door as the old man closed it a thought seemed to flash across his mind he hastily stepped to it and opening it said mr wilson one word more the old gentleman entered again and george as before locked the door and then stood for a few moments looking on the floor irresolutely at last raising his head with a sudden effort mr wilson you have shown yourself a christian in your treatment of me i want to ask one last deed of christian kindness of you well george well sir what you said was true i am running a dreadful risk there isn't on earth a living soul to care if i die he added drawing his breath hard and speaking with a great effort i shall be kicked out and buried like a dog and nobody'll think of it a day after only my poor wife poor soul she'll mourn and grieve and if you'd only contrive mr wilson to send this little pin to her she gave it to me for a christmas present poor child give it to her and tell her i loved her to the last will you he added earnestly yes certainly poor fellow said the old gentleman taking the pin with watery eyes and a melancholy quiver in his voice tell her one thing said george it's my last wish if she can get to canada to go there no matter how kind her mistress is no matter how much she loves her home beg her not to go back for slavery always ends in misery tell her to bring up our boy a free man and then he won't suffer as i have tell her this mr wilson will you yes george i'll tell her but i trust you won't die take heart you're a brave fellow trust in the lord george i wish in my heart you were safe through though that's what i do is there a god to trust in said george in such a tone of bitter despair as arrested the old gentleman's words oh i've seen things all my life that have made me feel that there can't be a god you christians don't know how these things look to us there's a god for you but is there any for us oh now don't don't my boy said the old man almost sobbing as he spoke don't feel so there is there is clouds and darkness are around about him but righteousness and judgment are the habitation of his throne there's a god george believe it trust in him and i'm sure he'll help you everything will be set right if not in this life in another the real piety and benevolence of the simple old man invested him 
with a temporary dignity and authority as he spoke. George stopped his distracted walk up and down the room, stood thoughtfully a moment, and then said quietly, Thank you for saying that, my good friend. I'll think of that. End of chapter 11「Chapter Twelve of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lorraine Paquette. Chapter Twelve Select Incident of Lawful Trade. In Rama there was a voice heard weeping and lamentation and great warning, Rachel weeping for her children and would not be comforted. Jeremiah thirty one fifteen. Mr. Haley and Tom jogged onward in their wagon, each for a time absorbed in his own reflections. Now the reflections of two men sitting side by side are a curious thing. Seated on the same seat, having the same eyes, ears, hands, and organs of all sorts, and having passed before their eyes the same objects, it is wonderful what a variety we shall find in these same reflections. As, for example, Mr. Haley. He thought first of Tom's length and breadth and height and what he would sell for if he was kept fat and in good case till he got him into market. He thought of how he should make out his gang. He thought of the respective market value of certain supposititious men and women and children who were to compose it and other kindred topics of the business. Then he thought of himself and how humane he was that whereas other men chained their niggers hand and foot both, he only put fetters on the feet, and left Tom the use of his hands as long as he behaved well. And he sighed to think how ungrateful human nature was, so that there was even room to doubt whether Tom appreciated his mercies. He had been taken in so by niggers whom he had favoured, and still he was astonished to consider how good-natured he yet remained. As for Tom, he was thinking over some words of an unfashionable old book which kept running through his head again and again as follows we have here no continuing city but we seek one to come wherefore god himself is not ashamed to be called our god for he hath prepared for us a city these words of an ancient volume got up principally by ignorant and unlearned men have through all time kept up somehow a strange sort of power over the minds of poor simple fellows like tom they stir up the soul from its depths and rouse as with trumpet call courage energy and enthusiasm where before was only the blackness of despair mr haley pulled out of his pocket sundry newspapers and began looking over their advertisements with absorbed interest he was not a remarkably fluent reader, and was in the habit of reading in a sort of recitative half aloud, by way of calling in his ears to verify the deductions of his eyes. In this tone he slowly recited the following paragraph. Executors sail Negroes. Agreeably to order of court will be sold on Tuesday, February 20th, before the courthouse door, in the town of Washington, Kentucky, the following Negroes. Hagar, aged 60. John, aged 30. Ben, aged 21. Saul, aged 25. Albert, aged 14. Sold for the benefit of the creditors and heirs of the estate of Jesse Blutchford. Samuel Morris Thomas Flint, Executors. This year I must look at, said he to Tom, for want of somebody else to talk to. Ye see, I'm going to get up a prime gang to take down with ye, Tom. It'll make it sociable and pleasant-like. Good company will, you know. We must drive right to Washington first and foremost, and then I'll clap you into jail while I does the business. Tom received this agreeable intelligence quite meekly, simply wondering in his own heart how many of these doomed men had wives and children, and whether they would feel as he did about leaving them. 
it is to be confessed too that the naive off-hand information that he was to be thrown into jail by no means produced an agreeable impression on a poor fellow who had always prided himself on a strictly honest and upright course of life yes tom we must confess it was rather proud of his honesty poor fellow not having very much else to be proud of if he had belonged to some of the higher walks of society he perhaps would never have been reduced to such straits however the day wore on and the evening saw haley and tom comfortably accommodated in washington the one in a tavern and the other in a jail about eleven o'clock the next day a mixed throng was gathered around the courthouse steps smoking chewing spitting swearing and conversing according to their respective tastes and turns waiting for the auction to commence the men and women to be sold sat in a group apart talking in a low tone to each other the woman who had been advertised by the name of hagar was a regular african in feature and figure she might have been sixty but was older than that by hard work and disease was partially blind and somewhat crippled with rheumatism by her side stood her only remaining son albert a bright-looking little fellow of fourteen years the boy was the only survivor of a large family who had been successively sold away from her to a southern market the mother held on to him with both her shaking hands and eyed with intense trepidation every one who walked up to examine him don't be feared aunt hagar said the oldest of the men i spoke to master thomas about it and he thought he might manage to sell you in a lot both together they needn't call me worn out yet said she lifting her shaking hands i can cook yet and scrub and scour i'm worth a buying if i do come cheap tell em dat are you tell em she added earnestly haley here forced his way into the group walked up to the old man pulled his mouth open and looked in felt of his teeth made him stand and straighten himself bend his back and perform various evolutions to show his muscles and then passed on to the next and put him through the same trial walking up last to the boy he felt of his arms straightened his hands and looked at his fingers and made him jump to show his agility he ain't going to be sold without me said the old woman with passionate eagerness he and i goes in a lot together I's rail strong yet, Massa, and I can do heaps of work, heaps on it, Massa. On plantation, said Haley with a contemptuous glance, likely story. And as if satisfied with his examination, he walked out and looked and stood with his hands in his pocket, his cigar in his mouth, and his hat cocked on one side, ready for action. What think of him? said a man who had been following haley's examination as if to make up his own mind from it well said haley spitting i shall put in i think for the youngerly ones and the boy they want to sell the boy and the old woman together said the man find it a tight pull why she's an old rack of bones not worth her salt you wouldn't then said the man anybody'd be a fool twould she's half blind crooked with rheumatis and foolish to boot some buys up these year old critters and says there's a sight more wearin em than a body'd think said the man reflexively no go ta said haley wouldn't take her for a present fact i've seen now well tis kinder pity now not to buy her with her son her heart seems so sought on him s'pose they fling her in cheap them that's got money to spend that air way it's all well enough i shall bid off on that air boy for a plantation hand wouldn't be bothered with her no way not if they'd give her to me said haley she'll take on desperate said the man natly she will said the trader coolly the conversation was here interrupted by a busy hum in the audience and the auctioneer a short bustling important fellow elbowed his way into the crowd 
the old woman drew in her breath and caught instinctively at her son keep close to your mammy elbert close dale put us up together she said oh mammy i fear they won't said the boy they must child i can't live no ways if they don't said the old creature vehemently the stentorian tones of the auctioneer calling out to clear the way now announced that the sale was about to commence a place was cleared and the bidding began the different men on the list were soon knocked off at prices which showed a pretty brisk demand in the market two of them fell to haley come now young un said the auctioneer giving the boy a touch with his hammer be up and show your springs now put us two up together together do please masser said the old woman holding fast to her boy be off said the man gruffly pushing her hands away you come last now darkie spring and with the word he pushed the boy toward the block while a deep heavy groan rose behind him the boy paused and looked back but there was no time to stay and dashing the tears from his large bright eyes he was up in a moment his fine figure alert limbs and bright face raised an instant competition and half a dozen bids simultaneously met the ear of the auctioneer anxious half frightened he looked from side to side as he heard the clatter of contending bids now here now there till the hammer fell haley had got him he was pushed from the block toward his new master but stopped one moment and looked back when his poor old mother trembling in every limb held out her shaking hands toward him buy me too masser for de dear lord's sake buy me i shall die if you don't you'll die if i do that's the kink of it said haley no and he turned on his heel the bidding for the poor old creature was summary the man who had addressed haley and who seemed not destitute of compassion bought her for a trifle and the spectators began to disperse the poor victims of the sale who had been brought up in one place together for years gathered round the despairing old mother whose agony was pitiful to see couldn't they leave me one master allers said i should have one he did she repeated over and over in heart-broken tones trust in the lord aunt hagar said the oldest of the men sorrowfully what good will it do said she sobbing passionately mother mother don't don't said the boy they say you's got a good master i don't care i don't care oh elbert oh my boy you's my last baby lord how can i come take her off can't some of ye said haley dryly don't do no good for her to go on that air way the old men of the company partly by persuasion and partly by force loosed the poor creature's last despairing hold and as they led her off to her new master's wagon strove to comfort her now said haley pushing his three purchases together and producing a bundle of handcuffs which he proceeded to put on their wrists and fastening each handcuff to a long chain he drove them before him to the jail a few days saw haley with his possessions safely deposited on one of the ohio boats it was the commencement of his gang to be augmented as the boat moved on by various other merchandise of the same kind which he or his agent had stored for him in various points along shore the la belle riviere as brave and beautiful a boat as ever walked the waters of her namesake river was floating gaily down the stream under a brilliant sky the stripes and stars of free america waving and fluttering overhead the guards crowded with well-dressed ladies and gentlemen walking and enjoying the delightful day all was full of life buoyant and rejoicing all but haley's gang who were stored with other freight on the lower deck and who somehow did not seem to appreciate their various privileges as they sat in a knot talking to each other in low tones boys said haley coming up briskly i hope you keep up good heart and are cheerful now no sulks you see keep stiff upper lips boys do well by me and i'll do well by you the boys addressed responded with invariable 
Yes, Masser, for ages the watchword of poor Africa. But it's to be owned they did not look particularly cheerful. They had their various little prejudices in favor of wives, mothers, sisters, and children, seen for the last time. And though they that wasted them required of them mirth, it was not instantly forthcoming. I've got a wife, spoke out the article enumerated as John, age thirty, and he laid his chained hand on Tom's knee. And she don't know a word about this poor girl. Where does she live? said Tom. In a tavern, a piece down here, said John. I wish now I could see her once more in this world, he added. Poor John, it was rather natural, and the tears that fell as he spoke came as naturally as if he had been a white man. Tom drew a long breath from a sore heart and tried in his poor way to comfort him. And overhead, in the cabin, sat fathers and mothers, husbands and wives, and merry dancing children moved round among them like so many little butterflies, and everything was going on quite easy and comfortable. Oh, mamma, said a boy who had just come up from below. There is a negro trader on board, and he's brought four or five slaves down there. Poor creatures, said the mother in a tone between grief and indignation. What's that? said another lady. Some poor slaves below, said the mother. And they've got chains on, said the boy. What a shame to our country that such sights are to be seen, said another lady. Oh, there's a great deal to be said on both sides of the subject, said a genteel woman who sat at her stateroom door sewing while her little girl and boy were playing round her. I've been south, and I must say, I think the Negroes are better off than they would be to be free. In certain respects, some of them are well off, I grant said the lady to whose remark she had answered. The most dreadful part of slavery, to my mind, is its outrages on the feelings and affections, the separating of families, for example. That is a bad thing, certainly, said the other lady, holding up a baby's dress she had just completed, and looking intently at its trimmings. But then, I fancy, it doesn't occur often. Oh, it does, said the first lady eagerly. I've lived many years in Kentucky and Virginia both, and I've seen enough to make any one's heart sick. Suppose, ma'am, your two children there should be taken from you and sold. We can't reason from our feelings to those of this class of persons, said the other lady, sorting out some worsteds on her lap. Indeed, ma'am, you can know nothing of them if you say so, answered the first lady warmly. I was born and brought up among them. I know they do feel, just as keenly, even more so, perhaps, than we do. The woman said, indeed, yawned, and looked out the cabin window, and finally repeated for a finale the remark from which she had begun. After all, I think they are better off than they would be to be free. It's undoubtedly the intention of Providence that the African race should be servants, kept in a low condition, said a grave-looking gentleman in black, a clergyman, seated by the cabin door. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be, the scripture says. Genesis 9.25 This is what Noah says when he wakes out of drunkenness and realizes that his youngest son Ham, father of Canaan, has seen him naked. I say, stranger, is that air what that text means? said a tall man standing by. Undoubtedly, it pleased Providence for some inscrutable reason to doom the race to bondage ages ago, and we must not set up our opinion against that. Well, then, we'll all go ahead and buy up niggers, said the man. If that's the way of Providence, won't we, squire? He said, turning to Haley, who had been standing with his hands in his pocket by the stove and intently listening to the conversation. Yes, continued the tall man. We must all be resigned to the decrees of Providence. Niggers must be sold and trucked round and kept under. It's what they're made for. Piers like this year view's quite refreshing. Ain't it, stranger? said he to Haley. I never thought, aunt, said Haley. I couldn't have said as much myself. I ha'n't no larnin. I took up the trade just to make a living, 
If tain't right, I calculated to pent on it in time, you know. And now you'll save yourself the trouble, won't ye? said the tall man. See what tis now to know scripture. If ye'd only studied your Bible like this year, good man, ye might a knowed it before and saved ye a heap of trouble. Ye could just have said, Cast he, what's his name? And twould have all come right. And the stranger, who was no other than the honest drover whom we introduced to our readers in the Kentucky Tavern, sat down and began smoking with a curious smile on his long, dry face. A tall, slender young man, with a face expressive of great feeling and intelligence, here broke in and repeated the words, All things whatsoever ye would that men should do unto you, do ye even so unto them. I suppose, he added, that is a scripture as much as cursed be Canaan. Well, it seems quite as plain a text, stranger, said John the drover, to poor fellows like us now and John smoked on like a volcano. The young man paused, looked as if he was going to say more, when suddenly the boat stopped and the company made the usual steamboat rush to see where they were landing. Both of them air chaps parsons, said John to one of the men as they were going out. The man nodded. As the boat stopped, a black woman came running wildly up the plank, darted into the crowd, flew up to where the slave gang sat and threw her arms round that unfortunate piece of merchandise before innumerate john age thirty and with sobs and tears bemoaned him as her husband but what needs tell the story told too oft every day told of heart-strings rent and broken the weak broken and torn for the profit and convenience of the strong it needs not be told every day is telling it telling it too in the ear of one who is not deaf though he be long silent the young man who had spoken for the cause of humanity and god before stood with folded arms looking on this scene he turned and haley was standing at his side my friend he said speaking with thick utterance how can you how dare you carry on a trade like this look at those poor creatures here i am rejoicing in my heart that i am going home to my wife and child and the same bell which is a signal to carry me onward towards them will part this poor man and his wife for ever depend upon it god will bring you into judgment for this the trader turned away in silence i say now said the drover touching his elbow there's differences in parsons ain't there Cust be cane and don't seem to go down with this son, does it? Haley gave an uneasy growl. And that air ain't the worst, aunt, said John. Maybe it won't go down with the Lord neither, when ye come to settle with him one of these days, as all on us must, I reckon. Haley walked reflexively to the other end of the boat. If I make pretty handsomely on one or two next gangs, he thought, I reckon I'll stop off this year. It's really getting dangerous. And he took out his pocket book and began adding on his accounts, a process which many gentlemen besides Mr. Haley have found a specific for an uneasy conscience. The boat swept proudly away from the shore, and all went on merrily as before. Men talked and loafed and read and smoked. Women sewed and children played, and the boat passed on her way. One day, when she lay in for a while at a small town in Kentucky, Haley went up into the place on a little matter of business. Tom, whose fetters did not prevent him taking a moderate circuit, had drawn near the side of the boat and stood listlessly gazing over the railing. After a time he saw the trader returning with an alert step, in company with a colored woman, bearing in her arms a young child. She was dressed quite respectably, and a colored man followed her, bringing along a small trunk. The woman came cheerfully onward, talking as she came with the man who bore her trunk, and so passed up the plank into the boat. The bell rung, the steamer whizzed, the engine groaned and coughed, and away swept the boat down the river. The woman walked forward among the boxes and bales of the lower deck, and sitting down, busied herself with chirruping to her baby. 
Haley made a turn or two about the boat, and then, coming up, seated himself near her and began saying something to her in an indifferent undertone. Tom soon noticed a heavy cloud passing over the woman's brow, and that she answered rapidly and with great vehemence. I don't believe it. I won't believe it, he heard her say. You're just a foolin' with me. If you won't believe it, look here, said the man, drawing out a paper. This year's the bill of sale, and there's your master's name to it, and I paid down good solid cash for it, too. I can tell you so now. I don't believe master would cheat me so. It can't be true, said the woman, with increasing agitation. You can ask any of these men here that can read writing. Here, he said, to a man that was passing by. Just read this year, won't you? This year gal won't believe me when I tell her what tis. Why, it's a bill of sale, signed by John Fosdick, said the man. Making over to you the girl, Lucy, and her child. It's all straight enough for aught I see. The woman's passionate exclamations collected a crowd around her and the trader briefly explained to them the cause of the agitation. He told me that I was going down to Louisville to hire out as cook to the same tavern where my husband works. That's what Master told me his own self, and I can't believe he'd lie to me, said the woman. But he has sold you, my poor woman, there's no doubt about it, said a good-natured-looking man who had been examining the papers. He has done it, and no mistake. Then it's no account talking, said the woman, suddenly growing quite calm, and clasping her child tighter in her arms, she sat down on her box, turned her back round, and gazed listlessly into the river. Going to take it easy after all, said the trader. Gal's got grit, I see. The woman looked calm as the boat went on, and a beautiful soft summer breeze passed like a compassionate spirit over her head the gentle breeze that never inquires whether the brow is dusky or fair that it fans. And she saw sunshine sparkling on the water in golden ripples, and heard gay voices full of ease and pleasure, talking around her everywhere. But her heart lay as if a great stone had fallen on it. Her baby raised himself up against her and stroked her cheeks with his little hands, and springing up and down, crowing and chatting, seemed determined to arouse her. She strained him suddenly and tightly in her arms, and slowly, one tear after another, fell on his wondering, unconscious face, and gradually she seemed, and little by little, to grow calmer, and busied herself with tending and nursing him. The child, a boy of ten months, was uncommonly large and strong of his age, and very vigorous in his limbs. Never for a moment still, he kept his mother constantly busy in holding him and guarding his springing activity. That's a fine chap, said a man suddenly stopping opposite to him with his hands in his pockets. How old is he? Ten months and a half, said the mother. The man whistled to the boy and offered him part of a stick of candy, which he eagerly grabbed at and very soon had it in a baby's general depository to wit his mouth. Rum fellow said the man, knows what's what, and he whistled and walked on. When he had got to the other side of the boat, he came across Haley, who was smoking on top of a pile of boxes. The stranger produced a match and lighted a cigar, saying as he did so, Decentish kind of wench you've got round there, stranger. Why, I reckon she's tolerable fair, said Haley, blowing the smoke out of his mouth. Taking her down south, said the man. Haley nodded and smoked on. Plantation hand, said the man. Well, said Haley, I am fillin' out an order for a plantation, and I think I shall put her in. They tell me she was a good cook, and they can use her for that, or set her at the cotton picking. She's got the right fingers for that. I looked at him. Sell well either way, and Haley resumed his cigar. They won't want the young un on the plantation, said the man. I shall sell him first chance I find, said Haley, lighting another cigar. Suppose you'd be selling him tolerable cheap, said the stranger, mounting the pile of boxes and sitting down comfortably. 
don't know about that said haley he's a pretty smart young un straight fat strong flesh as hard as a brick very true but then there's the bother and expense of raisin nonsense said haley they is raised as easy as any kind of critter there is going they ain't a bit more trouble than pups this year chap will be runnin all around in a month i've got a good place for raisin and i thought of takin in a little more stock said the man one cook lost a young un last week got drowned in a wash tub while she was a hangin out the clothes and i reckon it would be well enough to set her to raisin this year haley and the stranger smoked a while in silence neither seeming willing to broach the test question of the interview at last the man resumed you wouldn't think of wantin more than ten dollars for that air chap seein you must get em off your hand anyhow haley shook his head and spit impressively that won't do no ways he said and began his smoking again well stranger what will you take well now said haley i could raise that air chap myself or get him raised he's uncommon lightly and healthy and he'd fetch a hundred dollars six months hence and in a year or two he'd bring two hundred if i had him in the right spot i shan't take a cent less nor fifty for him now oh stranger that's ridiculous altogether said the man fact said haley with a decisive nod of his head i'll give thirty for him said the stranger and not a cent more now i'll tell you what i will do said haley spitting again with renewed decision i'll split the difference and say forty-five and that's the most i will do well agreed said the man after an interval done said haley where do you land at louisville said the man louisville said haley very fair we get there about dusk chap will be asleep all fair get em off quietly and no screaming happens beautiful i like to do everything quietly i hates all kind of agitation and fluster and so after a transfer of certain bills had passed from the man's pocket-book to the traders he resumed his cigar it was a bright tranquil evening when the boat stopped at the wharf at louisville the woman had been sitting with her baby in her arms now wrapped in a heavy sleep when she heard the name of the place called out she hastily laid the child down in a little cradle formed by the hollow among the boxes first carefully spreading under it her cloak and then she sprung to the side of the boat in hopes that among the various hotel waiters who thronged the wharf she might see her husband in this hope she pressed forward to the front rails and stretched far over them straining her eyes intently on the moving heads on the shore and the crowd pressed in between her and the child now's your time said haley taking the sleeping child up and handing him to the stranger don't wake him up and set him to crying now it would make a devil of a fuss with the gal the man took the bundle carefully and was soon lost in the crowd that went up the wharf when the boat creaking and groaning and puffing had loosed from the wharf and was beginning slowly to strain herself along the woman returned to her old seat the trader was sitting there the child was gone why why where she began in bewildered surprise lucy said the trader your child's gone you may as well know it first as last you see i knowed you couldn't take him down south and i got a chance to sell him to a first-rate family that'll raise him better than you can the trader had arrived at that stage of christian and political perfection which has been recommended by some preachers and politicians of the north lately in which he had completely overcome every humane weakness and prejudice his heart was exactly where yours sir and mine could be brought with proper effort and cultivation the wild look of anguish and utter despair that the woman cast on him might have disturbed one less practised but he was used to it he had seen that same look hundreds of times 
you can get used to such things too my friend and it is the great object of recent efforts to make our whole northern community used to them for the glory of the union so the trader only regarded the mortal anguish which he saw working in those dark features those clenched hands and suffocating breathings as necessary incidents of the trade and merely calculated whether she was going to scream and get up a commotion on the boat for like other supporters of our peculiar institution he decidedly disliked agitation but the woman did not scream the shot had passed too straight and direct through the heart for cry or tear dizzily she sat down her slack hands fell lifeless by her side her eyes looked straight forward but she saw nothing all the noise and hum of the boat the groaning of the machinery mingled dreamily to her bewildered ear and the poor dumb-stricken heart had neither cry nor tear to show for its utter misery she was quite calm the trader who considering his advantages was almost as humane as some of our politicians seemed to feel called on to administer such consolation as the case admitted of i know this year comes kinder hard at first lucy said he but such a smart sensible gal as you are won't give way to it you see it's necessary and can't be helped oh don't massa don't said the woman with a voice like one that is smothering you're a smart wench lucy he persisted i mean to do well by ye and get ye a nice place down river and you'll soon get another husband such a likely gal as you oh master if you only won't talk to me now said the woman in a voice of such quick and living anguish that the trader felt that there was something at present in the case beyond his style of operation he got up and the woman turned away and buried her head in her cloak the trader walked up and down for a time and occasionally stopped and looked at her takes it hard rather he soliloquized but quiet though let her sweat a while she'll come right by and by tom had watched the whole transaction from first to last and had a perfect understanding of its results to him it looked like something unutterably horrible and cruel because poor ignorant black soul he had not learned to generalize and to take enlarged views if he had only been instructed by certain ministers of christianity he might have thought better of it and seen in it an everyday incident of a lawful trade a trade which is the vital support of an institution which an american divine tells us has quote, no evils but such as are inseparable from any other relations in social and domestic life unquote. but tom as we see being a poor ignorant fellow whose reading had been confined entirely to the new testament could not comfort and solace himself with views like these his very soul bled within him for what seemed to him the wrongs of the poor suffering thing that lay like a crushed reed on the boxes the feeling living bleeding yet immortal thing which american state law coolly classifies with the bundles and bales and boxes among which she is lying Quote, by dr joel parker of philadelphia mrs stowe's note presbyterian clergyman 1799 to 1873 a friend of the beecher family mrs stowe attempted unsuccessfully to have this identifying note removed from the stereotype plate of the first edition tom drew near and tried to say something but she only groaned honestly and with tears running down his own cheeks he spoke of a heart of love in the skies of a pitying jesus and an eternal home but the ear was deaf with anguish and the palsied heart could not feel night came on night calm unmoved and glorious shining down with her innumerable and solemn angel eyes 
twinkling, beautiful, but silent. There was no speech nor language, no pitying voice or helping hand from that distant sky. One after another the voices of business or pleasure died away. All on the boat were sleeping, and the ripples at the prow were plainly heard. Tom stretched himself out on a box, and there as he lay, he heard ever and anon a smothered sob or a cry from the prostrate creature. Oh, what shall I do? Oh, Lord, oh, good Lord, do help me. And so, ever and anon, until the murmur died away in silence. At midnight, Tom waked with a sudden start. Something black passed quickly by him to the side of the boat, and he heard a splash in the water. No one else saw or heard anything. He raised his head. The woman's place was vacant. He got up and sought about him in vain. The poor bleeding heart was still at last, and the river rippled and dimpled just as brightly as if it had not closed above it. Patience, patience, ye whose hearts swell indignant at wrongs like these. Not one throb of anguish, not one tear of the oppressed is forgotten by the man of sorrows, the Lord of glory. In his patient, generous bosom he bears the anguish of a world. Bear thou like him in patience, and labor in love, for such as he is God, the year of his redeemed shall come. The trader waked up bright and early and came out to see to his livestock. It was now his turn to look about in perplexity. Where alive is that gal? he said to Tom. Tom, who had learned the wisdom of keeping counsel, did not feel called upon to state his observations and suspicions, but said he did not know. She surely couldn't have got off in the night at any of the landings, for I was awake and on the lookout whenever the boat stopped. I never trust these year things to other folks. This speech was addressed to Tom quite confidently, as if it was something that would be specially interesting to him. Tom made no answer. The trader searched the boat from stem to stern, among boxes, bales, and barrels, around the machinery, by the chimneys, in vain. Now, I say, Tom, be fair about this year he said, when after a fruitless search he came where Tom was standing. You know something about it now, don't tell me. I know you do. I saw the gal stretched out here about ten o'clock, and again at twelve, and again between one and two, and then at four she was gone, and you was a-sleepin' right there all the time. Now you know something. You can't help it. Well, Masser, said Tom, Towards morning something brushed by me, and I kinder half woke, and then I hearn a great splash, and then I clare woke up, and the gal was gone. That's all I know on it. The trader was not shocked nor amazed, because, as we said before, he was used to a great many things that you are not used to. Even the awful presence of death struck no solemn chill upon him. He had seen death many times met him in the way of trade, and got acquainted with him, and he only thought of him as a hard customer that embarrassed his property operations very unfairly, and so he only swore that the gal was a baggage, and that he was devilish unlucky, and that if things went on in this way he should not make a cent on the trip. In short, he seemed to consider himself an ill-used man decidedly, but there was no help for it as the woman had escaped into a state which never will give up a fugitive, not even at the demand of the whole glorious union. The trader, therefore, sat discontentedly down with his little account book and put down the missing body and soul under the head of losses. He's a shocking creature, isn't he, this trader? So unfeeling. It's dreadful, really. Oh, but nobody thinks anything of these traders. They are universally despised, never received into any decent society. But who, sir, makes the trader? Who is most to blame? 
the enlightened, cultivated, intelligent man who supports the system of which the trader is the inevitable result, or the poor trader himself. You make the public statement that calls for his trade, that debauches and depraves him, till he feels no shame in it. And in what are you better than he? Are you educated and he ignorant, you high and he low, you refined and he coarse, you talented and he simple? In the day of a future judgment, these very considerations may make it more tolerable for him than for you. In concluding these little incidents of lawful trade, we must beg the world not to think that American legislators are entirely destitute of humanity, as might perhaps be unfairly inferred from the great efforts made in our national body to protect and perpetrate this species of traffic. Who does not know how our great men are outdoing themselves in declaiming against the foreign slave trade? There are a perfect host of Clarksons and Wilberforces risen up among us on that subject, most edifying to hear and behold. Trading Negroes from Africa, dear reader, is so horrid, it is not to be thought of. But trading them from Kentucky, that's quite another thing. Footnote Thomas Clarkson, 1760 to 1846 and William Wilberforce, 1759 to 1833, English philanthropists and anti-slavery agitators who helped to secure passage of the Emancipation Bill by Parliament in 1833. End of chapter 12of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lorraine Paquette. Chapter 13. The Quaker Settlement. A quiet scene now rises before us. A large, roomy, neatly painted kitchen, its yellow floor glossy and smooth and without a particle of dust. A neat, well-blacked cooking stove, rows of shining tin suggestive of unmentionable good things to the appetite glossy green wood chairs old and firm a small flag-bottomed rocking-chair with a patchwork cushion in it neatly contrived out of small pieces of different coloured woollen goods and a larger sized one motherly and old whose wide arms breathed hospitable invitation seconded by the solicitation of its feather cushions a real comfortable persuasive old chair and worth in the way of honest homely enjoyment a dozen of your plush or brochetel drawing-room gentry and in the chair gently swaying back and forth her eyes bent on some fine sewing sat our fine old friend eliza yes there she is paler and thinner than in her kentucky home with a world of quiet sorrow lying under the shadow of her long eyelashes and marking the outline of her gentle mouth it was plain to see how old and firm the girlish heart was grown under the discipline of heavy sorrow and when anon her large dark eye was raised to follow the gambols of her little harry who was sporting like some tropical butterfly hither and thither over the floor she showed a depth of firmness and steady resolve that was never there in her earlier and happier days by her side sat a woman with a bright tin pan in her lap into which she was carefully sorting some dried peaches she might be fifty-five or sixty but hers was one of those faces that time seems to touch only to brighten and adorn the snowy lisp crepe cap made after the straight quaker pattern the plain white muslin handkerchief lying in placid folds across her bosom the drab shawl and dress showed at once the community to which she belonged her face was round and rosy with a healthful downy softness suggestive of a ripe peach her hair partially silvered by age was parted smoothly back from a high placid forehead on which time had written no inscription except peace on earth good will to men 
and beneath shone a large pair of clear honest loving brown eyes you only needed to look straight into them to feel that you saw to the bottom of a heart as good and true as ever throbbed in a woman's bosom so much has been said and sung of beautiful young girls why don't somebody wake up to the beauty of old women if any want to get up an inspiration under this head we refer them to our good friend rachel halliday just as she sits there in her little rocking chair it had a turn for quacking and squeaking that chair had either from having taken cold in early life or from some asthmatic affection or perhaps from nervous derangement but as she gently swung backward and forward the chair kept up a kind of subdued creechy crotchy which would have been intolerable in any other chair but old simeon halliday often declared it was as good as any music to him and the children all avowed that they wouldn't miss of hearing mother's chair for anything in the world for why for twenty years or more nothing but loving words and gentle moralities and motherly loving kindness had come from that chair headaches and heartaches innumerable had been cured there difficulties spiritual and temporal solved there all by one good loving woman god bless her and so thee still thinks of going to canada eliza she said as she was quietly looking over her peaches yes ma'am said eliza firmly i must go onward i dare not stop and what'll thee do when thee gets there thee must think about that my daughter my daughter came naturally from the lips of rachel halliday for hers was just the face and form that made mother seem the most natural word in the world eliza's hands trembled and some tears fell on her fine work but she answered firmly i shall do anything i can i hope i can find something thee knows thee can stay here as long as thee pleases said rachel oh thank you said eliza but she pointed to harry i can't sleep nights i can't rest last night i dreamed i saw that man coming into the yard she said shuddering poor child said rachel wiping her eyes but thee mustn't feel so the lord hath ordered it so that never hath a fugitive been stolen from our village i trust thine will not be the first the door here opened and a little short round pincushy woman stood at the door with a cheery blooming face like a ripe apple she was dressed like rachel in sober grey with the muslin folded neatly across her round plump little chest ruth steadman said rachel coming joyfully forward how is thee ruth she said hardly taking both her hands nicely said ruth taking off her little drab bonnet and dusting it with her handkerchief displaying as she did a round little head on which the quaker cap sat with a sort of jaunty air despite all the stroking and patting of the small fat hands which were busily applied to arranging it certain stray locks of decidedly curly hair too had escaped here and there and had to be coaxed and cajoled into their place again and then the newcomer who might have been five and twenty turned from the small looking-glass before which she had been making these arrangements and looked well pleased as most people who looked at her might have been for she was decidedly a wholesome whole-hearted chirruping little woman as ever gladdened a man's heart with all ruth this friend is eliza harris and this is the little boy i spoke thee of i am glad to see thee eliza very said ruth shaking hands as if eliza were an old friend she had long been expecting and this is thy dear boy i brought a cake for him she said holding out a little heart to the boy who came up gazing through his curls and accepted it shyly where's thy baby ruth said rachel oh he's coming but thy mary caught him as i came in and ran off with him to the barn to show him to the children at this moment the door opened and mary an honest rosy-looking girl with large brown eyes like her mother's came in with the baby 
Aha, said Rachel, coming up and taking the great white fat fellow in her arms. How good he looks! And how he does grow! To be sure he does, said little bustling Ruth, as she took the child and began taking off a little blue silk hood and various layers and wrappers of outer garments. And having given a twitch here and a pull there, and variously adjusted and arranged him and kissed him heartily, she set him on the floor to collect his thoughts. Baby seemed quite used to this mode of proceeding, for he put his thumb in his mouth, as if it were quite a thing, of course, and seemed soon absorbed in his own reflections, while the mother seated herself and taking out a long stocking of mixed blue and white yarn, began to knit with briskness. Mary, they'd better fill the kettle, hadn't they? gently suggested the mother. Mary took the kettle to the well, and soon, reappearing, placed it over the stove, where it was soon purring and steaming, a sort of censer of hospitality and good cheer. The peaches, moreover, in obedience to a few gentle whispers from Rachel, were soon deposited by the same hand in a stew pan over the fire. Rachel now took down a snowy moulding board, and tying on an apron, proceeded quietly to making up some biscuits first saying to mary mary hadn't thee better tell john to get a chicken ready and mary disappeared accordingly and how is abigail peters said rachel as she went on with her biscuits oh she's better said ruth i was in this morning made the bed tidied up the house leah hills went in this afternoon and baked bread and pies enough to last some days and i engaged to go back to get her up this evening I will go in to-morrow and do any cleaning there may be, and look over the mending, said Rachel. Ah, oh, that is well, said Ruth. I've heard, she added, that Hannah Stanwood is sick. John was up there last night. I must go there to-morrow. John can come in here to his meals if thee needs to stay all day, suggested Rachel. Thank thee, Rachel. We'll see to-morrow. But here comes Simeon. Simeon Halliday, a tall, straight, muscular man, in drab coat and pantaloons and broad-brimmed hat, now entered. "'How is thee, Ruth?' he said warmly, as he spread his broad, open hand for her little fat palm. "'And how is John?' "'Oh, John is well, and all the rest of our folks,' said Ruth cheerily. "'Any news, father?' said Rachel, as she was putting her biscuits into the oven. Peter Stebbins told me that they should be along tonight with friends, said Simeon significantly, as he was washing his hands at a neat sink in a little back porch. Indeed, said Rachel, looking thoughtfully and glancing at Eliza. Did thee say thy name was Harris? said Simeon to Eliza, as he re-entered. Rachel glanced quickly at her husband as Eliza tremulously answered, Yes her fears ever uppermost, suggesting that possibility there might be advertisements out for her. Mother, said Simeon, standing in the porch and calling Rachel out. What does thee want, father? said Rachel, rubbing her flowery hands as she went into the porch. This child's husband is in the settlement and will be here tonight, said Simeon. Now thee doesn't say that, father said Rachel, all her face radiant with joy. It's really true. Peter was down yesterday with the wagon to the other stand, and there he found an old woman and two men, and one said his name was George Harris, and from what he told of his history, I am certain who he is. He is a bright, likely fellow, too. Shall we tell her now? said Simeon. Let's tell Ruth, said Rachel. Here, Ruth, come here. Ruth laid down her knitting work and was in the back porch in a moment. Ruth, what does thee think? said Rachel. Father says Eliza's husband is in the last company and will be here tonight. A burst of joy from the little Quakeress interrupted the speech. She gave such a bound from the floor as she clapped her little hands that two stray curls fell from under her Quaker cap and lay brightly on her white neckerchief. Hush thee, dear, said Rachel gently. Hush, Ruth, tell us, shall we tell her now? Now, to be sure, this very minute. Why, now, suppose twas my John, how should I feel? Do tell her right off. 
Thee uses thyself only to learn how to love thy neighbor, Ruth, said Simeon, looking with a beaming face on Ruth. To be sure, isn't it what we are made for? If I didn't love John and the baby, I should not know how to feel for her. Come now, do tell her, do, and she laid her hands persuasively on Rachel's arm. Take her into thy bedroom there, and let me fry the chicken while thee does it. Rachel came out into the kitchen, where Eliza was sewing, and opening the door of a small bedroom, said gently, Come in here with me, my daughter. I have news to tell thee. The blood flushed in Eliza's pale face. She rose trembling with nervous anxiety and looked toward her boy. No, no, said little Ruth, darting up and seizing her hands. Never thee fear. It's good news, Eliza. Go in, go in. And she gently pushed her to the door, which closed after her. And then, turning round, she caught little Harry in her arms and began kissing him. Thee'll see thy father, little one, does thee know it? Thy father is coming, she said, over and over again, as the boy looked wonderingly at her. Meanwhile, within the door, another scene was going on. Rachel Halliday drew Eliza toward her and said, The Lord hath had mercy on thee, daughter. Thy husband hath escaped from the house of bondage. The blood rushed to Eliza's cheek in a sudden glow and went back to her heart with as sudden a rush. She sat down pale and faint. Have courage, child, said Rachel, laying her hand on her head. He is among friends who will bring him here tonight. Tonight, Eliza repeated. Tonight? The words lost all meaning to her. Her head was dreamy and confused. All was missed for a moment. When she awoke, she found herself snugly tucked up on the bed with a blanket over her and little Ruth rubbing her hands with camphor. She opened her eyes in a state of dreamy, delicious languor, such as one who has long been bearing a heavy load and now feels it gone and would rest. The tension of the nerves, which had never ceased a moment since the first hour of her flight, had given way and a strange feeling of security and rest came over her and as she lay with her large dark eyes open she followed as in a quiet dream the motions of those about her she saw the door open into the other room saw the supper table with its snowy cloth heard the dreamy murmur of the singing tea kettle saw ruth tripping backward and forward with plates of cake and saucers of preserves and ever and anon stopping to put a cake into harry's hand or pat his head, or twine his long curls round her snowy fingers. She saw the ample motherly form of Rachel as she ever and anon came to the bedside and smoothed and arranged something about the bedclothes, and gave a tuck here and there by way of expressing her good will, and was conscious of a kind of sunshine beaming down upon her from her large, clear brown eyes. She saw Ruth's husband come in, saw her fly up to him and commence whispering very earnestly ever and anon with impressive gesture pointing her little finger toward the room she saw her with the baby in her arms sitting down to tea she saw them all at table and little harry in a high chair under the shadow of rachel's ample wing there were low murmurs of talk gentle tinkling of teaspoons and musical clatter of cups and saucers and all mingled in a delightful dream of rest. And Eliza slept as she had not slept before, since the fearful midnight hour when she had taken her child and fled through the frosty starlight. She dreamed of a beautiful country, a land, it seemed to her, of rest, green shores, pleasant islands, and beautifully glittering water, and there in a house which kind voices told her was a home, she saw her boy playing free and happy child she heard her husband's footsteps she felt him coming nearer his arms were around her his tears falling on her face and she awoke it was no dream the daylight had long faded her child lay calmly sleeping by her side a candle was burning dimly on the stand and her husband was sobbing by her pillow the next morning was a cheerful one at the Quaker house. 
mother was up betimes and surrounded by busy girls and boys whom we had scarce time to introduce to our readers yesterday and who all moved obediently to rachel's gentle thee had better or more gentle hadn't thee better in the work of getting breakfast for a breakfast in the luxurious valleys of indiana is a thing complicated and multiform and like picking up the rose leaves and trimming the bushes in paradise asking other hands than those of the original mother while therefore john ran to the spring for fresh water and simeon the second sifted meal for corn cakes and mary ground coffee rachel moved gently and quietly about making biscuits cutting up chicken and diffusing a sort of sunny radiance over the whole proceeding generally if there was any danger of friction or collision from the ill-regulated seal of so many young operators her gentle come come or i wouldn't now was quite sufficient to allay the difficulty bards have written of the cestus of venus who turned the heads of all the world in successive generations we had rather for our part have the cestus of rachel halliday that kept heads from being turned and made everything go on harmoniously we think it is more suited to our modern days decidedly while all other preparations were going on simeon the elder stood in his shirt sleeves before a little looking-glass in the corner engaged in the anti-patriarchal operation of shaving everything went on so sociably so quietly so harmoniously in the great kitchen it seemed so pleasant to every one to do just what they were doing there was such an atmosphere of mutual confidence and good fellowship everywhere even the knives and forks had a social clatter as they went on to the table and the chicken and ham had a cheerful and joyous fizzle in the pan as if they rather enjoyed being cooked than otherwise and when george and eliza and little harry came out they met such a hearty rejoicing welcome no wonder it seemed to them like a dream at last they were all seated at breakfast while mary stood at the stove baking griddle cakes which as they gained the true exact golden brown tint of perfection were transferred quite handily to the table rachel never looked so truly and benignly happy as at the head of her table there was so much motherliness and full-heartedness even in the way she passed a plate of cakes or poured a cup of coffee that it seemed to put a spirit into the food and drink she offered it was the first time that ever george had sat down on equal terms at any white man's table and he sat down at first with some constraint and awkwardness but they all exhaled and went off like fog in the genial morning rays of this simple overflowing kindness this indeed was a home home a word that george had never yet known a meaning for and a belief in god and trust in his providence began to encircle his heart as with a golden cloud of protection and confidence dark misanthropic pining atheistic doubts and fierce despair melted away before the light of a living gospel breathed in living faces preached by a thousand unconscious acts of love and goodwill which like the cup of cold water given in the name of a disciple shall never lose their reward father what if thee should get found out again said simeon second as he buttered his cake i shall pay my fine said simeon quietly but what if they put thee in prison couldn't thee and mother manage the farm said simeon smiling mother can do almost everything said the boy but isn't it a shame to make such laws thee mustn't speak evil of thy rulers simeon said his father gravely the lord only gives us our worldly goods that we may do justice and mercy if our rulers require a price of us for it we must deliver it up well i hate those old slaveholders said the boy who felt as unchristian as became any modern reformer i am surprised at thee son said simeon thy mother never taught thee so 
I would do even the same for the slaveholder as for the slave, if the Lord brought him to my door in affliction. Simeon second blushed scarlet, but his mother only smiled and said, Simeon is my good boy. He will grow older by and by, and then he will be like his father. I hope, my good sir, that you are not exposed to any difficulty on our account, said George anxiously. Fear nothing, George, for therefore are we sent into the world. If we would not meet trouble for a good cause, we were not worthy of our name. But for me, said George, I could not bear it. Fear not then, friend George, it is not for thee, but for God and man we do it, said Simeon. And now thou must lie by quietly this day, and to-night, at ten o'clock, Phineas Fletcher will carry thee onward to the next stand, thee and the rest of thy company. The pursuers are hard after thee, we must not delay. If that is the case, why wait till evening? said George. Thou art safe here by daylight, for every one in the settlement is a friend, and all are watching. It has been found safer to travel by night. End of chapter 13「fourteen of Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Lorraine Paquette. Chapter fourteen. Evangeline. A young star which shone o'er life, too sweet an image for such glass. A lovely being, scarcely formed or moulded, a rose with all its sweetest leaves yet folded. The Mississippi. How, as by an enchanted wand, have its scenes been changed since Chateaubriand wrote his prose poetic description of it as a river of mighty unbroken solitudes, rolling amid undreamed wonders of vegetable and animal existence. But as in an hour this river of dreams and wild romance has emerged to a reality scarcely less visionary and splendid, what other river of the world beats on its bosom to the ocean the wealth and enterprise of such another country a country whose products embrace all between the tropics and the poles those turbid waters hurrying foaming tearing along an apt resemblance of that headlong tide of business which is poured along its wave by a race more vehement and energetic than any of the old world ever saw ah would that they did not also bear along a more fearful freight the tears of the oppressed the sighs of the helpless the bitter prayers of poor ignorant hearts to an unknown god unknown unseen and silent but who will yet come out of his place to save all the poor of the earth the slanting light of the setting sun quivers on the sea-like expanse of the river the shimmering canes and the tall dark cypress hung with wreaths of dark funereal moss glow in the golden ray as the heavily laden steamboat marches onward piled with cotton bales from many a plantation up over deck and sides till she seems in the distance a square massive block of grey she moves heavily onward to the nearing mart we must look some time among its crowded decks before we shall find again our humble friend tom high on the upper deck in a little nook among the everywhere predominant cotton bales at last we may find him partly from confidence inspired by mr shelby's representations and partly from the remarkably inoffensive and quiet character of the man tom has insensibly won his way far into the confidence even of such a man as Haley. At first he had watched him narrowly through the day, and never allowed him to sleep at night unfettered. But the uncomplaining patience and apparent contentment of Tom's manner led him gradually to discontinue these restraints. And for some time Tom had enjoyed a sort of parole of honour, being permitted to come and go freely where he pleased on the boat. Ever quiet and obliging, and more than ready to lend a hand in every emergency which occurred among the workmen below he had won the good opinion of all the hands 
and spent many hours in helping them with as hearty a good will as ever he worked on a kentucky farm when there seemed to be nothing for him to do he would climb to a nook among the cotton bales of the upper deck and busy himself in studying over his bible and it is there we see him now for a hundred or more miles above new orleans the river is higher than the surrounding country and rolls its tremendous volume between massive levees twenty feet in height the traveller from the deck of the steamer as from some floating castle top overlooks the whole country for miles and miles around tom therefore had spread out full before him in plantation after plantation a map of the life to which he was approaching he saw the distant slaves at their toil he saw far their villages of huts gleaming out in long rows on many a plantation distant from the stately mansions and pleasure grounds of the master and as the moving picture passed on his poor foolish heart would be turning backward to the kentucky farm with its old shadowy beeches to the master's house with its wide cool halls and near by the little cabin overgrown with the multiflora and bignonia there he seemed to see familiar faces of comrades who had grown up with him from infancy he saw his busy wife bustling in her preparations for his evening meals he heard the merry laugh of his boys at their play and the chirrup of the baby at his knee and then with a start all faded and he saw again the cane brakes and cypresses and gliding plantations and heard again the creaking and groaning of the machinery all telling him too plainly that all that phase of life had gone by for ever in such a case you write to your wife and send messages to your children but tom could not write the mail for him had no existence and the gulf of separation was unbridged by even a friendly word or signal is it strange then that some tears fall on the pages of his bible as he lays it on the cotton bale and with patient finger threading his slow way from word to word traces out its promises having learned late in life tom was but a slow reader and passed on laboriously from verse to verse fortunate for him was it that the book he was intent on was one which slow reading cannot injure nay one whose words like ingots of gold seem often to need to be weighed separately that the mind may take in their priceless value let us follow him a moment as pointing to each word and pronouncing each half aloud he reads let not your heart be troubled in my father's house are many mansions i go to prepare a place for you cicero when he buried his darling and only daughter had a heart as full of honest grief as poor tom's perhaps no fuller for both were only men but cicero could pause over no such sublime words of hope and look to no such future reunion and if he had seen them ten to one he would not have believed he must fill his head first with a thousand questions of authenticity of manuscript and correctness of translation but to poor tom there it lay just what he needed so evidently true and divine that the possibility of a question never entered his simple head it must be true for if not true how could he live as for tom's bible though it had no annotations and helps in margin from learned commentators still it had been embellished with certain waymarks and guideboards of tom's own invention and which helped him more than the most learned expositions could have done it had been his custom to get the bible read to him by his master's children in particular by young master george and as they read he would designate by bold strong marks and dashes with pen and ink the passages which most particularly gratified his ear or affected his heart his bible was thus marked through from one end to the other with a variety of styles and designations so he could in a moment seize upon his favourite passages without the labour of spelling out what lay between them 
and while it lay there before him every passage breathing of some old home scene and recalling some past enjoyment his bible seemed to him all of this life that remained as well as the promise of a future one among the passengers on the boat was a young gentleman of fortune and family resident in new orleans who bore the name of st clair he had with him a daughter between five and six years of age together with a lady who seemed to claim relationship to both and to have the little one especially under her charge tom had often caught glimpses of this little girl for she was one of those busy tripping creatures that can be no more contained in one place than a sunbeam or a summer breeze nor was she one that once seen could be easily forgotten her form was the perfection of childish beauty without its usual chubbiness and squareness of outline there was about it an undulating and aerial grace such as one might dream of for some mythic and allegorical being her face was remarkable less for its perfect beauty of feature than for a singular and dreamy earnestness of expression which made the ideal start when they looked at her and by which the dullest and most literal were impressed without exactly knowing why the shape of her head and the turn of her neck and bust was peculiarly noble and the long golden-brown hair that floated like a cloud around it the deep spiritual gravity of her violet-blue eyes shaded by heavy fringes of golden-brown all marked her out from other children and made every one turn and look after her as she glided hither and thither on the boat nevertheless the little one was not what you would have called either a grave child or a sad one on the contrary an airy and innocent playfulness seemed to flicker like the shadow of summer leaves over her childish face and around her buoyant figure she was always in motion always with a half smile on her rosy mouth flying hither and thither with an undulating and cloud-like tread singing to herself as she moved as in a happy dream her father and female guardian were incessantly busy in pursuit of her but when caught she melted from them again like a summer cloud and as no word of chiding or reproof ever fell on her ear for whatever she chose to do she pursued her own way all over the boat always dressed in white she seemed to move like a shadow through all sorts of places without contracting spot or stain and there was not a corner or nook above or below where those fairy footsteps had not glided and that visionary golden head with its deep blue eyes fleeted along the fireman as he looked up from his sweaty toil sometimes found those eyes looking wonderingly into the raging depths of the furnace and fearfully and pityingly at him as if she thought him in some dreadful danger anon the steersman at the wheel paused and smiled as the pitcher-like head gleamed through the window of the round house and in a moment was gone again a thousand times a day rough voices blessed her and smiles of unwonted softness stole over hard faces as she passed and when she tripped fearlessly over dangerous places rough sooty hands were stretched involuntarily out to save her and smooth her path tom who had the soft impressionable nature of his kindly race ever yearning toward the simple and childlike watched the little creature with daily increasing interest to him she seemed something almost divine and whenever her golden head and deep blue eyes peered out upon him from behind some dusky cotton bale or looked down upon him over some ridge of packages he half believed that he saw one of the angels stepped out of his new testament often and often she walked mournfully round the place where haley's gang of men and women sat in their chains she would glide in among them and look at them with an air of perplexed and sorrowful earnestness and sometimes she would lift their chains with her slender hands and then sigh woefully as she glided away several times she appeared suddenly among them with her hands full of candy nuts and oranges which she would distribute joyfully to them and then be gone again tom watched the little lady a great deal before he ventured on any overtures toward acquaintanceship he knew an abundance of simple acts to propitiate and invite the approaches of the little people and he resolved to play his part right skilfully 
he could cut cunning little baskets out of cherry stones could make grotesque faces on hickory nuts or odd jumping figures out of elder pith and he was a very pan in the manufacture of whistles of all sizes and sorts his pockets were full of miscellaneous articles of attraction which he had hoarded in days of old for his master's children and which he now produced with commendable prudence and economy one by one as overtures for acquaintance and friendship the little one was shy for all her busy interest in everything going on and it was not easy to tame her for a while she would perch like a canary bird on some box or package near tom while busy in the little arts forenamed and take from him with a kind of grave bashfulness the little articles he offered but at last they got on quite confidential terms what's the little missy's name said tom at last when he thought matters were ripe to push such an inquiry evangeline st clair said the little one though papa and everybody else call me eva now what's your name my name's tom the little chillin used to call me uncle tom way back thar in kentuck then i mean to call you uncle tom because you see i like you said eva so uncle tom where are you going i don't know miss eva don't know said eva no i am going to be sold to somebody i don't know who my papa can buy you said eva quickly and if he buys you you will have good times i mean to ask him this very day thank you my little lady said tom the boat here stopped at a small landing to take in wood and eva hearing her father's voice bounded nimbly away tom rose up and went forward to offer his service in wooding and soon was busy among the hands eva and her father were standing together by the railings to see the boat start from the landing place the wheel had made two or three revolutions in the water when by some sudden movement the little one suddenly lost her balance and fell sheer over the side of the boat into the water her father scarce knowing what he did was plunging in after her but was held back by some behind him who saw that more efficient aid had followed his child tom was standing just under her on the lower deck as she fell he saw her strike the water and sink and was after her in a moment a broad-chested strong-armed fellow it was nothing for him to keep afloat in the water till in a moment or two the child rose to the surface and he caught her in his arms and swimming with her to the boat side handed her up all dripping to the grasp of hundreds of hands which as if they had all belonged to one man were stretched eagerly out to receive her a few moments more and her father bore her dripping and senseless to the ladies cabin where as is usual in cases of the kind there ensued a very well-meaning and kind-hearted strife among the female occupants generally as to who should do the most things to make a disturbance and to hinder her recovery in every way possible it was a sultry close day the next day as the steamer drew near to new orleans a general bustle of expectation and preparation was spread through the boat in the cabin one and another were gathering their things together and arranging them preparatory to going ashore the steward and chambermaid and all were busily engaged in cleaning furbishing and arranging the splendid boat preparatory to a grand entry on the lower deck sat our friend tom with his arms folded and anxiously from time to time turning his eyes toward a group on the other side of the boat there stood the fair evangeline a little paler than the day before but otherwise exhibiting no traces of the accident which had befallen her a graceful elegantly formed young man stood by her carelessly leaning one elbow on a bale of cotton while a large pocket-book lay open before him it was quite evident at a glance that the gentleman was eva's father there was the same noble cast of head the same large blue eyes the same golden-brown hair yet the expression was wholly different in the large clear blue eyes though in form and colour exactly similar there was wanting that misty dreamy depth of expression 
all was clear bold and bright but with a light wholly of this world the beautifully cut mouth had a proud and somewhat sarcastic expression while an air of free and easy superiority sat not ungracefully in every turn and movement of his fine form he was listening with a good-humoured negligent air half comic half contemptuous to Haley who was very volubly expatiating on the quality of the article for which they were bargaining. All the moral and Christian virtues bound in black Morocco complete, he said, when Haley had finished. Well now, my good fellow, what's the damage, as they say in Kentucky? In short, what's to be paid out for this business? How much are you going to cheat me now? Out with it. Well, said Haley, if I should say thirteen hundred dollars for that air fellow, I shouldn't but just save myself. I shouldn't now, really. Poor fellow, said the young man, fixing his keen, mocking blue eyes on him. But I suppose you'd let me have him for that, out of a particular regard for me. Well, the young lady here seems to be sought on him, and naturally enough. Oh, certainly there's a call on your benevolence, my friend. Now, as a matter of Christian charity, how cheap could you afford to let him go? to oblige a young lady that's particular sought on him. Well, now, just think on't, said the trader. Just look at them limbs, broad-chested, strong as a horse. Look at his head, them high foreheads, all his shows calculatin' niggers. That'll do any kind of thing. I've marked that air. Now a nigger of that air heft and build is worth considerable, just as you may say for his body supposin he's stupid but come to put in his calculatin faculties and them which i can show he has on common why of course it makes him come higher why that air fellow managed his master's whole farm he has a stronary talent for business bad bad very bad knows altogether too much said the young man with the same mocking smile playing about his mouth never will do in the world your smart fellows are always running off stealing horses and raising the devil generally i think you'll have to take off a couple of hundred for his smartness well there might be something in that air if it warn't for his character but i can show recommends from his master and others to prove he is one of your real pious the most humble prayin' pious critter you ever did see why he's been called a preacher in them parts he came from and i might use him for a family chaplain possibly added the young man dryly that's quite an idea religion is a remarkably scarce article at our house you're joking now how do you know i am didn't you just warrant him for a preacher has he been examined by any synod or council come hand over your papers if the trader had not been sure by a certain good-humoured twinkle in the large eye that all this banter was sure in the long run to turn out a cash concern he might have been somewhat out of patience as it was he laid down a greasy pocket-book on the cotton bales and began anxiously studying over certain papers in it the young man standing by the while looking down on him with an air of careless easy drollery papa do buy him it's no matter what you pay whispered eva softly getting up on a package and putting her arm around her father's neck you have money enough i know I want him. What for, pussy? Are you going to use him for a rattle box or a rocking horse or what? I want to make him happy. An original reason, certainly. Here the trader handed up a certificate signed by Mr. Shelby, which the young man took with the tips of his long fingers and glanced over carelessly. A gentlemanly hand, he said, and well spelt, too. Well, now. But I'm not sure, after all, about this religion, said he, the old wicked expression returning to his eye. The country is almost ruined with pious white people. Such pious politicians as we have just before elections. Such pious goings-on in all departments of church and state that a fellow does not know who'll cheat him next. I don't know either about religions being up in the market just now. I have not looked in the papers lately to see how much it sells how many hundred dollars now do you put on for this religion you like to be joking now said the trader 
but then there's sense under all that air i know there's differences in religion some kinds is miserable there's your meetin pious there's your singin roarin pious them air ain't no account in black or white but these rarely is and i've seen it in niggers as often as any your rail softly quiet stiddy honest pious that the hull world couldn't tempt em to do nothing that they thinks is wrong and ye see in this letter what tom's old master says about him now said the young man stooping gravely over his book of bills if you can assure me that i can really buy this kind of pious and that it will be set down to my account in the book up above as something belonging to me i wouldn't care if i did go a little extra for it how do you say well really i can't do that said the trader i'm a thinkin that every man'll have to hang on his own hook in them air quarters rather hard on a fellow that pays extra on religion and can't trade with it in the state where he wants it most ain't it now said the young man who had been making out a roll of bills while he was speaking there count your money old boy he added as he handed the roll to the trader all right said haley his face beaming with delight and pulling out an old inkhorn he proceeded to fill out a bill of sale which in a few moments he handed to the young man i wonder now if i was divided up and inventoried said the latter as he ran over the paper how much i might bring say so much for the shape of my head so much for a high forehead so much for arms and hands and legs and then so much for education learning talent honesty religion bless me there would be small charge on that last i'm thinking but come eva he said and taking the hand of his daughter he stepped across the boat and carelessly putting the tip of his fingers under tom's chin said good-humouredly look up tom and see how you like your new master tom looked up it was not in nature to look into that gay young handsome face without a feeling of pleasure and tom felt the tears start in his eyes as he said heartily god bless you master well i hope he will what's your name tom quite as likely to do it for your asking as mine from all accounts can you drive horses tom i've been always used to horses said tom master shelby raised heaps of em well i think i shall put you in coachy on condition that you won't be drunk more than once a week unless in cases of emergency tom tom looked surprised and rather hurt and said i never drink master i've heard that story before tom but then we'll see it will be a special accommodation to all concerned if you don't never mind my boy he added good-humouredly seeing tom still looked grave i don't doubt you mean to do well i sartin do master said tom and you shall have good times said eva papa is very good to everybody only he always will laugh at them papa is much obliged to you for his recommendation said st clair laughing as he turned on his heel and walked away end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of uncle tom's cabin by harriet beecher stowe this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by lorraine paquette chapter fifteen of tom's new master and various other matters since the thread of our humble hero's life has now become interwoven with that of higher ones it is necessary to give some brief introduction to them augustine st clair was the son of a wealthy planter of louisiana the family had its origin in canada of two brothers very similar in temperament and character one had settled on a flourishing farm in vermont and the other became an opulent planter in louisiana the mother of augustine was a huguenot french lady whose family had emigrated to louisiana during the days of its early settlement augustine and another brother were the only children of their parents having inherited from his mother an exceeding delicacy of constitution he was at the instance of physicians during many years of his boyhood sent to the care of his uncle in vermont 
in order that his constitution might be strengthened by the cold of a more bracing climate. In childhood he was remarkable for an extreme and marked sensitiveness of character, more akin to the softness of woman than the ordinary hardness of his own sex. Time, however, overgrew this softness with the rough bark of manhood, and but few knew how living and fresh it still lay at the core. His talents were of the very first order, although his mind showed a preference always for the ideal and the ascetic, and there was about him the repugnance to the actual business of life which is the common result of this balance of the faculties. Soon after the completion of his college course, his whole nature was kindled into one intense and passionate effervescence of romantic passion. His hour came, the hour that comes only once. His star rose in the horizon, that star that rises so often in vain to be remembered only as a thing of dreams, and it rose for him in vain. To drop the figure, he saw and won the love of a high-minded and beautiful woman in one of the northern states, and they were affianced. He returned south to make arrangements for their marriage, when, most unexpectedly, his letters were returned to him by mail, with a short note from her guardian, stating to him that ere this reached him, the lady would be the wife of another. Stung to madness, he vainly hoped, as many another has done, to fling the whole thing from his heart by one desperate effort, too proud to supplicate or seek explanation he threw himself at once into a whirl of fashionable society and in a fortnight from the time of the fatal letter was the accepted lover of the reigning belle of the season and as soon as arrangements could be made he became the husband of a fine figure a pair of bright dark eyes and a hundred thousand dollars and of course every one thought him a happy fellow the married couple were enjoying their honeymoon and entertaining a brilliant circle of friends in their splendid villa near Lake Pontchartrain, when one day a letter was brought to him in that well-remembered writing. It was handed to him while he was in full tide of gay and successful conversation in a whole roomful of company. He turned deadly pale when he saw the writing, but still preserved his composure and finished the playful warfare of badinage which he was at the moment carrying on with a lady opposite, and a short time after was missed from the circle. In his room alone he opened and read the letter, now worse than idle and useless to be read. It was from her, giving a long account of a persecution to which she had been exposed by her guardian's family, to lead her to unite herself with their son and she related how, for a long time, his letters had ceased to arrive, how she had written time and again, till she became weary and doubtful, how her health had failed under her anxieties, and how at last she had discovered the whole fraud which had been practised on them both. The letter ended with expressions of hope and thankfulness, and professions of undying affection, which were more bitter than death to the unhappy young man. He wrote to her immediately, I have received yours, but too late. I believed all I heard. I was desperate. I am married, and all is over. Only forget, it is all that remains for either of us. And thus ended the whole romance and ideal of life for Augustine St. Clair. But the real remained, the real, like the flat, bare, oozy tide mud when the blue sparkling wave with all its company of gliding boats and white-winged ships, its music of oars and chiming waters, has gone down, and there it lies, flat, slimy, bare, exceedingly real. Of course, in a novel, people's hearts break, and they die, and that is the end of it, and in a story this is very convenient. But in real life we do not die, when all that makes life bright dies to us. There is a most busy and important round of eating, drinking, dressing, walking, visiting, buying, selling, talking, reading, and all that makes up what is commonly called living, yet to be gone through, 
and this yet remained to Augustine. Had his wife been a whole woman, she might yet have done something, as woman can, to mend the broken threads of life and weave again into a tissue of brightness. But Marie St. Clair could not even see that they had been broken. As before stated, she consisted of a fine figure, a pair of splendid eyes, and a hundred thousand dollars, and none of these items were precisely the ones to minister to a mind diseased. When Augustine, pale as death, was found lying on the sofa, and pleaded sudden sick headache as the cause of his distress, she recommended to him to smell of hartshorn, and when the paleness and headache came on week after week, she only said that she never thought Mr. St. Clair was sickly, but it seems he was very liable to sick headaches, and that it was a very unfortunate thing for her, because he didn't enjoy going into company with her, and it seemed odd to go so much alone when they were just married. Augustine was glad in his heart that he had married so undiscerning a woman, but as the glosses and civilities of the honeymoon wore away, he discovered that a beautiful young woman, who has lived all her life to be caressed and waited on, might prove quite a hard mistress in domestic life. Marie never had possessed much capability of affection, or much sensibility, and the little that she had had been merged into a most intense and unconscious selfishness, a selfishness the more hopeless from its quiet obtuseness, its utter ignorance of any claims but her own. From her infancy she had been surrounded with servants who lived only to study her caprices. The idea that they had either feelings or rights had never dawned upon her, even in distant perspective. Her father, whose only child she had been, had never denied her anything that lay within the compass of human possibility. And when she entered life, beautiful, accomplished, and an heiress, she had, of course, all the eligibles and non-eligibles of the other sex, sighing at her feet, and she had no doubt that Augustine was a most fortunate man in having obtained her. It is a great mistake to suppose that a woman with no heart will be an easy creditor in the exchange of affection. There is not on earth a more merciless exactor of love from others than a thoroughly selfish woman and the more unlovely she grows, the more jealously and scrupulously she exacts love to the uttermost farthing. When, therefore, St. Clair began to drop off those gallantries and small attentions which flowed at first through the habitude of courtship, he found his sultana no way ready to resign her slave. There were abundance of tears, poutings, and small tempests. There were discontents, pinings, upbraidings. St. Clair was good-natured and self-indulgent, and sought to buy off with presents and flatteries, and when Marie became mother to a beautiful daughter, he really felt awakened, for a time, to something like tenderness. St. Clair's mother had been a woman of uncommon elevation and purity of character, and he gave to his child his mother's name, fondly fancying that she would prove a reproduction of her image. The thing had been remarked with petulant jealousy by his wife, and she regarded her husband's absorbing devotion to the child with suspicion and dislike. All that was given to her seemed so much taken from herself. From the time of the birth of this child, her health gradually sunk. A life of constant inaction, bodily and mental, the friction of ceaseless ennui and discontent, united with the ordinary weakness which attended the period of maternity, in course of a few years changed the blooming young Belle into a yellow, faded, sickly woman, whose time was divided among a variety of fanciful diseases, and who considered herself in every sense the most ill-used and suffering person in existence. There was no end of her various complaints, but her principal forte appeared to lie in sick headache, which sometimes would confine her to her room three days out of six. As, of course, all family arrangements fell into the hands of servants, St. Clair found his menage anything but comfortable. 
his only daughter was exceedingly delicate and he feared that with no one to look after her and attend to her her health and life might yet fall a sacrifice to her mother's inefficiency he had taken her with him on a tour to vermont and had persuaded his cousin miss ophelia st clair to return with him to his southern residence and they are now returning on this boat where we have introduced them to our readers and now while the distant domes and spires of new orleans rise to our view there is yet time for an introduction to miss ophelia whoever has travelled in the new england states will remember in some cool village the large farmhouse with its clean-swept grassy yard shaded by the dense and massive foliage of the sugar maple and remember the air of order and stillness a perpetuity and unchanging repose that seemed to breathe over the whole place nothing lost or out of order not a picket loose in the fence not a particle of litter in the turfy yard with its clumps of lilac bushes growing up under the windows within he will remember wide clean rooms where nothing ever seems to be doing or going to be done where everything is once and forever rigidly in place and where all household arrangements move with the punctual exactness of the old clock in the corner in the family keeping room as it is termed he will remember the staid respectable old bookcase with its glass doors where rollins history milton's paradise lost bunyan's pilgrim's progress and scott's family bible stand side by side in decorous order with multitudes of other books equally solemn and respectable there are no servants in the house but the lady in the snowy cap with the spectacles who sits sewing every afternoon among her daughters as if nothing ever had been done or were to be done she and her girls in some long-forgotten forepart of the day did up the work and for the rest of the time probably at all hours when you would see them it is done up the old kitchen floor never seems stained or spotted the tables the chairs and the various cooking utensils never seem deranged or disordered though three and sometimes four meals a day are got there though the family washing and ironing is there performed and though pounds of butter and cheese are in some silent and mysterious manner there brought into existence on such a farm in such a house and family miss ophelia had spent a quiet existence of some forty-five years when her cousin invited her to visit his southern mansion the eldest of a large family she was still considered by her father and mother as one of the children and the proposal that she should go to orleans was a most momentous one to the family circle the old grey-headed father took down morris's atlas out of the bookcase and looked out the exact latitude and longitude and read flint's travels in the south and west to make up his own mind as to the nature of the country the good mother inquired anxiously if orleans wasn't an awful wicked place saying that it seemed to her most equal to going to the sandwich islands or anywhere among the heathen it was known at the minister's and at the doctor's and at miss pibbety's milliner shop that ophelia st clair was talking about going away down to orleans with her cousin and of course the whole village could do no less than help this very important process of talking about the matter the minister who inclined strongly to abolitionist views was quite doubtful whether such a step might not tend somewhat to encourage the southerners in holding on to their slaves while the doctor who was a staunch colonizationist inclined to the opinion that miss ophelia ought to go to show the orleans people that we don't think hardly of them after all he was of opinion in fact that southern people needed encouraging when however the fact that she had resolved to go was fully before the public mind she was solemnly invited out to tea by all her friends and neighbours for the space of a fortnight and her prospects and plans duly canvassed and inquired into miss mosley who came into the house to help to do the dressmaking 
acquire daily accessions of importance from the developments with regard to Miss Ophelia's wardrobe, which she had been enabled to make. It was credibly ascertained that Squire Sinclair, as his name was commonly contracted in the neighborhood, had counted out fifty dollars and given them to Miss Ophelia and told her to buy any clothes she thought best and that two new silk dresses and a bonnet had been sent for from boston as to the propriety of this extraordinary outlay the public mind was divided some affirming that it was well enough all things considered for once in one's life and others stoutly affirming that the money had better have been sent to the missionaries but all parties agreed that there had been no such parasol seen in those parts as had been sent on from new york and that she had one silk dress that might fairly be trusted to stand alone, whatever might be said of its mistress. There were credible rumours also of a hem-stitched pocket-handkerchief, and report even went so far as to state that Miss Ophelia had one pocket-handkerchief with lace all around it. It was even added that it was worked in the corners, but this latter point was never satisfactorily ascertained and remains in fact unsettled to this day miss ophelia as you now behold her stands before you in a very shining brown linen travelling dress tall square-formed and angular her face was thin and rather sharp in its outlines the lips compressed like those of a person who is in the habit of making up her mind definitely on all subjects while the keen dark eyes had a peculiarly searching advised movement and travelled over everything as if they were looking for something to take care of all her movements were sharp decided and energetic and though she was never much of a talker her words were remarkably direct and to the purpose when she did speak in her habits she was a living impersonation of order method and exactness in punctuality she was as inevitable as a clock and as inexorable as a railroad engine and she held in most decided contempt and abomination anything of a contrary character the great sin of sins in her eyes the sum of all evils was expressed by one very common and important word in her vocabulary shiftlessness her finale and ultimatum of contempt consisted in a very emphatic pronunciation of the word shiftless and by this she characterized all modes of procedure which had not a direct and inevitable relation to accomplishment of some purpose then definitely had in mind people who did nothing or who did not know exactly what they were going to do or who did not take the most direct way to accomplish what they set their hands to were objects of her entire contempt a contempt shown less frequently by anything she said than by a kind of stony grimness as if she scorned to say anything about the matter as to mental cultivation she had a clear strong active mind was well and thoroughly read in history and the older english classics and thought with great strength within certain narrow limits her theological tenets were all made up labelled in most positive and distinct forms and put by like the bundles in her patch trunk there were just so many of them and there were never to be any more so also were her ideas with regard to most matters of practical life such as housekeeping in all its branches and the various political relations of her native village and underlying all deeper than anything else higher and broader lay the strongest principle of her being conscientiousness nowhere is conscience so dominant and all-absorbing as with new england women it is the granite formation which lies deepest and rises out even to the tops of the highest mountains miss ophelia was the absolute bond-slave of the ought once make her certain that the path of duty as she commonly phrased it lay in any given direction and fire and water could not keep her from it 
she would walk straight down into a well or up to a loaded cannon's mouth if she were only quite sure that there the path lay her standard of right was so high so all-embracing so minute and making so few concessions to human frailty that though she strove with heroic ardour to reach it she never actually did so and of course was burdened with a constant and often harassing sense of deficiency this gave a severe and somewhat gloomy cast to her religious character but how in the world can miss ophelia get along with augustine st clair gay easy unpunctual unpractical sceptical in short walking with impudent and nonchalant freedom over every one of her most cherished habits and opinions to tell the truth then miss ophelia loved him when a boy it had been hers to teach him his catechism mend his clothes comb his hair and bring him up generally in the way he should go and her heart having a warm side to it augustine had as he usually did with most people monopolized a large share of it for himself and therefore it was that he succeeded very easily in persuading her that the path of duty lay in the direction of new orleans and that she must go with him to take care of eva and keep everything from going to wreck and ruin during the frequent illnesses of his wife the idea of a house without anybody to take care of it went to her heart then she loved the lovely little girl as few could help doing and though she regarded augustine as very much of a heathen yet she loved him laughed at his jokes and forbore with his failings to an extent which those who knew him thought perfectly incredible but what more or other is to be known of miss ophelia our reader must discover by a personal acquaintance there she is sitting now in her state-room surrounded by a mixed multitude of little and big carpet-bags boxes baskets each containing some separate responsibility which she is tying binding up packing or fastening with a face of great earnestness now eva have you kept count of your things of course you haven't children never do there's the spotted carpet-bag and the little blue band box with your best bonnet that's two then the india rubber satchel is three and my tape and needle box is four and my band box five and my collar box and that little hair trunk seven what have you done with your sunshade give it to me and let me put a paper round it and tie it to my umbrella with my shade there now why auntie we are only going up home what is the use to keep it nice child people must take care of their things if they ever mean to have anything and now eva is your thimble put up really auntie i don't know well never mind i'll look your box over thimble wax two spools scissors knife tape needle all right put it in here what did you ever do child when you were coming on with only your papa i should have thought you'd a lost everything you had well auntie i did lose a great many and then when we stopped anywhere papa would buy some more of whatever it was mercy honest child what a way it was a very easy way auntie said eva it's a dreadful shiftless one said auntie why auntie what'll you do now said eva that trunk is too full to be shut down it must be shut down said auntie with an air of a general as she squeezed the things in and sprung upon the lid still a little gap remained above the mouth of the trunk get up here eva said miss ophelia courageously what has been done can be done again this trunk has got to be shut and locked there are no two ways about it and the trunk intimidated doubtless by this resolute statement gave in the hasp snapped sharply in its hole and miss ophelia turned the key and pocketed it in triumph now we're ready where's your papa i think it time this baggage was set out do look out eva 
and see if you see your papa. Oh, yes, he's down the other end of the gentleman's cabin, eating an orange. He can't know how near we are coming, said Auntie. Hadn't you better run and speak to him? Papa never is in a hurry about anything, said Eva, and we haven't come to the landing. Do step on the guards, Auntie. Look, there's our house, up that street. The boat now began with heavy groans, like some vast, tired monster, to prepare to push up among the multiplied steamers at the levee. Eva joyously pointed out the various spires, domes, and waymarks by which she recognized her native city. Yes, yes, dear, very fine, said Miss Ophelia. But mercy on us, the boat has stopped. Where is your father? And now ensued the usual turmoil of landing, waiters running twenty ways at once, men tugging trunks, carpet bags, boxes, women anxiously calling to their children, and everybody crowding in a dense mass to the plank towards the landing. Miss Ophelia seated herself resolutely on the lately vanquished trunk, and marshalling all her goods and chattels in fine military order, seemed resolved to defend them to the last. "'Shall I take your trunk, ma'am? Shall I take your baggage? Let me tend to your baggage, missus. Shan't I carry out these here, missus?' Rain down upon her unheeded. She sat with grim determination, upright as a darning needle, stuck in a board, holding on to her bundle of umbrella and parasols, and replying with a determination that was enough to strike dismay even into a hackman, wondering to Eva at every interval what on earth her papa could be thinking of. He couldn't have fallen over now, but something must have happened. And just as she had begun to work herself into real distress, he came up with his usually careless motion, and giving Eva a quarter of the orange he was eating, said, Well, Cousin Vermont, I suppose you are all ready. I've been ready waiting nearly an hour, said Miss Ophelia. I began to be really concerned about you. There's a clever fellow now, said he. Well, the carriage is waiting, and the crowd are now off, so that one can walk out in a decent and Christian manner and not be pushed and shoved. Here, he added to a driver who stood behind him, take these things. I'll go and see to his putting them in, said Miss Ophelia. Oh, pshaw, cousin, what's the use, said St. Clair. Well, at any rate, I'll carry this, and this, and this, said Miss Ophelia, singling out three boxes and a small carpet bag. My dear Miss Vermont, positively you mustn't come the green mountains over us that way. You must adopt at least a piece of a southern principle and not walk out under all that load. They'll take you for a waiting maid. Give them to this fellow. He'll put them down as if they were eggs now. Miss Ophelia looked despairingly as her cousin took all her treasures from her and rejoiced to find herself once more in the carriage with them, in a state of preservation. "'Where's Tom?' said Eva. "'Oh, he's on the outside, pussy. I'm going to take Tom up to Mother for a peace offering, to make up for that drunken fellow that upset the carriage.' "'Oh, Tom will make a splendid driver, I know,' said Eva. "'He'll never get drunk.' The carriage stopped in front of an ancient mansion, built in that odd mixture of Spanish and French style, of which there are specimens in some parts of New Orleans. It was built in the Moorish fashion, a square building enclosing a courtyard into which the carriage drove through an arched gateway. The court in the inside had evidently been arranged to gratify a picturesque and voluptuous ideality. Wide galleries ran all around the four sides, whose Moorish arches slender pillars and arabesque ornaments carried the mind back as in a dream to the reign of oriental romance in spain in the middle of the court a fountain threw high its silvery water falling in a never-ceasing spray into a marble basin fringed with a deep border of fragrant violets the water in the fountain pellucid as crystal was alive with myriads of gold and silver fishes, twinkling and darting through it 
like so many living jewels around the fountain ran a walk paved with a mosaic of pebbles laid in various fanciful patterns and this again was surrounded by turf smooth as green velvet while a carriage drive enclosed the whole two large orange trees now fragrant with blossoms threw a delicious shade and ranged in a circle round upon the turf were marble vases of arabesque sculpture containing the choicest flowering plants of the tropics huge pomegranate trees with their glossy leaves and flame-coloured flowers dark-leaved arabian jessamines with their silvery stars geraniums luxuriant roses bending beneath their heavy abundance of flowers golden jessamines lemon-scented verbenum all united their bloom and fragrance while here and there a mystic old aloe with its strange massive leaves sat looking like some old enchanter sitting in weird grandeur among the more perishable bloom and fragrance around it the galleries that surrounded the court were festooned with a curtain of some kind of moorish stuff and could be drawn down at pleasure to exclude the beams of the sun on the whole the appearance of the place was luxurious and romantic as the carriage drove in eva seemed like a bird ready to burst from a cage with the wild eagerness of her delight oh isn't it beautiful lovely my own dear darling home she said to miss ophelia isn't it beautiful tis a pretty place said miss ophelia as she alighted though it seems rather old and heathenish to me tom got down from the carriage and looked about with an air of calm still enjoyment the negro it must be remembered is an exotic of the most gorgeous and superb countries of the world and he has deep in his heart a passion for all that is splendid rich and fanciful a passion which rudely indulged by an untrained taste draws on them the ridicule of the colder and more correct white race st clair who was at heart a poetical voluptuary smiled as miss ophelia made her remark on his premises and turning to tom who was standing looking round his beaming black face perfectly radiant with admiration he said tom my boy this seems to suit you yes massa it looks about the right thing said tom all this passed in a moment while trunks were being hustled off hackmen paid and while a crowd of all ages and sizes men women and children came running through the galleries both above and below to see masser come in foremost among them was a very high-dressed young mulatto man evidently a very distinguished personage attired in the ultra extreme of the mode and gracefully waving a scented cambriac handkerchief in his hand this personage had been exerting himself with great alacrity in driving all the flock of domestics to the other end of the veranda back all of you i am ashamed of you he said in a tone of authority would you intrude on master's domestic relations in the first hour of his return all looked abashed at this elegant speech delivered with quite an air and stood huddled together at a respectful distance except two stout porters who came up and began conveying away the baggage owing to mr adolph's systematic arrangements when st clair turned round from paying the hackman there was nobody in view but mr adolph himself conspicuous in satin vest gold guard chain and white pants and bowing with inexpressible grace and suavity ah adolph is it you said his master offering his hand to him how are you boy while well, adolph poured forth with great fluency an extemporary speech which he had been preparing with great care for a fortnight before well well said st clair passing on with his usual air of negligent drollery that's very well got up adolph see that the baggage is well bestowed i'll come to the people in a minute and so saying he led miss ophelia to a large piler that opened on the veranda while this had been passing eva had flown like a bird through the porch and piler to a little boudoir 
opening likewise on the veranda. A tall, dark-eyed, sallow woman half rose from a couch on which she was reclining. Mamma said Eva in a sort of a rapture, throwing herself on her neck and embracing her over and over again. That'll do. Take care, child. Don't you make my head ache, said the mother after she had languidly kissed her. St. Clair came in, embraced his wife in true orthodox husbandly fashion, then presented to her his cousin. Marie lifted her large eyes on her cousin with an air of some curiosity and received her with languid politeness. A crowd of servants now pressed to the entry door and among them a middle-aged mulatto woman of very respectful appearance stood foremost in a tremor of expectation and joy at the door oh there's mammy said eva as she flew across the room and throwing herself into her arms she kissed her repeatedly this woman did not tell her that she made her head ache but on the contrary she hugged her and laughed and cried till her sanity was a thing to be doubted of and when released from her eva flew from one to another shaking hands and kissing in a way that miss ophelia afterwards declared fairly turned her stomach well said miss ophelia you southern children can do something that i couldn't what now pray said st clair well i want to be kind to everybody and i wouldn't have anything hurt but as to kissing niggers said st clair that you're not up to hey yes that's it how can she st clair laughed as he went into the passage hello here what's to pay out here here you all mammy jimmy polly suki glad to see masser he said as he went shaking hands from one to another look out for the babies he added as he stumbled over a sooty little urchin who was crawling on all fours if i step upon anybody let em mention it there was an abundance of laughing and blessing masser as st clair distributed small pieces of change among them come now take yourselves off like good boys and girls he said and the whole assemblage dark and light disappeared through a door into a large veranda followed by eva who carried a large satchel which she had been filling with apples nuts candy ribbons lace and toys of every description during her whole homeward journey as st clair turned to go back his eyes fell upon tom who was standing uneasily shifting from one foot to the other while adolph stood negligently leaning against the banisters examining tom through an opera glass with an air that would have done credit to any dandy living pooh you puppy said his master striking down the opera glass is that the way you treat your company seems to me dolph he added laying his finger on the elegant figured satin vest that adolph was sporting seems to me that's my vest oh master this vest all stained with wine of course a gentleman in master's standing never wears a vest like this i understood i was to take it it does for a poor nigger feller like me and adolph tossed his head and passed his fingers through his scented hair with a grace so that's it is it said st clair carelessly well here i'm going to show this tom to his mistress and then you can take him to the kitchen and mind you don't put on any of your airs to him he's worth two such puppies as you master always will have his joke said adolph laughing i'm delighted to see master in such spirits here tom said st clair beckoning tom entered the room he looked wistfully on the velvet carpets and the before unimagined splendors of mirrors pictures statues and curtains and like the queen of sheba before solomon there was no more spirit in him he looked afraid even to set his feet down see here marie said st clair to his wife i brought you a coachman at last to order i tell you he's a regular hearse for blackness and sobriety and will drive you like a funeral if you want open your eyes now and look at him now don't say i never think about you when i'm gone marie opened her eyes and fixed them on tom without rising i know he'll get drunk she said no he's warranted a pious and sober article well i hope he may turn out well 
said the lady. It's more than I expect, though. Dolph, said St. Clair, show Tom downstairs, and mind you, he added, remember what I told you. Adolph tripped gracefully forward, and Tom, with lumbering tread, went after. He's a perfect behemoth, said Marie. Come now, Marie, said St. Clair, seating himself on a stool beside her sofa. Be gracious, and say something pretty to the fellow. You've been gone a fortnight beyond the time, said the lady pouting. Well, you know I wrote you the reason. Such a short, cold letter, said the lady. Dear me, the mail was just going, and it had to be that or nothing. That's just the way, always, said the lady. Always something to make your journeys long and letters short. See here now, he added, drawing an elegant velvet case out of his pocket and opening it. Here's a present I got for you in New York. It was a daguerreotype, clear and soft as an engraving, representing Eva and her father sitting hand in hand. Marie looked at it with a dissatisfied air. What makes you sit in such an awkward position? she said. Well, the position may be a matter of opinion, but what do you think of the likeness? If you don't think anything of my opinion on one case, I suppose you wouldn't in another, said the lady, shutting the daguerreotype. Hang the woman, said St. Clair mentally, but aloud he added, Come now, Marie, what do you think of the likeness? Don't be so nonsensual now. It's very inconsiderate of you, St. Clair, said the lady, to insist on my talking and looking at things. You know I've been lying all day with a sick headache, and there's been such a tumult made ever since you came. I'm half dead. You're subject to the sick headache, ma'am, said Miss Ophelia, suddenly rising from the depths of the large armchair, where she had sat quietly taking an inventory of the furniture and calculating its expense. Yes, I'm a perfect martyr to it, said the lady. Juniper berry tea is good for sick headache, said Miss Ophelia. At least August. Deacon Abram Perry's wife used to say so, and she was a great nurse. I'll have the first juniper berries that get ripe in our garden by the lake brought in for that special purpose, said St. Clair, gravely pulling the bell as he did so. Meanwhile, cousin, you must be wanting to retire to your apartment and refresh yourself a little after your journey. Dolph, he added, tell Mammy to come here. The decent mulatto woman whom Eva had caressed so rapturously soon appeared. She was dressed neatly, with a high red and yellow turban on her head, the recent gift of Eva, and which the child had been arranging on her head. Mammy, said St. Clair, I put this lady under your care. She is tired and wants rest. Take her to her chamber and be sure she is made comfortable. And Miss Ophelia disappeared in the rear of Mammy. End of chapter 15